Kim by Rudyard Kipling Narrated by Robin Nixon Chapter 1 O ye who tread the narrow way By Toffet Flare to Judgment Day Be gentle when the heathen pray To Buddha at Kamakura Buddha at Kamakura he sat in defence of municipal orders, astride the gun Zam Zamar, on her brick platform opposite the old Ajebga, the Wonder House, as the natives call the Lahore Museum. Who hold Zam Zamar, that fire-breathing dragon, hold the Punjab, for the great green bronze piece is always first of the conqueror's loot. There was some justification for Kim. He had kicked Lala, Dinanath's boy off the Trunnions, since the English held the Punjab and Kim was English. Though he was burned black as any native, though he spoke the vernacular by preference, and his mother tongue in a clipped, uncertain sing-song, though he consorted on terms of perfect equality with the small boys of the bazaar, Kim was white, a poor white of the very poorest. The half-caste woman who looked after him, she smoked opium and pretended to keep a second-hand furniture shop by the square where the cheap cabs wait, told the missionaries that she was Kim's mother's sister, but his mother had been nursemaid in a colonel's family and had married Kimball O'Hara, a young colour sergeant of the Mavericks, an Irish regiment. He afterwards took a post on the Sindh, Punjab, and Delhi Railway, and his regiment went home without him. The wife died of cholera in Ferozipur, and O'Hara fell to drink and loafing up and down the line with the keen-eyed three-year-old baby. Societies and chaplains, anxious for the child, tried to catch him, but O'Hara drifted away, till he came across the woman who took opium and learned the taste from her, and died as poor whites die in India. His estate at death consisted of three papers. One he called his Ne Variateur, because those words were written below his signature thereon, and another his Clearance Certificate. The third was Kim's Birth Certificate, those things, he was used to say, in his glorious opium hours, would yet make little Kimball a man. On no account was Kim to part with them, for they belonged to a great piece of magic, such magic as men practised over yonder behind the museum, in the big blue and white Jadugur, the magic house, as we name the Masonic Lodge. It would, he said, all come right some day, and Kim's horn would be exalted between pillars, monstrous pillars of beauty and strength. The colonel himself, riding on a horse at the head of the finest regiment in the world, would attend to Kim. A little Kim, that should have been better off than his father. Nine hundred first-class devils, whose god was a red bull on a green field, would attend to Kim, if they had not forgotten O'Hara, poor O'Hara that was gang foreman on the Ferozepore line. Then he would weep bitterly in the broken rush chair on the veranda. So it came about after his death that the woman sewed parchment, paper, and birth certificate into a leather amulet case, which she strung around Kim's neck. And some day, she said, confusedly remembering O'Hara's prophecies, there will come for you a great red bull on a green field, and the colonel riding on his tall horse, yes, and, dropping into English, nine hundred devils. Ah, said Kim, I shall remember. A red bull and a colonel on a horse will come. But first, my father said, will come the two men making ready the ground for these matters. That is how my father said they always did, and it is always so when men work magic. If the woman had sent Kim up to the local Jadu Gur with those papers, he would, of course, have been taken over by the provincial lodge and sent to the Masonic orphanage in the hills. But what she had heard of magic, she distrusted. Kim, too, held views of his own, 
as he reached the years of indiscretion, he learned to avoid missionaries and white men of serious aspect who asked who he was and what he did. For Kim did nothing with an immense success. True, he knew the wonderful walled city of Lahore, from the Delhi Gate to the outer Fort Ditch, was hand in glove with men who led lives stranger than anything Harun al-Rashid dreamed of. And he lived in a life wild as that of the Arabian Nights. But missionaries and secretaries of charitable societies could not see the beauty of it. His nickname through the wards was Little Friend of All the World, and very often, being lithe and inconspicuous, he executed commissions by night on the crowded housetops for sleek and shiny young men of fashion. It was intrigue. Of course, he knew that much, as he had known all evil since he could speak. But what he loved was the game for its own sake. The stealthy prowl through the dark gullies and lanes, the crawl up a water pipe, the sights and sounds of the women's world on the flat roofs, and the headlong flight from housetop to housetop under cover of the hot dark. And then there were holy men, ash-smeared fakers by their brick shrines under the trees at the riverside, with whom he was quite familiar, greeting them as they returned from begging tours, and, when no one was by, eating from the same dish. The woman who looked after him insisted with tears that he should wear European clothes, trousers, a shirt, and a battered hat. Kim found it easier to slip into Hindu or Mohammedan garb when engaged on certain businesses. One of the young men of fashion, he who was found dead at the bottom of a well on the night of the earthquake, had once given him a complete suit of Hindu kit, the costume of a low-caste street boy, and Kim stored it in a secret place under some box in Neela Ram's timber yard, beyond the Punjab High Court where the fragrant deodor logs lie seasoning after they have driven down the ravi. When there was business or frolic afoot, Kim would use his properties, returning at dawn to the veranda, all tired out from shouting at the heels of a marriage procession or yelling at a Hindu festival. Sometimes there was food in the house, more often there was not, and then Kim went out again to eat with his native friends. As he drummed his heels against Zamzamar, he turned now and again from his King of the Castle game with little Chota Lal and Abdullah, the sweetmeat seller's son to make a rude remark to the native policeman on guard over rows of shoes at the museum door. The big Punjabi grinned tolerantly. He knew Kim of old. So did the water carrier, sluicing water on the dry road from his goat-skin bag. So did Jawahir Singh, the museum carpenter, bent over new packing cases. So did everybody in sight, except the peasants from the country, hurrying up to the Wonder House to view the things that men made in their own province and elsewhere. The museum was given up to Indian arts and manufactures, and anybody who sought wisdom could ask the curator to explain. "'Off, off, let me up!' cried Abdullah, climbing up Zamzama's wheel. "'Thy father was a pastry cook. Thy mother stole the ghee, sang Kim. All Muslims fell off Zamzama long ago.' "'Let me up!' shrilled little Chotalal in his gilt-embroidered cap. His father was worth perhaps half a million sterling, but India is the only democratic land in the world. "'The Hindus fell off Zamzamar too. The Muslims pushed them off. Thy father was a pastry cook.' He stopped, for there shuffled round the corner from the roaring Moti Bazaar, such a man as Kim, who thought he knew all castes, had never seen. He was nearly six feet high, dressed in fold upon fold of dingy stuff like horse blanketing, and not one fold of it could Kim refer to any known trade or profession. At his belt hung a long, open-work iron pen-case, and a wooden rosary such as holy men wear. On his head was a gigantic sort of tam His face was yellow and wrinkled, like that of Fuxing, the Chinese bootmaker in the bazaar. His eyes turned up at the corners and looked like little slits of onyx. 
"'Who is that?' said Kim to his companions. "'Perhaps it is a man,' said Abdullah, finger in mouth, staring. Uh, "'Without doubt,' returned Kim. "'But he is no man of India that I have seen.' "'A priest, perhaps,' said Chotalal, spying the rosary. "'See, he goes into the Wonder House.' "'Nay, nay,' said the policeman, shaking his head. "'I do not understand your talk.' The constable spoke Punjabi. "'O oh, friend of all the world, what does he say?' "'Send him hither,' said Kim, dropping from Zamzamar, flourishing his bare heels. "'He is a foreigner, and thou art a buffalo.' The man turned helplessly and drifted towards the boys. He was old and his woollen gabardine still reeked of the stinking Artemisia of the mountain passes. "'Oh, children, what is that big house?' he said, in very fair Urdu. "'The Ajibigir, the Wonder House.' Kim gave him no title such as Lala or Mian. He could not divine the man's creed. "'Ah, the Wonder House. Can any enter?' "'It is written above the door, all who can enter.' "'Without payment?' "'I go in and out.' I, I am no banker, laughed Kim. Alas, I am an old man. I did not know. Then, fingering his rosary, he half turned to the museum. What is your caste? Where is your house? Have you come far? Kim asked. I came by Kulu from beyond the Kalas. But what know you? From the hills where, he sighed, the air and water are fresh and cool. Aha, Kitai! A Chinaman, said Abdul proudly. Fuk Shing had once chased him out of his shop for spitting at the joss above the boots. Pahari, a hillman, said little Chotalal. Ay, child, a hillman, from the hills thou'lt never see. This tear of Botiel in Tibet. I am no Kitai, but a Botia, Tibetan, since you must know, a Lama, or say a Guru in your tongue. "'A guru from Tibet?' said Kim. "'I have not seen such a man. "'They be Hindus in Tibet, then. "'We be followers of the Middle Way, "'living in peace in our lamasseries, "'and I go to see the four holy places before I die. "'Now do you, who are children, know as much as I do, who am old?' "'He smiled benignantly on the boys. "'Hast thou eaten?' "'He fumbled in his bosom and drew forth a worn wooden begging-bowl, the boys nodded. All priests of their acquaintance begged. I do not wish to eat yet, he turned his head like an old tortoise in the sunlight. Is it true that there are many images in the Wonder House of Lahore? He repeated the last words as one, making sure of an address. That is true, said Abdullah. It is full of heathen busts. Thou also art an idolater. Ah, "'Never mind him,' said Kim. "'That is the government's house, and there is no idolatry in it. "'But only a sahib with a white beard. "'Come with me, and I will show.' "'A strange priest, eat boys,' whispered Chotalal. "'And he is a stranger, and a butparast, idolater,' said Abdullah, the Mohammedan. "'Kim laughed. "'He is new. Uh, "'Run to your mother's laps and be safe. "'Come.' "'Kim clicked round the self-registering turnstile. "'The old man followed.' and halted, amazed. In the entrance hall stood the larger figures of the Greco-Buddhist sculptures done, savants know how long since, by forgotten workmen whose hands were feeling, and not unskillfully, for the mysteriously transmitted Grecian touch. There were hundreds of pieces, friezes of figures in relief, fragments of statues and slabs crowded with figures that had encrusted the brick walls of the buddhist stupas and viharas of the north country and now dug up and labelled made the pride of the museum in open-mouthed wonder the lama turned to this and that and finally checked in rapt attention before a large outer relief representing a coronation or apotheosis of the lord buddha the master was represented seated on a lotus, the petals of which were so deeply undercut as to show almost detached. Round him was an adoring hierarchy of kings, elders, and old-time Buddhas. Below were lotus-covered waters with fishes and water-birds. Two butterfly-winged divas held a wreath over his head. Above them, another pair supported an umbrella, surmounted by the jewelled headdress of the Bodhisattva. The Lord, the Lord it is Sakyamuni himself, 
the Lama half sobbed, and under his breath began the wonderful Buddhist invocation. To him the way, the law apart, whom Maya held beneath a heart, Ananda's lord, the body sat. And he is here, the most excellent law is here also. My pilgrimage is well begun. And what work, what work! Yonder is the sahib, said Kim, and dodged sideways among the cases of the arts and manufacturer's wing. A white-bearded Englishman was looking at the lama, who gravely turned and saluted him, and, after some fumbling, drew forth a notebook and a scrap of paper. Yes, that is my name, smiling at the clumsy, childish print. One of us who had made pilgrimage to the holy places, he is now abbot of the Lang Chow Ministry, gave it to me, stammered the lama. He spoke of this. His lean hand moved tremulously around. Welcome then, O Lama from Tibet. Here be the images, and I am here, he glanced at the Lama's face, to gather knowledge. Come to my office a while. The old man was trembling with excitement. The office was but a little wooden cubicle partitioned off from the sculpture-lined gallery. Kim laid himself down, his ear against a crack in the heat-split cedar door, and, following his instinct, stretched out to listen and watch. Most of the talk was altogether above his head. The lama, hauntingly at first, spoke to the curator of his own lamasserie, the Sugzen, opposite the painted rocks, four months' march away. The curator brought out a huge book of photos and showed him that very place, perched on his crag, overlooking the gigantic valley of many huge strata. Ay, ay, the lama mounted a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles of Chinese work. Here is the little door through which we bring wood before winter. And thou, the English, know of these things? He who is now abbot of Langcho told me, but I did not believe. The Lord, the Excellent One, he has honour here too, and his life is known. It's all carven upon the stones. Come and see if thou art rested. Out shuffled the lama to the main hall, and the curator beside him went through the collection with the reverence of a devotee and the appreciative instinct of a craftsman. Incident by incident, in the beautiful story he identified on the blurred stone, puzzled here and there by the unfamiliar Greek convention, but delighted as a child at each new trove. Where the sequence failed, as in the Annunciation, the curator supplied it from his mound of books, of French and German, with photographs and reproductions. Here was the devout Asita, the pendant of Simeon in the Christian story, holding the holy child on his knee, while mother and father listened. And here were incidents in the legend of the cousin Devadatta. And here was the wicked woman who accused the master of impurity, all confounded. Here was the teaching in the deer park, the miracle that stunned the fire worshippers. Here was the bodhisat in royal state as a prince, the miraculous birth, the death at Kusinagara, where the weak disciple fainted while there were almost countless repetitions of the meditation under the body tree, and the adoration of the arms bowl was everywhere. In a few minutes the curator saw that his guest was no mere bead-telling mendicant, but a scholar of parts, and they went at it all over again, the lama taking snuff, wiping his spectacles and talking at railway speed in a bewildering mixture of Urdu and Tibetan. He had heard of the travels of the Chinese pilgrims, Fu Huan and Huen Xiang, and was anxious to know if there was any translation of their record. He drew in his breath as he turned helplessly over the pages of Beale and Stanislas Julian. "'Tis all here, a treasure locked." Then he composed himself reverently to listen to fragments hastily rendered into Urdu. For the first time he heard 
of the labours of European scholars, who by the help of these and a hundred other documents have identified the holy places of Buddhism. Then he was shown a mighty map, spotted and traced with yellow. The brown finger followed the curator's pencil from point to point. Here was Capel of Astu, here the Middle Kingdom, and here Mahabodhi, the Mecca of Buddhism. And here was Kasinagara, the sad place of the Holy One's death. The old man bowed his head over the sheets in silence for a while, and the curator lit another pipe. Kim had fallen asleep. When he waked, the talk, still in spate, was more within his comprehension. And thus it was, O oh, fountain of wisdom, that I decided to go to the holy places which his foot had trod, to the birthplace, even to Kapila, then to Mahabodhi, which is Budgaya, to the monastery, to the deer park, to the place of his death. The lama lowered his voice, and I come here alone for five, seven, eighteen, forty years. It was in my mind that the old law was not well followed. Being overlaid, as thou knowest, with devildom, charms, and idolatry, even as the child outside said, but now, I, even as a child said, with but parasti. So it comes with all faiths, thinkest thou? The books of my lamassery I read, and they were dried pith, and the later ritual with which we of the reformed law have cumbered ourselves, that too had no worth to these old eyes. Even the followers of the excellent one are at feud on feud with one another. It is all illusion. I, Maya, illusion. But I have another desire. The seamed yellow face drew within three inches of the curator, and the long forefinger nail tapped on the table. Your scholars, by these books, have followed the blessed feet in all their wanderings, but there are things which they have not sought out. I know nothing, nothing do I know, but I go to free myself from the will of things by a broad and open road. He smiled with most simple triumph. As a pilgrim to the holy places, I acquire merit, but there is more. Listen to a true thing. When our gracious Lord, being as yet a youth, sought a mate, a man said in his father's court that he was too tender for marriage. Thou knowest? The curator nodded, wondering what would come next. So they made the triple trial of strength against all comers, and at the test of the bow, our Lord, first breaking that which they gave him, called for such a bow as none might bend. Thou knowest? It is written, I have read. And, overshooting all other marks, the arrow passed far and far beyond sight. At the last it fell, and where it touched earth, there broke out a stream, which presently became a river, whose nature, by our Lord's beneficence, and that merit he acquired ere he freed himself, is that whoso bathes in it washes away all taint and speckle of sin. So it is written, said the curator, sadly. The lama drew a long breath. Where is that river? A fountain of wisdom. Where fell the arrow? Alas, my brother, I do not know, said the curator. Nay, nay if it Please thee to forget the one thing only that thou hast not told me. Surely thou must know. See, 
I am an old man. I ask with my head between thy feet, O fountain of wisdom. We know he drew the bow. We know the arrow fell. We know the stream gushed. Where, then, is the river? My dream told me to find it. So I came. I am here. But where is the river? If I knew, uh, think you, I would not cry it aloud. Uh, by it, uh, one attains freedom from the wheel of things. The lama went on, unheeding. The river of the arrow. Think again. Some little stream may be dried in the heat, but the Holy One would never so cheat an old man. I do not know. I do not know. The Lama brought his thousand wrinkled face once more a hand's breadth from the Englishman's. I see thou dost not know. Not being of the law, the matter is hid from thee. I, hidden, hidden. We are both bound, thou and I, my brother. But I, he rose with a sweep of the soft, thick drapery. I go to cut myself free. Come also. I am bound, said the curator. But whither goest thou? First to Kashi, Benares. Where else? There I shall meet one of the pure faith in a Jain temple of that city. He also is a seeker in secret, and from him haply I may learn. Maybe he will go with me to Gaya, thence north and west to Kapilavastu, and there will I seek for the river. Nay, I will seek everywhere as I go, for the place is not known where the arrow fell. And how wilt thou go? It is a far cry to Delhi, and farther to Benares. By road and the trains from Pathancot, having left the hills, I came hither in a terrain. It goes swiftly. At first I was amazed to see those tall poles by the side of the road snatching up and snatching up their threads. He illustrated the stoop and whirl of a telegraph pole flashing past the train. But later I was cramped and desired to walk, as I am used. And thou art sure of thy road, said the curator. Oh, for that one but asks a question and pays money, and the appointed persons dispatch all to the appointed place. That much I knew in my lamassery from sure report, said the lama proudly. And when dost thou go? The curator smiled, the mixture of old-world piety and modern progress. That is the note of India today. As soon as may be, I follow the places of his life till I come to the river of the arrow. There is, moreover, a written paper of the hours of the trains that go south. And for food? Lamas, as a rule, have good store of money somewhere about them, but the curator wished to make sure. For the journey, I take up the master's begging bowl. Yes, even as he went, so go I, forsaking the ease of my monastery. There was with me, when I left the hills, a Chela disciple who begged for me as the rule demands, but halting in Kulu a while, a fever took him and he died. I have now no Chela, but I will take the alms bowl and thus enable the charitable to acquire merit. He nodded his head valiantly. Learned doctors of a lamassery do not beg, but the Lama was an enthusiast in his quest. Be it so, said the curator, smiling. Suffer me now to acquire merit. We be craftsmen together, thou and I. Here is a new book of white English paper. Here be sharpened pencils two and three, thick and thin, all good for a scribe. Now, 
Lend me thy spectacles. The curator looked through them. They were heavily scratched, but the power was almost exactly that of his own pair, which he slid into the llama's hand, saying, Try these. A feather, a very feather upon the face. The old man turned his head delightedly and wrinkled up his nose. How scarcely do I feel them? How clearly do I see? They be by law crystal, and will never scratch. May they help thee to thy river, for they are thine. I will take them, and the pencils, and the white notebook, said the lama, as a sign of friendship between priest and priest. And now he fumbled his belt, detached the openwork iron pincers, and laid it on the curator's table. That is for a memory between thee and me. My pen-case, it is something old, even as I am. It was a piece of ancient design, Chinese, of an iron that is not smelted these days, and the collector's heart in the curator's bosom had gone out to it from the first, for no persuasion would the lama resume his gift. When I return, having found the river, I will bring thee a written picture of the Padma Samthora, such as I used to make on silk at the Lamasserie. Yes, and of the wheel of life, he chuckled, for we be craftsmen together, thou and I. The curator would have detained him. They are few in the world who still have the secret of the conventional brush pen Buddhist pictures, which are, as it were, half written and half drawn. But the lama strode out, head high in air, and pausing an instant before the great statue of a bodhisat in meditation, brushed through the turnstiles. Kim followed like a shadow. What he had overheard excited him wildly. This man was entirely new to all his experience, and he meant to investigate further, precisely as he would have investigated a new building or a strange festival in Lahore City. The lama was his trove, and he proposed to take possession. Kim's mother had been Irish too. The old man halted by Zamzamar and looked round till his eye fell on Kim. The inspiration of his pilgrimage had left him for a while, and he felt old, forlorn, and very empty. "'Do not sit under that gun,' said the policeman loftily. Ha, <laughs> owl!' was Kim's retort on the lama's behalf. "'Sit under that gun, if it please thee. "'When didst thou steal the milkwoman's slippers, Danu?' "'That was an utterly unfounded charge, sprung on the spur of the moment, "'but it silenced Danu, who knew that Kim's clear yell "'could call up legions of bad bazaar boys, if need arose. "'And whom didst thou worship within?' said Kim affably, "'squatting in the shade beside the lama. I worship none, child. I bowed before the excellent law. Kim accepted this new god without emotion. He knew already a few score. And what dost thou do? I beg. I remember now. It is long since I have eaten or drunk. What is the custom of charity in this town? In silence, as we do of Tibet, or speaking aloud? Ah, those who beg in silence starve in silence, said Kim, quoting a native proverb. The lama tried to rise, but sank back again, sighing for his disciple, dead in faraway Kulu. Kim watched head to one side, considering and interested. Give me the bowl. I know the people of this city, all who are charitable. Give, and I will bring it back filled. Simply as a child, the old man handed him the bowl. "'Rest thou. I know the people.' He trotted off to the open shop of Kunjiri, a low-caste vegetable cellar which lay opposite the belt tramway line down the Moti Bazaar. She knew Kim of old. Oh, ho, hast thou turned yogi with thy begging bowl?' she cried. "'Nay,' said Kim proudly. "'There's a new priest in the city, a man such as I've never seen.' "'Old priest, young tiger,' said the woman angrily. I am tired of new priests. They settle on our wares like flies. Is the father of my son a well of charity to give to all who ask? No, said Kim. Thy man is rather yogi, bad-tempered, than yogi, a holy man. But this priest is new. The sahib in the wonder-house has talked to him like a brother. 
Oh, my mother, uh, fill me this bowl, he waits. That bowl, indeed, that cow-bellied basket, thou has as much grace as the holy bull of Schiff. He has taken the best of a basket of onions already this morn, and forsooth I must fill thy bowl. He comes here again. The huge, mouse-coloured Brahmini bull of the ward was shouldering his way through the many-coloured crowd, a stolen plantain hanging out of his mouth. He headed straight for the shop, well knowing his privileges as a sacred beast, lowered his head, and puffed heavily along the line of baskets ere making his choice. Up flew Kim's hard little heel, and caught him on the moist blue nose. He snorted indignantly, and walked away across the tram rails, his hump quivering with rage. See, I've saved more than the bowl will cost thrice over. Now, mother, a little rice and some dried fish atop, yes, and some vegetable curry. A growl came out of the back of the shop where a man lay. He drove away the bull, said the woman in an undertone. It is good to give to the poor. She took the bowl and returned it full of hot rice. But my yogi is not a cow, said Kim gravely, making a hole with his fingers in the top of the mound. A little curry is good, and a fried cake, and a morsel of conserve would please him, I think. It is a hole as big as thy head, said the woman fretfully, but she filled it none the less with good steaming vegetable curry, clapped a fried cake atop, and a morsel of clarified butter on the cake, dabbed a lump of sour tamarind conserve at the side, and Kim looked at the load lovingly. That is good. When I'm in the bazaar, the bull shall not come to this house. He is a bold beggar man. And now, laughed the woman, but speak well of bulls. Hast thou not told me that some day a red bull will come out of a field to help thee? Now hold all straight, and ask for the holy man's blessing upon me. Perhaps, too, he knows a cure for my daughter's sore eyes. Ask him that also, O thou little friend of all the world." But Kim had danced off ere the end of the sentence, dodging pariah dogs and hungry acquaintances. "'Thus do we beg who know the way of it,' he said proudly to the lama, who opened his eyes at the contents of the bowl. "'Eat now, and I will eat with thee. "'Oh, bisti,' he called to the water-carrier, sluicing the crotons by the museum. "'Give water here. We men are thirsty.' Oh, "'We men,' said the bisti, laughing, "'is one skinful enough for such a pair. "'Drink then in the name of the compassionate.' He loosed a thin stream into Kim's hands, who drank native fashion. But the lama must needs pull out a cup from his inexhaustible upper draperies and drink ceremonially. A pardisi, a foreigner, Kim explained, as the old man delivered in an unknown tongue what was evidently a blessing. They ate together in great content, clearing the begging bowl. Then the lama took snuff from a portentous wooden snuff-gourd, fingered his rosary a while, and so dropped into the easy sleep of age, as the shadow of Zamzamar grew long. Kim loafed over to the nearest tobacco-seller, a rather lively young Mohammedan woman, and begged a rank cigar of the brand that they sell to students of the Punjab University, who copy English customs. Then he smoked, and thought, knees to chin, under the belly of the gun, and the outcome of his thoughts was a sudden and stealthy departure in the direction of Nila Ram's timber yard. The Lama did not wake till the evening life of the city had begun, with lamplighting and the return of white-robed clerks and subordinates from the government offices. He stared dizzily in all directions, but none looked at him, save a Hindu urchin in a dirty turban and Isabella-coloured clothes. Suddenly he bowed his head on his knees, and wailed. "'What is this?' said the boy, standing before him. "'Hast thou been robbed?' "'It is my new cella, disciple, that is gone away from me, and I know not where he is.' "'And what like of man was thy disciple?' "'It was a boy who came to me in place of him who died, on account of the merit which I had gained, when I bowed before the law within there.' He pointed towards the museum. He came upon me to show me a road which I had lost. He led me into the Wonder House, and by his talk emboldened me to speak to the keeper of the images, so that I was cheered and made strong. And when I was faint with hunger, he begged for me, as would a cella for his teacher. Suddenly was he sent, suddenly has he gone away. 
It was in my mind to have taught him the law upon the road to Benares. Kim stood amazed at this, because he had overheard the talk in the museum, and knew that the old man was speaking the truth, which is a thing a native on the road seldom presents to a stranger. But I see now that he was but sent for a purpose. By this I know that I shall find a certain river for which I seek. The river of the arrow, said Kim, with a superior smile. Is this yet another sending? cried the lama. To none have I spoken of my search safe to the priest of the images. Who art thou? Thy cella, said Kim, simply, sitting on his heels. I have never seen any one like to thee in all this my life. I go with thee to Benares. And too, I think that so old a man as thou, speaking the truth to chance met people at dusk, is in great need of a disciple. But the river, the river of the arrow. Oh, that I heard when thou wast speaking to the Englishman. I lay against the door. The lama sighed. I thought you had been to guide, permitted. Uh, such things fall sometimes, but I am not worthy. Thou dost not, then, know the river? Not I, Kim laughed uneasily. I go to look for, for a bull, a red bull, on a green field, who shall help me. A boy-like, if an acquaintance had a scheme, Kim was quite ready with one of his own, and boy-like he had really thought for as much as twenty minutes at a time of his father's prophecy. Uh, to what, child? said the lama. God knows, but so my father told me. I heard thy talk in the wonder house of all those new strange places in the hills, and if one so old and so little, so used to truth-telling, may go out for the small matter of a river— it seemed to me that I too must go a-travelling. If it is our fate to find those things, we shall find them. Thou, thy river, and I, my bull, and the strong pillars, and some other matters that I forget. It is not pillars, but a wheel from which I would be free, said the lama. That is all one. Perhaps they will make me a king, said Kim, serenely prepared for anything. I will teach the other and better desires upon the road, the lama replied in the voice of authority. Let us go to Benares. Uh, not by night. Thieves are abroad. Uh, wait uh, till the day. But there is no place to sleep. The old man was used to the order of his monastery, and though he slept on the ground, as the rule decrees, preferred a decency in these things. <laughs> we shall get good lodging at the Kashmir Siray, said Kim, laughing at his perplexity. <laughs> I have a friend there. Come. The hot and crowded bazaars blazed with light as they made their way through the press of all the races in Upper India, and the lama mooned through it like a man in a dream. It was his first experience of a large manufacturing city, and the crowded tramcar with its continually squealing brakes frightened him. Half pushed, half towed, he arrived at the high gate of the Kashmir Siray. That huge open square over against the railway station, surrounded with arched cloisters, where the camel and horse caravans put up on their return from Central Asia. Here were all manner of northern folk, tending tethered ponies and kneeling camels, loading and unloading bales and bundles, drawing water for the evening meal at the creaking well windlasses, and piling grass before the shrieking wild-eyed stallions guffing the surly caravan dogs, paying off camel drivers, taking on new grooms, swearing, shouting, arguing, and chaffering in the packed square. The cloisters, reached by three or four masonry steps, made a haven of refuge around this turbulent sea. Most of them were rented to traders, as we rent the arches of a viaduct, the space between pillar and pillar being bricked or boarded off into rooms, which were guarded by heavy wooden doors and cumbrous native padlocks. Locked doors showed that the owner was away, and a few rude, sometimes very rude, chalk or paint scratches told where he had gone. Thus, Lutuf Ullah is gone to Kurdistan. Below in coarse verse, O Allah, who sufferest lice to live on the coat of Kabuli, why hast thou allowed this house Lutuf to live so long?
Kim, fending the llama between excited men and excited beasts, sidled along the cloisters to the far end, nearest the railway station, where Mahbub Ali, the horse trader, lived, when he came in from that mysterious land beyond the passes of the north. Kim had had many dealings with Mahbub in his little life, especially between his tenth and his thirteenth year, and the big burly Afghan, his beard dyed scarlet with lime, for he was elderly and did not wish his grey hairs to show, knew the boy's value as a gossip. Sometimes he would tell Kim to watch a man who had nothing whatever to do with horses, to follow him for one whole day and report every soul with whom he talked. Kim would deliver himself of his tale at evening, and Marple would listen without a word or gesture. It was intrigue of some kind, Kim knew, but its worth lay in saying nothing whatever to anyone except Mahbub, who gave him beautiful meals, all hot, from the cookshop at the head of the Sarai, and once as much as eight annas in money. "'He is here,' said Kim, hitting a bad-tempered camel on the nose. "'Oh, Mahbub Ali!' he halted at a dark arch and slipped behind the bewildered llama. The horse-trader, his deep embroidered bucariot belt unloosed, was lying on a pair of silk carpet saddlebags, pulling lazily at an immense silver hookah. He turned his head very slightly at the cry, seeing only the tall, silent figure, and chuckled in his deep chest. Allah, a llama, a red llama, it is far from Lahore to the passes. What dost thou do here? The llama held out the begging bowl mechanically. A God's curse on all unbelievers, said Mahbub. I do not give to a lousy Tibetan, but ask my is over yonder behind the camels. They may value your blessings. Oh, horse boys, here's a countryman of yours. See if he be hungry. A shaving, crouching Balti, who had come down with the horses, and who was nominally some sort of degraded Buddhist, fawned upon the priest, and in thick gutturals besought the Holy One to sit at the horse boy's fire. Go, said Kim, pushing him lightly, and the lama strode away, leaving Kim at the edge of the cloister. Go, said Mabubali, returning to his hookah. Little Hindu, run away. God's curse on all unbelievers. Beg from those of my tale who are of thy faith. Maharaj, whined Kim, using the Hindu form of address, and thoroughly enjoying the situation. My father is dead. My mother is dead. My stomach is empty. Beg from my men among the horses, I say. There must be some Hindus in my tale. Oh, Mahababali, but am I a Hindu? said Kim in English. The trader gave no sign of astonishment, but looked under shaggy eyebrows. A little friend of the world, said he. What is this? Uh, nothing. I am now that holy man's disciple, and we go a pilgrimage together to Benares, he says. He is quite mad, and I am tired of Lahore City. I wish new air and water. But for whom dost thou work? Why come to me? The voice was harsh with suspicion. To whom else should I come? I have no money. It is not good to go about without money. Thou wilt sell many horses to the officers. They are very fine horses, these new ones. I have seen them. Give me a rupee, Mahbub Ali, and when I come to my wealth, I will give thee a bond and pay. Um, said Mahbub Ali, thinking swiftly, thou hast never before lied to me. Uh, call that llama. Uh, stand back in the dark. Oh, our tales will agree, said Kim, laughing. We go to Benares, said the llama, as soon as he understood the drift of Mahbub Ali's questions. The boy and I, I go to seek for a certain river. Uh, maybe, oh, but the boy, uh, he is my disciple. He was sent, I think, to guide me to that river. Uh, sitting under a gun was I when he came suddenly. Uh, such things have befallen the fortunate to whom guidance was allowed. Uh, but I remember now he said he was of this world, a Hindu. And his name? That... I did not ask. Is he not my disciple? His country, his race, his village, a Muslim, Sikh, Hindu, Jain, low caste or high? Why should I ask? There is neither high nor low in the middle way. If he is my cella, does, will, can anyone take him away from me? For look you, without him I shall not find my river. 
he wagged his head solemnly. "'None shall take him from thee. Go sit among my Baltis,' said Mabubali, and the lama drifted off, soothed by the promise. "'Is he not quite mad?' said Kim, coming forward to the light again. "'Why should I lie to thee, Haji?' Mabub puffed his hooker in silence. Then he began, almost whispering, "'Umbala is on the road to Benares, if indeed ye two go there. Uh, I tell ye, he does not know how to lie, as we two know. And if thou wilt carry a message for me as far as Ambola, I will give thee money. It concerns a horse, a white stallion, which I have sold to an officer upon the last time I returned from the passes. But then, stand nearer, and hold up hands as begging. The pedigree of the white stallion was not fully established, and that officer, who is now at Ambala, bade me make it clear. Mabub here described the horse and the appearance of the officer. So the message to that officer will be, The pedigree of the white stallion is fully established. By this he will know that thou comest from me. He will then say, What proof hast thou? And thou wilt answer, Mahbub Ali has given me the proof. <laughs> and all for the sake of a white stallion, said Kim, with a giggle, his eyes aflame. That pedigree I will give thee now, in my own fashion, and some hard words as well. A shadow passed behind Kim and a feeding camel. Mahbub Ali raised his voice. Allah, art thou the only beggar in the city? Thy mother is dead, thy father is dead. So is it with all of them. Well, well, he turned as feeling on the floor beside him and tossed a flap of soft, greasy Mussulman bread to the boy. Go and lie down among my horse boys for tonight, thou and the lama. Tomorrow I may give thee service. Kim slunk away, his teeth in the bread, and, as he expected, he found a small wad of folded tissue paper wrapped in oilskin with three silver rupees, enormous largesse. He smiled and thrust money and paper into his leather amulet case. The lama, sumptuously fed by Mahbub's Baltis, was already asleep in a corner of one of the stalls. Kim lay down beside him and laughed. He knew he had rendered a service to Mahbub Ali, and not for one little minute did he believe the tale of the stallion's pedigree. But Kim did not suspect that Mahbub Ali, known as one of the best horse dealers in the Punjab, a wealthy and enterprising trader whose caravans penetrated far and far into the back of beyond, was registered in one of the locked books of the Indian Survey Department as C-25-1B. Twice or thrice yearly, C-25 would send in a little story, boldly told but most interesting, and generally it was checked by the statements of R-17 and M-4. Quite true. It concerned all manner of out-of-the-way mountain principalities, explorers of nationalities other than English, and the gun trade was, in brief, a small portion of that vast mass of information received, on which the Indian government acts. But recently, five confederated kings who had no business to confederate had been informed by a kindly northern power that there was a leakage of news from their territories into British India. So these king's prime ministers were seriously annoyed and took steps after the oriental fashion. They suspected, among many others, the bullying, red-bearded horse-dealer whose caravans ploughed through their fastnesses belly-deep in snow. At least his caravan that season had been ambushed and shot at twice on the way down, when Mahbub's men accounted for three strange ruffians who might, or might not, have been hired for the job. Therefore, Mahbub had avoided halting at the insalubrious city of Peshawar, and had come through without stop to Lahore, where, knowing his country people, he anticipated curious developments. And there was that on Mahbub Ali which he did not wish to keep an hour longer than was necessary, a wad of closely folded tissue paper wrapped in oilskin, an impersonal unaddressed statement with five microscopic pinholes in one corner that most scandalously betrayed the five confederated kings, the sympathetic northern power, a Hindu banker in Peshawar, a firm of gunmakers in Belgium, and an important semi-independent Mohammedan ruler 
to the south. This was R-17's work, which Mahbub had picked up beyond the Dora Pass and was carrying in for R-17, who, owing to circumstances over which he had no control, could not leave his post of observation. Dynamite was milky and innocuous beside that report of C-25, and even an Oriental with an Oriental's views of the value of time could see that the sooner it was in the proper hands, the better. Marbub had no particular desire to die by violence, because two or three family blood feuds across the border hung unfinished on his hands, and when these scores were cleared he intended to settle down as a more or less, virtuous citizen. He had never passed the Surrey Gate since his arrival two days ago, but had been ostentatious in sending telegrams to Bombay, where he banked some of his money, to Delhi, where a sub-partner of his own clan was selling horses to the agent of a Rajputana state, and to Umbala, where an Englishman was excitedly demanding the pedigree of a white stallion. The public letter writer who knew English composed excellent telegrams, such as Creighton, Laurel Bank, Umbala. Horse is Arabian as already advised. The sorrowful delayed pedigree, which am translating. And later, to the same address, much sorrowful delay will forward pedigree. To his sub-partner at Delhi, he wired, Lutuf Ullah. Have wired two thousand rupees, your credit, Lutchman, Narain's bank. This was entirely in the way of trade, but every one of those telegrams was discussed and rediscussed by parties who conceived themselves to be interested before they went over to the rail station in charge of a foolish bolty who allowed all sorts of people to read them on the road. When in Mahbub's own picturesque language, he had muddied the wells of inquiry with the stick of precaution, Kim had dropped on him, sent from heaven, and being as prompt as he was unscrupulous, Marble Bally, used to taking all sorts of gusty chances, pressed him into service on the spot. A wandering llama with a low-caste boy-servant might attract a moment's interest as they wandered about India, the land of pilgrims, but no one would suspect them or what was more to the point, Rob. He called for a new light ball to his hooker and considered the case. If the worst came to the worst and the boy came to harm, the paper would incriminate nobody and he would go up to Umbala leisurely and, at a certain risk of exciting fresh suspicion, repeat his tale by word of mouth to the people concerned. But R-17's report was the kernel of the whole affair and it would be distinctly inconvenient if that failed to come to hand. However, God was great, and Mahbub Ali felt he had done all he could for the time being. Kim was the one soul in the world who had never told him a lie. That would have been a fatal blot on Kim's character if Mahbub had not known that to others. For his own ends or Mahbub's business, Kim could lie like an Oriental. Then Mahbub Ali rolled across the Sarai to the gate of the harpies who paint their eyes and trapped the stranger, and was at some pains to call on the one girl who, he had reason to believe, was a particular friend of a smooth-faced Kashmiri pundit who had waylaid his simple balti in the matter of the telegrams. It was an utterly foolish thing to do, because they felt a drinking perfumed brandy against the law of the prophet, and Mahbub grew wonderfully drunk, and the gates of his mouth were loosened, and he pursued the flower of delight with the feet of intoxication, till he fell flat among the cushions, where the flower of delight, aided by a smooth-faced Kashmiri pundit, searched him from head to foot most thoroughly. About the same hour, Kim heard soft feet in Mahbub's deserted stall. The horse trader, curiously enough, had left his door unlocked, and his men were busy celebrating their return to India with a whole sheep of Mahbub's bounty. A sleek young gentleman from Delhi, armed with a bunch of keys which the flower had unshackled from the senseless one's belt, went through every single box, bundle, mat, and saddlebag in Mahbub's possession even more systematically than the flower and the pundit were searching the owner. And I think, 
said the flower scornfully an hour later, one rounded elbow on the snoring carcass, that he is no more than a pig of an Afghan horse dealer with no thought except women and horses. Moreover, he may have sent it away by now, if ever there were such a thing. Nay, in a matter touching five kings, it would be next to his black heart, said the pundit. Was there nothing? The Delhi man laughed and resettled his turban as he entered. I searched between the soles of his slippers as the flower searched his clothes. This is not the man, but another. I leave little unseen. They did not say he was the very man, said the pundit thoughtfully. They said, look if he be the man, since our counsels are troubled. That north country is full of horse dealers as an old coat of lice. There is Sikandar Khan, Nur Ali Beg, and Farooq Shah, all heads of Kafilas caravans who deal there, said the flower. They have not yet come in, said the pundit. Thou must ensnare them later. A few, said the flower, with deep disgust, rolling Mahbub's head from her lap. I earn my money. Farooq Shah is a bear. Ali Beg, a swashbuckler, and old Sikandar Khan. Oh, yahi, go. I sleep now. This swine will not stir till dawn. When Mabu woke, the flower talked to him severely on the sin of drunkenness. Asiatics do not wink when they have outmaneuvered an enemy, but as Mabu Bali cleared his throat, tightened his belt, and staggered forth under the early morning stars, he came very near to it. What a cold trick, he said to himself, as if every girl in Prashwa did not use it. That was prettily done. Uh, now, God, he knows how many more there be upon the road who have orders to test me, uh, perhaps with a knife. Uh, so it stands that the boy must go to Ambala and by rail, uh, for the writing is something urgent. I abide here, uh, following the flower and drinking wine, as an Afghan kopa should. He halted at the stall next but one to his own. His men lay there, heavy with sleep. There was no sign of Kim or the Lama. Up he stared a sleeper. Oh, whither went those who lay here last even, the lama and the boy? Is aught missing? Nay, grunted the man, and the old madman rose at second cockcrow, saying he would go to Benares, and the young one led him away. Oh, the curse of Allah on all unbelievers, said Mabub heartily, and climbed into his own stall, growling in his beard. But it was Kim who had wakened the lama. Kim, with one eye laid against a knot-hole in the planking, who had seen the Delhi man search through the boxes. This was no common thief that turned over letters, bills, and saddles, no mere burglar who ran a little knife sideways into the soles of Marboob's slippers, or picked the seams of the saddlebags so deftly. At first Kim had been minded to give the alarm, the long-drawn chaw chaw thief, thief that sets the seray ablaze of nights. But he looked more carefully, and, hand on amulet, drew his own conclusions. It must be the pedigree of that made-up horse-lie, said he, the thing that I carry to Ambala. Better that we go now. Those who search bags with knives may presently search bellies with knives. Surely there is a woman behind this. I... In a whisper to the light-sleeping old man. Come, it's time, time to go to Benares. The lama rose obediently, and they passed out of the Surai like shadows. Chapter 2 And whoso will, from pride released, Condemning neither creed nor priest, May feel the soul of all the East About him at Kamakura. Buddha at Kamakura They entered the fort-like railway station, Black in the end of night, The electrics sizzling over the goods yard, Where they handle the heavy northern grain traffic. This is the work of devils, said the lama, recoiling from the hollow, echoing darkness, the glimmer of rails between the masonry platforms, and the maze of girders above. He stood in a gigantic stone hall, paved, it seemed, with the sheeted dead third-class passengers who had taken their tickets overnight and were sleeping in the waiting rooms. All hours of the twenty-four are alike to Orientals, and their passenger traffic is regulated accordingly. This is where the fire carriages come. One stands behind that hole, Kim pointed to the ticket office. Who will give thee a paper to take thee to Ambala? 
"'But we go to Benares,' he replied petulantly. "'All one. Benares, then. Quick, she comes. Uh, take the other purse.' The lama, not so well used to trains as he had pretended, started as the 3.25 a.m. southbound roared in. The sleepers sprang to life, and the station filled with clamour and shoutings. Cries of water and sweetmeat vendors, shouts of native policemen, and shrill yells of women gathering up their baskets, their families and their husbands. "'It is the train, only the terrain. It will not come here. Wait!' Amazed at the lama's immense simplicity, he had handed him a small bag full of rupees. Kim asked and paid for a ticket to Ambala. A sleepy clerk grunted and flung out a ticket to the next station, just six miles distant. Nay, said Kim, scanning it with a grin, this may serve for farmers, but I live in the city of Lahore. It was cleverly done, Babu. Now, give the ticket to Ambala. The Babu scowled and dealt the proper ticket. "'And now another to Amritsar,' said Kim, who had no notion of spending Mahbub Ali's money on anything so crude as a paid ride to Ambola. "'The price is so much. The small money in return is just so much. I know the ways of the terrain. Never did yogi need chela as thou dost,' he went on merrily to the bewildered Lama. "'They would have flung thee out at me a mere, but for me.' "'This way. Come.' He returned the money, keeping only one anna in each rupee of the price of the Umbala ticket as his commission, the Immemorial Commission of Asia. The lama jipped at the open door of a crowded third-class carriage. "'Were it not better to walk?' said he weakly. A burly Sikh artisan thrust forth his bearded head. "'Is he afraid? Do not be afraid. I remember the time when I was afraid of the terrain.' "'Enter. This thing is the work of the government.' "'I do not fear,' said the lama. "'Have you room within for two? "'There is no room even for a mouse,' shrilled the wife of a well-to-do cultivator, a Hindu jat from the rich Jolando district. "'Our night trains are not as well looked after as the day ones, "'where the sexes are very strictly kept to private carriages. "'Oh, mother of my son, we can make space.' said the blue-turbaned husband. Pick up the child. It is a holy man, seest thou? And my lap full of seventy times seven bundles. Why not bid him sit on my knees? Shameless, but men are ever thus. She looked round for approval. An Amritsar courtesan near the window sniffed behind her head drapery. Enter, enter, cried a fat Hindu moneylender, his folded account book in a cloth under his arm, with an oily smirk. It is well to be kind to the poor. "'I at seven per cent a month with a mortgage on the unborn calf,' said a young Dogra soldier going south on leave, and they all laughed. "'Will it travel to Benares?' said the lama. "'Assuredly, else why should we come? Enter, or we're left,' cried Kim. "'See,' shrilled the Amritsar girl, "'he has never entered a train. Oh, see!' "'Nay, help,' said the cultivator, putting out a large brown hand and hauling him in. "'Thus it done, father.' But, but I sit on the floor. It is against the rule to sit on a bench, said the lama. Moreover, it cramps me. I say, began the moneylender, pursing his lips, that there is not one rule of right living which these terrains do not cause us to break. We sit, for example, side by side with all castes and peoples. Yea, and with most outrageously shameless ones, said the wife, scowling at the Amritsar girl, making eyes at the young sepoy. "'I said we might have gone by cart along the road,' said the husband, "'and thus have saved some money. "'Yes, and spent twice over what we saved on food, by the way, "'that was talked out ten thousand times. "'Ay, by ten thousand tongues,' grunted he. "'The gods help us, poor women, if we may not speak. "'Oh, he is of that sort, which may not look at or reply to a woman.' "'For the lama, constrained by his rule, took not the faintest notice of her. "'And his disciple is like him.' "'Nay, mother,' said Kim, most promptly, "'not when the woman is well-looking, "'and above all charitable to the hungry.' "'A beggar's answer,' said the Sikh, laughing. "'Thou hast brought it on thyself, sister.' Kim's hands were crooked in supplication. "'And whither goest thou?' said the woman, "'handing him the half of a cake from a greasy package. "'Even to Benares.' "'Jugglers belike,' 
the young soldier suggested. Have you any tricks to pass the time? Why does not that yellow man answer? Because, said Kim stoutly, he is holy, and thinks upon matters hidden from thee. That may be well. We of the Ludiana six, he rolled it out sonorously, do not trouble our heads with doctrine. We fight. My sister's brother's son is Nick, a corporal in that regiment, said the Sikh craftsman quietly. There are also some Dogra companies there. The soldier glared, for a Dogra is of other caste than a Sikh, and the banker tittered. They are all one to me, said the Amritsar girl. That we believe, snorted the cultivator's wife malignantly. Nay, but all who serve the Sikhar with weapons in their hands are, as it were, one brotherhood. There is one brotherhood of the caste, but beyond that again, she looked round timidly. The bond of the Pulton, the regiment, eh? My brother is in a Jat regiment, said the cultivator. The Dogras be good men. Thy Sikhs, at least, were of that opinion, said the soldier, with a scowl at the placid old man in the corner. Thy Sikhs thought so when our two companies came to help them at the Poitza Kotl on the face of eight Afradi standards on the ridge, not three months gone. He told the story of a border action in which the Dogra companies of the Ludiana Sikhs had acquitted themselves well. The Amritsar girl smiled, for she knew the talk was to win her approval. Alas, said the cultivator's wife at the end, so their villages were burnt and their little children made homeless? They had marked our dead. They paid a great payment after we of the Sikhs had schooled them. So it was, is this Amritsar? Aye, and here they cut our tickets, said the banker, fumbling at his belt. The lamps were paling in the dawn when the half-caste guard came round. Ticket collecting is a slow business in the east, where people secrete their tickets in all sorts of curious places. Kim produced his and was told to get out. "'But I go to Umbala,' he protested. "'I go with this holy man.' "'Thou canst go to Janum for aught I care. "'This ticket is only—' "'Kim burst into a flood of tears, "'protesting that the Lama was his father and his mother, "'that he was the prop of the Lama's declining years, "'and that the Lama would die without his care. "'All the carriage bade the guard be merciful. "'The banker was specially eloquent here, "'but the guard hauled Kim onto the platform.' The Lama blinked. He could not overtake the situation, and Kim lifted up his voice and wept outside the carriage window. I am very poor. My father's dead. My mother is dead. Oh, charitable ones, if I'm left here, who shall tend that old man? What, what is this? The Lama repeated. He must go to Benares. He must come with me. He is my teller. If there is money to be paid... Oh, be silent, whispered Kim. Are we Rajas to throw away good silver when the world is so charitable? The Amritsar girl stepped out with her bundles, and it was on her that Kim kept his watchful eye. Ladies of that persuasion, he knew, were generous. A ticket, a little ticket to Umbala. Oh, breaker of hearts, she laughed. Hast thou no charity? Does the holy man come from the north? Uh, from far, and in the north he comes cried Kim, from among the hills. There is snow among the pine trees in the north. In the hills there is snow. My mother was from Kulu. Get thee a ticket. Ask him for a blessing. Oh, ten thousand blessings, shrilled Kim. Oh, holy one, a woman has given us in charity so that I can come with thee. A woman with a golden heart. I run for that ticket. The girl looked up at the lama, who had mechanically followed Kim to the platform. He bowed his head that he might not see her, and muttered in Tibetan as she passed on with the crowd. "'Light come, light go,' said the cultivator's wife, viciously. "'She has acquired merit,' returned the lama. "'Beyond doubt, it was a nun.' "'There be ten thousand such nuns in Amritsar alone. "'Return, old man, or the Tirain may depart without thee,' cried the banker. "'Not only was it sufficient for the ticket, but for a little food also,' said Kim." and leaping to his place. And now eat, holy one. Look, day comes. Golden, rose, saffron, and pink, the morning mists smoked away across the flat green levels. All the rich Punjab lay out in the splendour of the keen sun. The lama flinched a little as the telegraph posts swung by. Great is the speed of the terrain, 
said the banker, with a patronising grin. "'We have gone farther since Lahore than thou couldst walk in two days at even. We shall enter Umbala. "'And that is still far from Benares,' said the lama wearily, mumbling over the cakes that Kim offered. They all unloosed their bundles and made their morning meal. Then the banker, the cultivator, and the soldier prepared their pipes and wrapped the compartment in choking, acrid smoke, spitting and coughing, and enjoying themselves. The Sikh and the cultivator's wife chewed pan. The lama took snuff and told his beads, while Kim, cross-legged, smiled over the comfort of a full stomach. "'What rivers have ye by Benares?' said the lama, of a sudden, to the carriage at large. "'We have Ganga,' returned the banker, when the little titter had subsided. "'What others?' "'What other than Ganga?' "'Nay, but in my mind was the thought of a certain river of feeling. "'That is Ganga, who bathes in her, is made clean, and goes to the gods. "'Thrice have I made pilgrimage to Ganga,' he looked round proudly. "'There was need,' said the young sepoy dryly, "'and the traveller's laugh turned against the banker. "'Clean to return again to the gods,' the lama muttered, "'and to go forth on the round of lives anew, still tied to the wheel. "'He shook his head testily. "'But maybe there's a mistake. "'Who then made Ganga in the beginning?' "'The gods of what known faith art thou?' the banker said, appalled. "'I follow the law, the most excellent law. "'So it was the gods that made Ganga. "'What like of gods were they?' "'The carriage looked at him in amazement. "'It was inconceivable that anyone should be ignorant of Ganga. "'What? What is thy god?' said the moneylender at last. "'Here!' said the lama, shifting the rosary to his hand. Here, for I speak of him now. O oh, people of Hind, listen. He began in Urdu the tale of the Lord Buddha, but, born by his own thoughts, slid into Tibetan and long drawn texts from a Chinese book of the Buddha's life. The gentle, tolerant folk looked on reverently. All India is full of holy men stammering gospels in strange tongues. Shaken, and consumed in the fires of their own zeal, dreamers, babblers, and visionaries, as it has been from the beginning, and will continue to the end. Um, said the shoulder of the Ludhiana Sikhs, there was a Mohammedan regiment lay next to us at the Pirtse Kotal, and a priest of theirs, he was, as I remember, a naik, when the fit was on him, spake prophecies, but the mad all are in God's keeping. His officers overlooked much in that man. The lama fell back on Urdu, remembering that he was in a strange land. Hear the tale of the arrow which our lord loosed from the bow, he said. This was much more to their taste, and they listened curiously while he told it. And now, O oh people of Hind, I go to seek that river. Uh, know ye aught that may guide me, for we be all men and women in evil case. There is Ganga, and Ganga alone, who washes away sin, ran the murmur round the carriage. Though past question, we have good gods to land away, said the cultivator's wife, looking out of the window. See how they have blessed the crops. To search every river in the Punjab is no small matter, said her husband. For me, a stream that leaves good silt on my land suffices, and I thank Bumia, the god of the homestead. He shrugged one knotted, bronzed shoulder. "'Think you our lord came so far north?' said the lama, turning to Kim. "'It may be,' Kim replied soothingly, as he spat red pan-juice on the floor. "'The last of the great ones,' said the Sikh, with authority, "'was Sikanda Julkan, Alexander the Great. "'He paved the streets of Julunda and built a great tank near Umbala. "'That pavement holds to this day, and the tank is there also. "'I never heard of thy god.' "'Let thy hair grow long and talk Punjabi,' said the young soldier jestingly to Kim, quoting a northern proverb. "'That is all that makes a Sikh.' But he did not say this very loud. The lama sighed and shrank into himself, a dingy, shapeless mass. In the pauses of their talk they could hear the low droning. "'Om mani put me hum, om mani put me hum and the thick click of the wooden rosary beads. "'It irks me,' he said at last. "'The speed and the clatter irk me. 
Moreover, my cella, I think that maybe we have overpassed that river. A peace, peace, said Kim. It was not the river near Benares. We are yet far from that place. But if our lord came north, it may be any one of these little ones that we have run across. I do not know. But thou wast sent to me. Wast thou sent to me? For the merit I had acquired over yonder at such sen, from beside the cannon didst thou come, bearing two faces and two garbs. Peace. One must not speak of these things here whispered Kim. There was but one of me. Think again, and thou wilt remember. A boy, a Hindu boy, by the great green cannon. But was there not also an Englishman with a white beard, holy among images, who himself made more sure my assurance of the river of the arrow? He, we, went to the Ajayb Gur in Lahore to pray before the gods there, Kim explains to the openly listening company. "'And the sahib of the Wonder House talked to him. "'Yes, this is truth as a brother. "'He is a very holy man from far beyond the hills. Uh, "'Rest thou. In time we come to Umbala. "'But my river, the river of my healing. "'And then, if it please thee, we will go hunting for that river on foot, "'so that we miss nothing, not even a little rivulet in a field side. "'But thou hast a search of thine own?' The lama, very pleased that he remembered so well, sat bolt upright. Aye, said Kim, humouring him. The boy was entirely happy to be out chewing pan and seeing new people in the great, good-tempered world. It was a bull, a red bull, that shall come and help thee and carry thee whither. I have forgotten. A red bull on a green field, was it not? Nay, it will carry me nowhere, said Kim. It, it is but a tale I told thee. "'What is this?' the cultivator's wife leaned forward, her bracelets clinking on her arm. "'Do you both dream dreams? A red bull on a green field that shall carry thee to the heavens, or what? Was it a vision? Did one make a prophecy? We have a red bull in our village behind Julunda City, and he crazes by choice in the very greenest of our fields.' "'Give a woman an old wife's tale, and a weaver bird a leaf and a thread. They will weave wonderful things,' said the Sikh. All holy men dream dreams, and by following holy men their disciples attain that power. A red bull on a green field, was it? The lama repeated. In a former life it may be thou hast acquired merit, and the bull will come to reward thee. Nay, nay, it was but a tale one told to me, for a jest belike. Uh, but I will seek the bull about Umbala, and thou canst look for thy river, and rest from the clatter of the train. It may be that the bull knows that he is sent to guide us both, said the lama, hopefully, as a child. Then to the company, indicating Kim. This one was sent to me but yesterday. He is not, I think, of this world. Beggars are plenty I have met, and holy men to boot, but never such a yogi nor such a disciple, said the woman. Her husband touched his forehead lightly with one finger and smiled. But the next time the lama would eat, they took care to give him of their best. And, at last, tired, sleepy, and dusty, they reached Umbala city station. "'We abide here upon a lawsuit,' said the cultivator's wife to Kim. "'We lodge with my man's cousin's younger brother. There is room also in the courtyard for thy yogi and for thee. Will, will he give me a blessing?' "'Oh, holy man!' A woman with a heart of gold gives us lodging for the night. It is a kindly land, this land of the south. See how we have been helped since the dawn. The lama bowed his head in benediction. To fill my cousin's younger brother's house with wastrels, the husband began as he shouldered his heavy bamboo staff. Thy cousin's younger brother owes my father's cousin something yet on his daughter's marriage feast, said the woman crisply. Let me put their food to that account. The yogi will beg, I doubt not. I, I beg for him, said Kim, anxious only to get the lama under shelter for the night, that he might seek Mahbub Ali's Englishman and deliver himself of the white stallion's pedigree. And now, said he, when the lama had come to an anchor in the inner courtyard of a decent Hindu house behind the cantonments, I go away for a while to, to buy his victual in the bazaar. Do not stray abroad until I return.
thou wilt return, thou wilt surely return, the old man caught at his wrist, and thou wilt return in this very same shape. Is it too late to look tonight for the river? Too late and too dark. Be comforted. Think how far thou art on the road, an hundred miles from Lahore already. Yea, and farther from my monastery, alas, it is a great and terrible world. Kim stole out and away, as unremarkable a figure as ever carried his own, and a few score thousand other folk's fate slung around his neck. Mahbub Ali's directions left him little doubt of the house in which his Englishman lived, and a groom, bringing a dog-cart home from a club, made him quite sure. It remained only to identify his man, and Kim slipped through the garden hedge and hid in a clump of plumed grass close to the veranda. The house blazed with lights, and servants moved about tables dressed with flowers, glass and silver. Presently forth came an Englishman, dressed in black and white, humming a tune. It was too dark to see his face, so Kim, beggar-wise, tried an old experiment. "'Protector of the poor,' the man backed towards the voice. "'Mahubali says—' "'Ah, what says Mahubali?' He made no attempt to look for the speaker, and that showed Kim that he knew. "'The pedigree of the white stallion is fully established.' "'What proof is there?' The Englishman switched at the rose hedge on the side of the drive. "'Mahu Bali has given me this proof.' Kim flipped the wad of folded paper into the air, and it fell in the path beside the man, who put his foot on it as a gardener came round the corner. When the servant passed, he picked it up, dropped a rupee, Kim could hear the clink, and strode into the house, never turning round. Swiftly, Kim took up the money, but for all his training, he was Irish enough by birth to reckon silver the least part of any game. What he desired was the visible effect of action, so, instead of slinking away, he lay close in the grass and wormed nearer to the house. He saw, Indian bungalows are open through and through, the Englishman return to a small dressing-room in a corner of the veranda, that was half office, littered with papers and dispatch boxes, and sit down to study Mahbub Ali's message. His face, by the full ray of the kerosene lamp, changed and darkened, and Kim, used as every beggar must be to watching countenances, took good note. Well, well, dear, called a woman's voice, you ought to be in the drawing room. They'll be here in a minute. The man still read intently. Well, said the voice five minutes later, he's come. I can hear the troopers in the drive. The man dashed out, bareheaded as a big landau, with four native troopers behind it, halted at the veranda, and a tall, black-haired man, erect as an arrow, swung out, preceded by a young officer, who laughed pleasantly. Flat on his belly lay Kim, almost touching the high wheels. His man and the black stranger exchanged two sentences. Certainly, sir, said the young officer promptly. Everything waits while a horse is concerned. We shan't be more than twenty minutes, said Kim's man. You can do the honours, keep him amused and all that. Tell one of the troopers to wait, said the tall man, and they both passed into the dressing room together as the landau rolled away. Kim saw their heads bent over Mabu Bali's message and heard the voices, one low and deferential, the other sharp and decisive. "'It isn't a question of weeks. It is a question of days. Hours, almost,' said the elder. "'I'd been expecting it for some time, but this,' he tapped Marbub Ali's paper, "'clinches it. Grogan's dining here tonight, isn't he?' "'Yes, sir. And Macklin, too.' "'Very good. I'll speak to them myself.' The matter will be referred to the council, of course, but this is a case where one is justified in assuming that we take action at once. Warn the Pind and the Peshwa brigades. It will disorganise all the summer reliefs, but we can't help that. This comes of not smashing them thoroughly the first time. Eight thousand should be enough. Uh, what about artillery, sir? I must consult Macklin. Then it means war? No, 
a punishment, when a man is bound by the action of his predecessor, uh, but C-25 may have lied. He bears out the other's information. Uh, practically, uh, they showed their hands six months back. But Devonish would have it. There was a chance of peace. Of course, they used it to make themselves stronger. Send off those telegrams at once. The new code, not the old. Mine and Wharton's. I don't think we need keep the ladies waiting any longer. We can settle the rest over the cigars. I thought it was coming. It's punishment, not war. As the trooper cantered off, Kim crawled round to the back of the house, where, going on his Lahore experiences, he judged there would be food and information. The kitchen was crowded with excited scullions, one of whom kicked him. I, said Kib, feigning tears, I came only to wash dishes in return for a bellyful. All Umbala is on the same errand, get hence, they go in now with the soup. Think you that we who serve Creighton Sahib need strange scullions to help us through a big dinner? It is a very big dinner, said Kim, looking at the plates. A small wonder, the guest of honour is none other than the Jangi Lat Sahib, the commander-in-chief. Oh, said Kim, with the correct guttural note of wonder. He had learned what he wanted, and when the scullion turned, he was gone. And all that trouble, said he to himself, thinking as usual in Hindustani, for a horse's pedigree. Mabu Bali should have come to me to learn a little lying. Every time before that I have borne a message, it concerned a woman, and now it is men. Better. The tall man said they will lose a great army to punish someone, somewhere. The news goes to Pindi and Peshwar. There are also guns. Would I had crept nearer. It is big news. He returns to find the cultivator's cousin's younger brother discussing the family lawsuit in all its bearings with the cultivator and his wife and a few friends, while the llama dozed. After the evening meal, someone passed him a water pipe, and Kim felt very much of a man as he pulled at the smooth coconut shell. His legs spread abroad in the moonlight, his tongue clicking in remarks from time to time. His hosts were most polite, for the cultivator's wife had told them of his vision of the red bull, and of his probable descent from another world. Moreover, the llama was a great and venerable curiosity. The family priest, an old tolerant Sarsut Brahmin, dropped in later, and naturally started a theological argument to impress the family. By creed, of course, they were all on their priest's side, but the Lama was the guest and the novelty. His gentle kindliness and his impressive Chinese quotations that sounded like spells delighted them hugely, and in this sympathetic, simple air he expanded like the Bodhisat's own lotus, speaking of his life in the great hills of such Zen, before, as he said, I rose up to seek enlightenment. Then it came out that, in those worldly days, he had been a master hand at casting horoscopes and nativities, and the family priest led him on to describe his methods, each giving the planets names that the other could not understand, and pointing upwards as the big stars sailed across the dark. The children of the house tugged unrebuked at his rosary, and he clean forgot the rule which forbids looking at women, as he talked of enduring snows, landslips, blocked passes, the remote cliffs where men find sapphires and turquoise, and that wonderful upland road that leads, at last, into great China itself. "'How thinkest thou of this one?' said the cultivator aside to the priest. "'A holy man!' A holy man indeed. His gods are not the gods, but his feet are upon the way, was the answer. And his methods of nativities, though that is beyond thee, are wise and sure. Tell me, said Kim lazily, whether I find my red bull on a green field, as was promised me. What knowledge hast thou of thy birth hour? the priest asked, swelling with importance. Between first and second cockrow of the first night in May. Of what year? I do not know, but upon the hour that I cried first fell a great earthquake in Srinagar, which is in Kashmir. 
This Kim had from the woman who took care of him, and she again from Kimbal O'Hara. The earthquake had been felt in India, and for long stood a leading date at the Punjab. I said a woman excitedly. This seemed to make Kim's supernatural origin more certain. Was not such an one's daughter born then? And her mother bore her husband's four sons in four years, all likely boys, cried the cultivator's wife, sitting outside the circle in the shadow. None reared in the knowledge, said the family priest. Forget how the planets stood in their houses upon that night. He began to draw in the dust of the courtyard. At least thou hast good claim to a half of the house of the bull. How runs thy prophecy? Upon a day, said Kim, delighted at the sensation he was creating, I shall be made great by means of a red bull on a green field. But first there will enter two men, making all things ready. Yes, thus ever, at the opening of a vision, a thick darkness that clears slowly, anon one enters with a broom, making ready the place. Then begins the sight. Uh, two men, thou sayest? Aye, aye. The son, leaving the house of the bull, enters that of the twins. Hence the two men of the prophecy. Let us now consider. Uh, fetch me a twig, little one. He knitted his brows, scratched, smoothed out, and scratched again in the dust, mysterious signs, to the wonder of all, save the lama, who with fine instinct forbore to interfere. At the end of half an hour he tossed the twig from him with a grunt. Hmm, uh, thus say the stars. Uh, within three days come the two men to make all things ready. After them follows the bull, uh, but the sign over against him is the sign of war and armed men. Uh, th there was indeed a man of the Ludiana Six in the carriage from Lahore, said the cultivator's wife, hopefully. Uh, chick, armed men, many hundreds. Uh, what concern hast thou with war? Uh, said the priest to Kim. Uh, thine is a red and an angry sign of war to be loose very soon. None, none, said the lama earnestly. Uh, we seek only peace and our river. Kim smiled, remembering what he had overheard in the dressing room. Decidedly, he was a favourite of the stars. The priest brushed his foot over the rude horoscope. More than this I cannot see. In three days comes the bull to thee, boy. And my river, my river, pleaded the lama. I had hoped his bull would lead us both to the river. Alas, for that wondrous river, my brother, the priest replied, such things are not common. Next morning, though, they were pressed to stay. The lama insisted on departure. They gave Kim a large bundle of good food and nearly three annas in copper money for the needs of the road, and, with many blessings, watched the two go southward in the dawn. Pity it is that these and such as these could not be freed from... Nay, they would only evil people be left on the earth, and who would give us meat and shelter? quoth Kim, stepping merrily under his burden. Yonder is a small stream. Uh, let us look, said the lama, and he led from the white road across the fields, walking into a very hornet's nest of pariah dogs. Chapter 3 Yea, voice of every soul that clung to life, that strove from rung to rung, when Devadatta's rule was young, the warm wind brings Kamakura. Buddha at Kamakura. Behind them an angry farmer brandished a bamboo pole. He was a market gardener, a rain by caste, growing vegetables and flowers for Umbala city. And, well, Kim knew the breed. Such an one, said the lama, disregarding the dogs, is impolite to strangers, intemperate of speech and uncharitable. Be warned by his demeanour, my disciple. Oh, shameless beggars, shouted the farmer. Be gone, get hence. We go, the lama returned with quiet dignity. We go from these unblessed fields. Ah, said Kim, sucking in his breath. If the next crop fail, thou canst only blame thine own tongue. The man shuffled uneasily in his slippers. The land is half full of beggars, he began, half apologetically. 
and by what sign didst thou know that we would beg from thee, O oh, Molly? said Kim Tartley, using the name that a market garner least likes. All we sought was to look at that river beyond the field there. River, forsooth, the man snorted. What city do you hail from not to know a canal cut? It runs as straight as an arrow, and I pay for the water as though it were molten silver. There is a branch of a river beyond, but if you need water, I can give that, and milk. Nay, we will go to the river, said the llama, striding out. Milk and a meal, the man stammered, as he looked at the strange tall figure. I, I would not draw evil upon myself or my crops, but beggars are so many in these hard days. Take notice, the llama turns to Kim. He was led to speak harshly by the red mist of anger. That clearing from his eyes, he becomes courteous and of an affable heart. May his fields be blessed. Beware not to judge men too hastily, O farmer. I have met holy ones who would have cursed thee from hearthstone to byre, said Kim to the abashed man. Is he not wise and holy? I am his disciple. He cocked his nose in the air loftily and stepped across the narrow field borders with great dignity. There is no pride, said the llama after a pause. There is no pride among such as follow the middle way. But thou hast said he was low caste and discourteous. Low caste I did not say, for how can that be which is not? Afterward he amended his discourtesy, and I forgot the offence. Moreover, he is, as we are, bound upon the wheel of things. But he does not tread the way of deliverance. He halted at a little runlet among the fields, and considered the half-pitted bank. Now, how wilt thou know thy river? said Kim, squatting in the shade of some tall sugar cane. When I find it, an enlightenment will surely be given. This, I feel, is not the place. O oh, littlest among the waters, if only thou couldst tell me where runs my river, but be thou blessed to make the fields bare. Look, look! Kim sprang to his side and dragged him back. A yellow and brown streak glided from the purple rustling stems to the bank, stretched its neck in the water, drank, and lay still. A big cobra with fixed, lidless eyes. I have no stick! I, I have no stick! said Kim. I will get me one and break his back. Why? He is upon the wheel as we are, a life ascending or descending very far from deliverance. A great evil must the soul have done that is cast into this shape. I hate all snakes, said Kim. No native training can quench the white man's horror of the serpent. Let him live out his life, the coiled thing hissed and half opened its hood. May thy release come soon, brother, the llama continued placidly. Hast thou knowledge, by chance, of my river? Never have I seen such a man as thou art, Kim whispered, overwhelmed. Do the very snakes understand thy talk? Who knows? He passed within a foot of the cobra's poised head. It flattened itself among the dusty coils. Come now, he growled over his shoulder. Not I, said Kim. I go round. Come, he does not hurt. Kim hesitated for a moment. The llama backed his order by some droned Chinese quotation which Kim took for a charm. He obeyed and bounded across the rivulet, and the snake, indeed, made no sign. Never have I seen such a man, Kim wiped the sweat from his forehead. And now, whither go we? That is for thee to say. I am old and a stranger, far from my own place. But that the rail carriage fills my head with noises of devil drums, I would go in it to Benares now. Yet, by doing so, we may miss the river. Let us find another river. Where the hard-worked soil gives three and even four crops a year, through patches of sugar cane, tobacco, long white radishes, and nolcol. All that day they strolled on, turning aside to every glimpse of water, rousing village dogs and sleeping villages at noonday. The llama replying to the volleyed questions with an unswerving simplicity. They sought a river, a river of miraculous healing. Had any one knowledge of such a stream? Sometimes men laughed, 
but more often heard the story out to the end and offered them a place in the shade, a drink of milk and a meal. The women were always kind, and the little children, as children are the world over, alternately shy and venturesome. Evening found them at rest under the village tree of a mud-walled, mud-roofed hamlet, talking to the headman as the cattle came in from the grazing grounds, and the women prepared the day's last meal. They had passed beyond the belt of market gardens round Hungry Umbala, and were among the mile-wide green of the stable crops. He was a white-bearded and affable elder, used to entertaining strangers. He dragged out a string bedstead for the lama, set warm cooked food before him, prepared him a pipe, and, the evening ceremonies being finished in the village temple, sent for the village priest. Kim told the older children tales of the size and beauty of Lahore, of railway travel and such like city things, while the men talked slowly as their cattle chew the cud. "'I cannot fathom it,' said the headman at last to the priest. "'How readest thou this talk?' The lama, his tale told, was silently telling his beads. "'He is a seeker,' the priest answered. "'The land is full of such. "'Remember him who came only last month, the faker with the tortoise?' "'Aye, but that man had right and reason, "'for Krishna himself appeared in a vision, "'promising him paradise without the burning pyre "'if he journeys to Prayak. "'This man seeks no god who is within my knowledge.' Peace, he is old, comes from far off, and he is mad. The smooth-shaven priest replied. Hear me, he turned to the lama. Three kos, six miles to the westward, runs the great road to Calcutta. But I would go to Benares, to Benares. And to Benares also, it crosses all streams on this side of Hind. And now my word to thee, holy one, is rest here till tomorrow. Then take the road. It was the great trunk road, he meant, and test each stream that it overpasses, for, as I understand, the virtue of thy river lies neither in one pool nor place, but throughout his length. Then if thy gods will be assured that thou wilt come upon thy freedom. That is well said. The lama was much impressed by the plan. We will begin to-morrow, and a blessing on thee for showing old feet such a near road. A deep sing-song Chinese half-chant closed the sentence. Even the priest was impressed, and the headman feared an evil spell. But none could look at the lama's simple, eager face and doubt him long. "'Seest thou my cella?' he said, diving into his snuff-gourd with an important sniff. It was his duty to repay courtesy with courtesy. "'I see and hear.' The headman rolled his eyes where Kim was chatting to a girl in blue as she laid crackling thorns on a fire. He also has a search of his own. No river, but a bull. Yea, a red bull on a green field will some day raise him to honour. He is, I think, not altogether of this world. He was sent of a sudden to aid me in his search, and his name is Friend of All the World. The priest smiled. Oh, there, Friend of All the World! he cried across the sharp-smelling smoke. "'What art thou?' "'This holy one's disciple,' said Kim. "'He says thou art but a spirit.' Uh, "'Can but eat,' said Kim, with a twinkle, "'for I am hungry.' "'It is no jest,' cried the lama. "'A certain astrologer of that city whose name I have forgotten. "'That is no more than the city of Ambala, where we slept last night,' Kim whispered to the priest. "'Ay, Ambala, was it?' He cast a horoscope and declared that my cella should find his desire within two days. But what said he of the meaning of stars, friend of all the world? Kim cleared his throat and looked around at the village greybeards. The meaning of my star is war, he replied pompously. Somebody laughed at the little tattered figure strutting on the brickwork plinth under the great tree. Where a native would have lain down, Kim's white blood set him upon his feet. "'I war,' he answered. "'That is a sure prophecy,' rumbled a deep voice, "'for there is always war along the border, as I know.' It was an old, withered man who had served the government in the days of the mutiny as a native officer in the newly raised cavalry regiment. 
the government had given him a good holding in the village, and though the demands of his sons, now grey-bearded officers on their own account, had impoverished him, he was still a person of consequence. English officials, deputy commissioners even, turned aside from the main road to visit him, and on those occasions he dressed himself in the uniform of ancient days and stood up like a ramrod. But this shall be a great war, a war of eight thousand, Kim's voice shrilled across the quick gathering crowd, astonishing himself. Redcoats or our own regiments, the old man snapped, as though he were asking an equal. His tone made men respect Kim. Redcoats, said Kim at a venture, redcoats and guns. But, but the, the astrologer said no word of this, cried the lama, snuffing prodigiously in his excitement. But I know, the word has come to me, who am this holy one's disciple? There will rise a war, a war of eight thousand redcoats, from Pindi and Peshwar they will be drawn. This is sure. The boy has heard bizarre talk, said the priest. But he was always by my side, said the lama. How should he know? I did not know. He will make a clever juggler when the old man is dead, muttered the priest to the headman. What new trick is this? A sign. Give me a sign, thundered the old soldier suddenly. If there were war, my sons would have told me. When all is ready, thy sons doubt not, will be told. But it is a long road from thy sons to the man in whose hands these things lie. Kim warmed to the game, for it reminded him of experiences in the letter-carrying line, when, for the sake of a few pice, he pretended to know more than he knew but now he was playing for larger things, the sheer excitement and the sense of power. He drew a new breath and went on. Old man, give me a sign. Do underlings order the goings of eight thousand redcoats with guns? No. Still, the old man answered as though Kim were an equal. Dost thou know who he is, then, that gives this order? I have seen him. To know again? I have known him since he was a lieutenant in the Topkana, the artillery. A tall man, a tall man with black hair, walking thus. Kim took a few paces in a stiff wooden style. Aye, but that any one may have seen. The crowd were breathless, still through all this talk. That is true, said Kim, but I will say no more. Look now, first the great man walks thus, then he thinks thus. Kim drew a forefinger over his forehead and downwards till it came to rest by the angle of the jaw. Anon he twitches his fingers thus. Anon he thrusts his hat under his left armpit. Kim illustrated the motion and stood like a stalk. The old man groaned, inarticulate with amazement, and the crowd shivered. Uh, so, so, so. But what does he when he is about to give an order? He rubs the skin at the back of his neck, thus, then falls one finger on the table, and he makes a small sniffing noise through his nose. Then he speaks, saying, Lose such and such a regiment, call out such guns. The old man rose stiffly and saluted. For, Kim translated into the vernacular, the clinching sentences he had heard in the dressing room at Ombala. For, says he, we should have done this long ago. It is not war. It is chastisement. <laughs> Enough, I believe. I have seen him thus in the smoke of battle, seen and heard. It is he. I saw no smoke. Kim's voice shifted to the rapt sing-song of the wayside fortune-teller. I saw this in darkness. First came a man to make things clear. Then came horsemen. Then came he, standing in a ring of light, uh, the rest followed, as I have said, old man. Have I spoken truth? It is he. Past all doubt, it is he. The crowd drew a long, quavering breath, staring alternately at the old man, still at attention, and ragged Kim against the purple twilight. Said I not? Said I not he was from the other world? cried the lama proudly. He is the friend of all the world. He is the friend of the stars. 
At least it does not concern us, a man cried. O thou young soothsayer, if the gift abides with thee at all seasons, I have a red-spotted cow. She may be sister to thy bull for aught I know. Or I care, said Kim, my stars do not concern themselves with thy cattle. Nay, but she is very sick, a woman struck in. My man is a buffalo, or he would have chosen his words better. Uh, tell me if she recover. Had Kim been at all an ordinary boy, he would have carried on the play. But one does not know Lahore City, and least of all the fakers by the Taxali Gate, for thirteen years, without also knowing human nature. The priest looked at him sideways, something bitterly, a dry and blighted smile. "'Is there no priest, then, in the village? I thought I'd seen a great one even now,' cried Kim. "'Aye, but,' the woman began, "'but thou and thy husband hoped to get the cow cured for a handful of thanks.' The shot told. They were notoriously the closest-fisted couple in the village. "'It is not well to cheat the temples. Give a young calf to thine own priest, and unless thy gods are angry past recall, she will give milk within a month.' A master beggar art thou, purred the priest approvingly. Not the cunning of forty years could have done better. Surely thou hast made the old man rich. A little flour, a little butter, and a mouthful of cardamoms, Kim retorted, flushed with the praise, but still cautious. Does one grow rich on that? And as thou canst see, he is mad. But it serves me, when I learn the road at least." He knew what the fakers of the Taxali Gate were like when they talked among themselves, and copied the very inflection of their lewd disciples. Is his search then truth, or a cloak to other ends? It may be treasure. Uh, he is mad, many times mad. There's nothing else. Here the old soldier bobbled up and asked if Kim would accept his hospitality for the night. The priest recommended him to do so, but insisted that the honour of entertaining the lama belonged to the temple, at which the lama smiled guilelessly. Kim glanced from one face to the other, and drew his own conclusions. "'Where is the money?' he whispered, beckoning the old man off into the darkness. "'In my bosom. Where else? Give it to me, quietly and swiftly. Give it to me. But why? Here is no ticket to buy. Am I thy cella? or am I not? Do I not safeguard thy old feet about the ways? Give me the money, and at dawn I will return it. He slipped his hand above the lama's girdle, and brought away the purse. Be it so, be it so. The old man nodded his head. This is a great and terrible world. I never knew there were so many men alive in it. Next morning the priest was in a very bad temper, but the lama was quite happy, and Kim enjoyed a most interesting evening with the old man, who brought out his cavalry sabre, and, balancing it on his dry knees, told tales of the mutiny and young captains thirty years in their graves, till Kim dropped off to sleep. "'Certainly the air of this country is good,' said the lama. "'I sleep lightly, as do all old men. But last night I slept on waking till broad day. Even now I am heavy. "'Drink a draught of hot milk.' said Kim, who had carried not a few such remedies to opium smokers of his acquaintance. It is time to take to the road again. The long road that overpasses all the rivers of Hind, said the lama gaily, let us go. But how thinkest thou, Chela, to recompense his people, and especially the priest, for their great kindness? Truly they are but parast, but in other lives, maybe, they will receive enlightenment." A rupee to the temple? The thing within is no more than stone and red paint, but the heart of man we must acknowledge when and where it is good. Holy One, hast thou ever taken the road alone? Kim looked up sharply, like the Indian crows, so busy about the fields. Surely, child, from Kulu to Pathancot, from Kulu where my first cella died. When men were kind to us we made offerings, and all men were well disposed throughout all the hills. It is otherwise in Hind, said Kim dryly. Their gods are many-armed and malignant. Let them alone. I would set thee on thy road for a little, a friend of all the world, thou and thy yellow man. The old soldier ambled up the village street, all shadowy in the dawn, 
on a punt. Scissor hocked Pungney. Last night broke up the fountains of remembrance in my so dried heart, and it was as a blessing to me. Truly there is war abroad in the air. I smell it. See, I have brought my sword. He sat long-legged on the little beast, with the big sword at his side, hand dropped on the pommel, staring fiercely over the flat lands towards the north. Tell me again how he showed in thy vision. Come up and sit beside me. The beast will carry too. I am this one's holy disciple, said Kim, as they cleared the village gate. The villagers seemed almost sorry to be rid of them, but the priest's farewell was cold and distant. He had wasted some opium on a man who carried no money. That is well spoken. I am not much used to holy men, but respect is always good. There is no respect in these days, not even when a commissioner sahib comes to see me. But why should one whose star leads him to war follow a holy man? But he is a holy man, said Kim earnestly. In truth and in talk and in act holy, he is not like the others. I have never seen such a one. We be not fortune-tellers, or jugglers, or beggars. Thou art not that I can see. But I do not know that other. He marches well, though. The first freshness of the day carried the llama forward with long, easy, camel-like strides. He was deep in meditation, mechanically clicking his rosary. They followed the rutted and worn country road that wound across the flat between the great dark green mango groves, the line of the snow-capped Himalayas faint to the eastward. All India was at work in the fields, to the creaking of well-wheels, the shouting of ploughmen behind their cattle, and the clamour of the crows. Even the pony felt the good influence, and almost broke into a trot as Kim laid a hand on the stirrup leather. "'It repents me that I did not give a rupee to the shrine,' said the lama, on the last bead of his eighty-one. The old soldier growled in his beard, so that the lama, for the first time, was aware of him. "'Seekest thou the river also?' said he, turning. "'The day is new,' was the reply. "'What need of a river save to water at before sundown? I come to show thee a short lane to the big road.' "'That is a courtesy to be remembered, O oh man of good will. "'But why the sword?' "'The old soldier looked as abashed as a child, "'interrupted in his game of make-believe. "'The sword,' he said, fumbling it. "'Oh, that was a fancy of mine, uh, an old man's fancy. Uh, "'Truly the police orders are that no man must bear weapons throughout Hind, "'but,' he cheered up and slapped the hilt, "'all the constables hereabout know me. "'It is not a good fancy,' said the lama. "'What profit to kill men?' "'Very little, as I know. "'But if evil men were not now, "'and then slain, it would not be a good world "'for weaponless streamers. "'I do not speak without knowledge, "'who have seen the land from Delhi south "'awash with blood. "'What madness was that, then? "'The gods who sent it for a plague alone know. "'A madness ate into all the army, "'and they turned against their officers.' That was the first evil, but not past remedy if they had then held their hands. But they chose to kill the sahibs' wives and children. Then came the sahibs from over the sea and called to them to most strict account. Some such rumour, I believe, reached me once long ago. They called it the Black Year, as I remember. What manner of life hast thou led, not to know the year? A rumour indeed, all earth knew and trembled. Ah, earth never shook but once upon the day that the excellent one received enlightenment. <laughs> I saw Delhi shake at least, and Delhi is the navel of the world. So they turned against women and children? That was a bad deed, for which the punishment cannot be avoided. Many strove to do so, but with very small profit. I was then in a regiment of the cavalry. It broke. Of six hundred and eighty sabres stood fast to their salt. How many, think you? Three, of whom I was one. The greater merit. Merit. We did not consider it merit in those days. My people, my friends, my brothers fell from me. They said, the time of the English is accomplished. Let each strike out a little holding for himself. 
but I had talked with the men of Sabrayan and Chilianwala, of Mudki and Ferozasha. I said, Abide a little, and the wind turns. There is no blessing in this work. In those days I rode seventy miles with an English memsahib and her babe on my saddle bow. Well, that was a horse fit for a man. I placed them in safety, and, and back came I to my officer, the one that was not killed of our five. Give me work, said I, for I am an outcast among my own kind, and my cousin's blood is wet on my sabre. Be content, said he. There is great work forward. When this madness is over, there is recompense. Aye, there is a recompense when the madness is over, surely? The lama muttered half to himself. They did not hang medals in those days on all who by accident had heard a gun fired. No, in nineteen pitched battles was I, in six and forty skirmishes of horse, and in small affairs without number. Nine wounds I bear, a medal, and four clasps, and the medal of an order for my captains, who are now generals, remembered me when the Kaiser I hind had accomplished fifty years of her reign. And all the land rejoiced, they said, to give him the order of British India. I carry it upon my neck now. I have also my jug here, my holding from the hands of the state, a free gift to me and mine. The men of the old days, they are now commissioners, come riding to me through the crops, high upon horses, so that all the village sees. And we talk out the old skirmishes, one dead man's name leading to another. And after, said the lama, oh, afterwards they go away, but not before my village is seen. And at the last, what wilt thou do? At the last, I shall die. And after? Let the gods order it. I have never pestered them with prayers. I do not think they will pester me. Look you, I have noticed in my long life that those who eternally break in upon those above with complaints and reports and bellowings and weepings are presently sent for in haste, as our colonel used to send for slack-jawed down-country men who talked too much. No, I have never wearied the gods. They will remember this, and give me a quiet place where I can drive my lance in the shade and wait to welcome my sons. I have no less than three Rizaldar majors all in the regiments, and they, likewise bound upon the wheel, go forth from life, to life, from despair to despair, said the lama below his breath, hot, uneasy, snatching. Aye, the old soldier chuckled, three Rizaldar, majors in three regiments, gamblers a little, but so am I. They must be well mounted, and one cannot take the horses, as in the old days one took women. Well, well, my holding can pay for all. How thinkest thou? It is a well-watered strip, but my men cheat me. I do not know how to ask, save at the lance's point. Uh, I grow angry, and I curse them, and they feign penitence, but behind my back I know they call me a toothless old ape. Hast thou never desired any other thing? Uh, yes, yes, a thousand times. A straight back, and a close clinging knee once more, a quick wrist and a keen eye, and the marrow that makes a man. Oh, the old days, the good days of my strength. That strength is weakness. It has turned so, but fifty years since I could have proved it otherwise. The old soldier retorted, driving his stirrup edge into the pony's lean flank. But I know a river of great healing. I have drank Gunga water to the edge of dropsy. All she gave me was a flux, and no sort of strength. It is not Gunga, the river that I know washes from all taint of sin. Ascending the far bank, one is assured of freedom. I do not know thy life, but thy face is the face of the honourable and courteous. Thou hast clung to thy way, rendering fidelity when it was hard to give, in that black year, of which I now remember other tales. Enter now upon the middle way, which is the path to freedom, hear the most excellent law, and do not follow dreams. Speak then, old man, the soldier smiled, half saluting. We be all babblers at our age. 
The llama squatted under the shade of a mango, whose shadow played checkerwise over his face. The soldier sat stiffly on the pony, and Kim, making sure that there were no snakes, lay down in the crotch of the twisted roots. There was a drowsy buzz of small life in hot sunshine, a cooing of doves, and a sleepy drone of well wheels across the fields. Slowly and impressively, the llama began. At the end of ten minutes, the old soldier slid from his pony to hear better, as he said, and sat with the reins around his wrist. The llama's voice faltered, the periods lengthened. Kim was busy watching a grey squirrel. When the little scolding bunch of fur close pressed to the branch disappeared, preacher and audience were fast asleep. The old officer's strong cut head pillowed on his arm. The llamas thrown back against the tree bowl, where it showed like yellow ivory. A naked child toddled up, stared, and, moved by some quick impulse of reverence, made a solemn little obeisance before the llama. Only the child was so short and fat that it toppled over sideways, and Kim laughed at the sprawling chubby legs. The child, scared and indignant, yelled aloud, uh, hi said the soldier, leaping to his feet. Oh, what is it? What orders? It is a, a child? I dreamed it was an alarm. Little one, little one, do not cry. Uh, have I slept? Uh, that was discourteous indeed. I fear I am afraid, roared the child. Uh, what is to fear? Two old men and a boy? How wilt thou ever make a soldier, princeling? The llama had waked too, but taking no direct notice of the child, clicked his rosary. Uh, "'What is that?' said the child, stopping a yell midway. "'I have never seen such things. Give them me!' "'Ah!' said the llama, smiling, and trailing a loop of it on the grass. "'This is a handful of cardamoms. This is a lump of ghee. This is millet and chilies and rice. A supper for thee and me!' The child shrieked with joy, and snatched at the dark, glancing beads. Oh, said the old soldier, whence hadst thou that song, despiser of this world? I learned it in Pathancot, sitting on a doorstep, said the llama shyly. It is good to be kind to babes. As I remember, before the sleep came on us, thou hadst told me that marriage and bearing were darkness of the true light, stumbling blocks upon the way. Do children drop from heaven in thy country? Is it the way to sing them songs? "'No man is all perfect,' said the llama gravely, recoiling the rosary. "'Run now to thy mother, little one.' "'Hear him,' said the soldier to Kim. "'He is ashamed for that he has made a child happy. "'There was a very good householder lost in thee, my brother. "'Aye, child.' "'He threw it a pice. "'Sweetmeats are always sweet.' "'And as the little figure capered away into the sunshine, "'they grow up and become men. "'Holy one, I grieve that I slept in the midst of thy preaching. "'Forgive me.' "'We be two old men,' said the llama. "'The fault is mine. "'I listened to thy talk of the world and its madness, "'and one fault led to the next.' "'Hear him! "'What harm do thy gods suffer from play with a babe? "'And that song was very well sung. "'Let us go on, and I will sing thee the song of Nikar Sain "'before Delhi, the old song.' "'And they fared out from the gloom of the mango tope the old man's high, shrill voice ringing across the field, as wail by long-drawn wail he unfolded the story of Nikal Sain, Nicholson, the song that men sing in the Punjab to this day. Kim was delighted, and the lama listened with deep interest. Ay, Nikal Sain is dead. He died before Delhi. Lances of the North take vengeance for Nikal Sain. He quavered it out to the end, marking the trills with the flat of his sword on the pony's rump. "'And now we come to the big road,' said he, after receiving the compliments of Kim, for the llama was markedly silent. "'It is long since I have ridden this way, but thy boy's talk stirred me. See, a holy one, the great road, which is the backbone of all Hind. For the most part it is shaded, as here, with four lines of trees, the middle road, all hard.' takes the quick traffic. In the days before rail carriages, the sahibs travelled up and down here in hundreds. Now there are only country carts and such like. 
Left and right is the rougher road for the heavy carts, grain and cotton and timber, fodder, lime and hides. A man goes in safety here, for at every few costs is a police station. The police are thieves and extortioners. I myself would patrol it with cavalry, young recruits under a strong captain. But at least they do not suffer any rivals. All castes and kinds of men move here. Look, Brahmins and chummers, bankers and tinkers, barbers and punyas, pilgrims and potters, all the world going and coming. It is to me as a river from which I am withdrawn like a log after a flood. And truly, the Grand Trunk Road is a wonderful spectacle. It runs straight, bearing without crowding India's traffic for 1,500 miles, such a river of life as nowhere else exists in the world. They looked at the green arched, shade-flecked length of it, the white breadth speckled with slow-pacing folk, and the two-roomed police station opposite. "'Who bears arms against the law?' a constable called out, laughingly, as he caught sight of the soldier's sword. "'Are not the police enough to destroy evildoers?' "'It was because of the police I bought it,' was the answer. "'Does all go well in Hind?' "'Rissuda Sahib, all goes well.' "'I am like an old tortoise, look you, who puts his head out from the bank and draws it in again. "'Aye, this is the road of Hindustan. All men come by this way.' "'Son of a swine, is this a part of the road meant for thee to scratch thy back upon? "'A father of all the daughters of shame and husband of ten thousand virtuous ones.' Thy mother was devoted to a devil, being led thereto by her mother. Thy aunts have never had a nose for seven generations. Thy sister, what owl's folly told thee to draw thy cart across the road? A broken wheel? Then take a broken head, and put the two together at leisure. The voice and a venomous whip-cracking came out of a pillar of dust, fifty yards away, where a cart had broken down. A thin, High, Kathiawa mare, with eyes and nostrils aflame, rocketed out of the jam, snorting and wincing, as her rider bent her across the road in chase of a shouting man. He was tall and grey-bearded, sitting the almost mad beast as a piece of her, and scientifically lashing his victim between plunges. The old man's face lit with pride. "'My child!' said he briefly, and strove to rein the pony's neck to a fitting arch. "'Am I to be beaten before the police?' cried the carter. "'Justice! I will have justice!' "'Am I to be blocked by a shouting ape who upsets ten thousand sacks under a young horse's nose? "'That is the way to ruin a mare.' "'He speaks the truth. He speaks the truth. "'But she follows her man close,' said the old man. "'The carter ran under the wheels of his cart, and thence threatened all sorts of vengeance. "'They are strong men, thy sons,' said the policeman serenely, picking his teeth. The horseman delivered one last vicious cut with his whip, and came on at a canter. "'My father!' He reined back ten yards, and dismounted. The old man was off his pony in an instant, and they embraced, as do father and son, in the east. Chapter 4 Good luck! She is never a lady— but the cursedest queen alive, Trixie, wincing and jady, Kittle to lead or drive. Greet her, she's hailing a stranger. Meet her, she's busking to leave. Let her alone, for a shrew to the bone, And the hussy cubs plucking your sleeve. Large S, large S, oh fortune, Give or hold at your will. If I've no care for fortune, fortune must follow me still. The Wishing Caps Then, lowering their voices, they spoke together. Kim came to rest under a tree, but the llama tucked impatiently at his elbow. Let us go on. The river is not here. Hi, my, have we not walked enough for a little? Our river will not run away. Patience, and he will give us a dole. This, said the old soldier suddenly, is the friend of the stars. He brought me the news yesterday, having seen the very man himself, in a vision, giving orders for the war. Hmm, said his son, all deep in his broad chest. He came by a bizarre rumour and made profit of it. His father laughed. 
At least he did not write to me begging for a new charger, and the gods know how many rupees. Are thy brother's regiments also under orders? I do not know. I take leave, and come swiftly to thee in case. In case they ran before thee to beg, all oh, gamblers and spendthrifts all. But thou hast never yet ridden in a charge. A good horse is needed there, truly. A good follower, and a good pony also for the marching. Let us see. Let us see. He thrummed on the pommel. There is no place to cast accounts in, my father. Let us go to thy house. At least pay the boy, then. I have no pice with me, and he brought auspicious news. Oh, friend of the world, a war is toward as thou hast said. Nay, as I know, the war, returned Kim composedly. Eh? said the lama, fingering his beads, all eager for the road. My master does not trouble the stars for hire. We brought the news bear witness. We brought the news. And now we go. Kim half crooked his hand at his side. The sun tossed a silver coin through the sunlight, grumbling something about beggars and jugglers. It was a four and a piece, and would feed them well for days. The lama, seeing the flash of the metal, droned a blessing. "'Go thy way, friend of the world,' piped the old soldier, wheeling his scrawny mount. "'For once in all my days I have met a true prophet who was not in the army.' Father and son swung round together, the old man sitting as erect as the younger. A Punjabi constable in yellow linen trousers slouched across the road. He had seen the money pass. "'Halt!' he said in impressive English. "'Know ye not that there is a tuckers of two annas ahead, which is four annas?' On those who enter the road from this side road, it is the order of the circa, and the money is spent for the planting of trees and the beautification of all the ways. And the bellies of the police, said Kim, slipping out of the arm's reach. Consider for a while, man, with a mud head. Think you we came from the nearest pond like a frog? Thy father-in-law hast thou ever heard the name of thy brother? And who was he? Leave the boy alone, cried a senior constable, immensely delighted as he squatted down to smoke his pipe in the veranda. He took a label from a bottle of Bellaty Pani, soda water, and, fixing it to a bridge, collected taxes for a month from those who passed, saying that it was the circus order. Then came an Englishman and broke his head. Ah, brother, I am a town crow, not a village crow. The policeman drew back abashed, and Kim hooted at him all down the road. Was there ever such a disciple as I? he cried merrily to the lama. All earth would have picked thy bones within ten miles of Lahore City, if I had not guarded thee. I consider in my own mind whether thou art a spirit, sometimes, or sometimes an evil imp, said the lama, smiling slowly. I am thy cella, Kib dropped into step at his side, that indescribable gait of the long-distance tramp, all the world over. Now let us walk, muttered the lama, and to the click of his rosary they walked in silence, mile upon mile. The lama, as usual, was deep in meditation, but Kim's bright eyes were open wide. This broad, smiling river of life, he considered, was a vast improvement on the cramped and crowded Lahore streets. There were new people and new sights at every stride, castes he knew and castes that were altogether out of his experience. They met a troop of long-haired, strong-scented sansies with baskets of lizards and other unclean foods on their backs, their lean dogs sniffing at their heels. These people kept their own side of the road, moving at a quick, furtive jog-trot, and all other castes gave them ample room, for the sansi is deep pollution. Behind them, walking wide and stiffly across the strong shadows, the memory of his leg irons still on him, strode one, newly released from the jail, his full stomach and shiny skin to prove that the government fed its prisoners better than most honest men could feed themselves. Kim knew that walk well, and made broad jest of it as they passed. Then an Akali, a wild-eyed, wild-haired Sikh devotee in the blue-checked clothes of his faith, with polished steel coits glistening on the cone of his tall blue turban, stalked past, returning from a visit to one of the independent Sikh states, where he had been singing the ancient glories of the Khalsa, to college-trained princelings in top boots and white cord breeches. Kim was careful not to irritate that man, for the Akali's temper is short and his arm quick. Here and there, 
they were met or were overtaken by the gaily dressed crowds of whole villages turning out to some local fair, the women with their babes on their hips walking behind the men, the older boys prancing on sticks of sugar cane, dragging rude brass models of locomotives such as they sell for a half penny, or flashing the sun into the eyes of their betters from cheap toy mirrors. One could see at a glance what each had bought. And if there were any doubt, it needed only to watch the wives comparing brown arm against brown arm, the newly purchased dull glass bracelets that came from the northwest. These merrymakers stepped slowly, calling one to the other and stopping to haggle with sweetmeat sellers, or to make a prayer before one of the wayside shrines, sometimes Hindu, sometimes Muslim, which the low caste of both creeds share with beautiful impartiality. A solid line of blue, rising and falling like the back of a caterpillar in haste, would swing up through the quivering dust and trot past to a chorus of quick cackling. That was a gang of changers, the women who have taken all the embankments of all the northern railways under their charge. A flat-footed, big-bosomed, strong-limbed, blue-petticoated clan of earth carriers, hurrying north on news of a job and wasting no time by the road. They belonged to the caste whose men do not count, and they walked with squared elbows, swinging hips and heads on high, as suits women who carry heavy weights. A little later, a marriage procession would strike into the grand trunk with music and shoutings, and a smell of marigold and jasmine stronger than even the reek of the dust. One could see the bride's litter, a blur of red and tinsel, staggering through the haze, while the bridegroom's bereaved pony turned aside to snatch a mouthful from a passing fodder cart. Then Kim would join the Kentish fire of good wishes and bad jokes, wishing the couple a hundred sons and no daughters, as the saying is. Still more interesting and more to be shouted over, it was when a strolling juggler with some half-trained monkeys or a painting, a feeble bear, or a woman who tied goat's horns to her feet, and with these danced on a slack rope, set the horses to shying, and the women to shrill, long-drawn quavers of amazement. The llama never raised his eyes. He did not note the moneylender on his goose-rumped pony, hastening along to collect the cruel interest, or the long-shouting, deep-voiced little mob, still in military formation of native soldiers on leave, rejoicing to be rid of their breeches and putties, and saying the most outrageous things to the most respectable women in sight. Even the seller of Ganges water he did not see, and Kim expected that he would at least buy a bottle of that precious stuff. He looked steadily at the ground, and strode as steadily, hour after hour, his soul busied elsewhere. But Kim was in the seventh heaven of joy. The grand trunk at this point was built on an embankment to guard against winter floods from the foothills, so that one walked, as it were, a little above the country, along a stately corridor, seeing all India spread out to left and right. It was beautiful to behold, the many yoked grain and cottage wagons crawling over the country roads. One could hear their axles complaining a mile away coming nearer, till, with shouts and yells and bad words, they climbed up the steep incline and plunged on to the hard main road. Carter reviling Carter. It was equally beautiful to watch the people, little clumps of red and blue and pink and white and saffron, turning aside to go to their own villages, dispersing and growing small by twos and threes across the level plain. Kim felt these things, though he could not give tongue to his feelings, and so contented himself with buying peeled sugar cane and spitting the pith generously about his path. From time to time the llama took snuff, and at last Kim could endure the silence no longer. "'This is a good land, the land of the south,' said he. "'The air is good, the water is good, eh?' "'And they are all bound upon the wheel,' said the llama." bound from life after life. To none of these has the way been shown. He shook himself back to this world. 
And now we have walked a weary way, said Kim. Surely we shall soon come to a pario, a resting place. Shall we stay there? Look, the sun is sloping. Who will receive us this evening? That is all one. This country is full of good folk. Besides, he sunk his voice beneath a whisper, we have money. The crowd thickened as they neared the resting place which marked the end of their day's journey. A line of stalls selling very simple food and tobacco, a stack of firewood, a police station, a well, a horse trough, a few trees, and under them some trampled ground dotted with the black ashes of old fires, are all that mark a pareo on the grand trunk, if you accept the beggars and the crows, both hungry. By this time, the sun was driving broad golden spokes through the lower branches of the mango trees. The parakeets and doves were coming home in their hundreds. The chattering, grey-backed seven sisters, talking over the day's adventures, walked back and forth in twos and threes, almost under the feet of the travellers, and shufflings and scufflings in the branches showed that the bats were ready to go out on the night picket. Swiftly the light gathered itself together, painted for an instant the faces and the cartwheels and the bullock's horns as red as blood. Then the night fell, changing the touch of the air, drawing a low, even haze, like a gossamer veil of blue across the face of the country, and bringing out keen and distinct the smell of wood smoke and cattle and the good scent of wheaten cakes cooked on ashes. The evening patrol hurried out of the police station with important coughings and reiterated orders, and a live charcoal ball in the cup of a wayside carter's hooker glowed red, while Kim's eye mechanically watched the last flicker of the sun on the brass tweezers. The life of the Pareo was very like that of the Kashmir Siray, on a small scale. Kim dived into the happy Asiatic disorder which, if you only allow time, will bring you everything that a simple man needs. His wants were few, because, since the Lama had no caste scruples, cooked food from the nearest stall would serve. But, for luxury's sake, Kim bought a handful of dung cakes to build a fire. All about, coming and going round the little flames, men cried for oil or grain or sweetmeats, or tobacco, jostling one another while they waited their turn at the well, and under the men's voices you heard from halted, shuttered carts the high squeals and giggles of women whose faces should not be seen in public. Nowadays, well-educated natives are of opinion that when their womenfolk travel, and they visit a good deal, it is better to take them quickly by rail in a properly screened compartment, and that custom is spreading but there are always those of the old rock who hold by the use of their forefathers, and, above all, there are always the old women, more conservative than the men, who toward the end of their days go on a pilgrimage. They, being withered and undesirable, do not, under certain circumstances, object to unveiling. After their long seclusion, during which they have always been in business touch with a thousand outside interests, they love the bustle and stir of the open road, the gatherings at the shrines, and the infinite possibilities of gossip with like-minded dowagers. Very often it suits a long-suffering family that a strong-tongued, iron-willed old lady should disport herself about India in this fashion. For certainly, pilgrimage is grateful to the gods. So... All about India, in the most remote places, as in the most public, you find some knot of grizzled servitors in nominal charge of an old lady who is more or less curtained and hid away in a bullock cart. Such men are staid and discreet, and when a European or high caste native is near, will net their charge with most elaborate precautions. But in the ordinary haphazard chances of pilgrimage, the precautions are not taken. The old lady is, after all, intensely human, and lives to look upon life. Kim marked down a gaily ornamented Ruth, or family bullock cart, with a broidered canopy of two domes, like a double-humped camel, which had just been drawn into the par. Eight men made its retinue, and two of the eight were armed with rusty sabres, sure signs that they followed a person of distinction, for 
the common folk do not bear arms. An increasing cackle of complaints, orders and jests, and what too a European would have been bad language, came from behind the curtains. Here was evidently a woman used to command. Kim looked over the retinue critically. Half of them were thin-legged, grey-bearded Uriahs from down country, and the other half were duffel-clad, felt-hatted hillmen of the north, and that mixture told its own tale, even if he had not overheard the incessant sparring between the two divisions. The old lady was going south on a visit, probably to a rich relative, most probably to a son-in-law who had sent up an escort as a mark of respect. The hillmen would be of her own people, a Kulu or Kangra folk. It was quite clear that she was not taking her daughter down to be wedded, or the curtains would have been laced home and the guard would have allowed no one near the car. A merry and a high-spirited dame, thought Kim, balancing the dung cake in one hand, the cooked food in the other, and piloting the llama with a nudging shoulder. Something might be made out of the meeting. The llama would give him no help, but as a conscientious cheller, Kim was delighted to beg for two. He built his fire as close to the cart as he dared, waiting for one of the escort to order him away. The llama dropped wearily to the ground, much as a heavy fruit-eating bat cowers, and returned to his rosary. "'Stand farther off, beggar!' the order was shouted in broken Hindustani by one of the hillmen. "'Ah, uh, it's only Pahari, a hillman,' said Kim over his shoulder, "'since when have the hill asked his owned all Hindustan?' The retort was a swift and brilliant sketch of Kim's pedigree for three generations. "'Ah, Kim's voice was sweeter than ever as he broke the dung cake into fit pieces. "'In my country we call that the beginning of love talk.' A harsh, thin cackle behind the curtains put the hillman on his mettle for a second shot. "'Not so bad, not so bad,' said Kim with calm. "'But have a care, my brother, lest we, we, I say, be minded to give a curse or so in return, and our curses have the knack of biting home.' The Uriahs laughed. The hillman sprang forward threateningly. The llama suddenly raised his head, bringing his huge tam shanta hat into the full light of Kim's new-started fire. "'What is it?' said he. The man halted as though struck to stone. "'I, I, I, I am saved from a great sin,' he stammered. "'The foreigner has found him a priest at last,' whispered one of the Uriahs. "'Aye, why is that beggar brat not well beaten?' the old woman cried. The hillman drew back to the cart and whispered something to the curtain. There was dead silence, then a muttering. This goes well, thought Kim, pretending neither to see nor hear. When when he has eaten, the hillman fawned on Kim, it, it is requested that the Holy One will do the honour to talk to one who would speak to him. After he is eaten, he will sleep, Kim returned loftily. He could not quite see what new turn the game had taken, but stood resolute to profit by it. Now I will get him his food. The last sentence spoken loudly ended with a sigh as of faintness. I, I myself and the others of my people will look to that, if it is permitted. It is permitted, said Kim, more loftily than ever. Holy One, these people will bring us food. The land is good. All the country of the south is good. A great and terrible world, mumbled the llama drowsily. "'Let him sleep,' said Kim. "'But look to it that we are well fed when he wakes. "'He is a very holy man.' "'Again, one of the Uriahs said something contemptuously. "'He is not a faker. "'He is a down-country beggar,' Kim went on, "'severely addressing the stars. "'He is the most holy of holy men. "'He is above all castes. "'I am his cheller. "'Come here,' said the flat, thin voice behind the curtain. And Kim came, conscious that eyes he could not see were staring at him. One skinny brown finger, heavy with rings, lay on the edge of the cart, and the talk went this way. "'Who is that one? An exceedingly holy one. He comes from far off. He comes from Tibet.' "'Where in Tibet?' "'From behind the snows, from a very far place. He knows the stars. He makes horoscopes. He reads nativities. But he does not do this for money.' He does it for kindness and great charity. I am his disciple. 
I am called also the friend of the stars. Thou art no hillman. Ask him. He will tell thee. I was sent to him from the stars to show him an end to his pilgrimage. Hmm. Consider, Pratt, that I am an old woman and not altogether a fool. Lamas I know, and to these I give reverence, but thou art no more than a lawful cheller than this. My finger is the pole of this wagon. Thou art a castless Hindu, a bold and unblushing beggar, attached belike to the Holy One for the sake of gain. Do we not all work for gain? Kim changed his own promptly to match that altered voice. I have heard. This was a bow drawn at a venture. I have heard. What hast thou heard? She snapped, rapping with the finger. Nothing that I well remember but some talk in the bazaars, which is doubtless a lie, that even Rogers, a small hill, Rogers, but none the less of good Rajput blood, assuredly of good blood, uh, that these even sell the more comely of their women folk for gain. Uh, down south they sell them to Zaminders and such, all of oot. If there can be one thing in the world that the small hill Rogers deny, it is just this charge. But it happens to be one thing that the bazaars believe when they discuss the mysterious slave traffics of India. The old lady explained to Kim in a tense, indignant whisper precisely what manner and fashion of malignant liar he was. Had Kim hinted this when she was a girl, he would have been pommeled to death that same evening by an elephant. This was perfectly true. I am only the beggar's brat, uh, as the eye of beauty has said, he wailed in extravagant terror. Eye of beauty, forsooth, who am I that thou shouldst fling beggar endearments at me? And yet she laughed at the long-forgotten word. Forty years ago that might have been said, and not without truth. Ay, thirty years ago, but it is the fault of this getting up and down hind that a king's widow must jostle all the scum of the land and be made a mock by beggars. A great queen said Kim promptly, for he heard her shaking with indignation. I am even what the great queen says I am, but nonetheless is my master holy. He has not heard the great queen's order that, order, I order a holy one, a teacher of the law, to come and speak to a woman? Never. A pity my stupidity. I thought I was given as an order. It was not. It was a petition. Does this make all clear? A silver coin clicked on the edge of the cart. Kim took it and salaamed profoundly. The old lady recognised that, as the eyes and the ears of the lama, he was to be propitiated. I am but the Holy One's disciple. When he has eaten, perhaps he will come. Oh, villain and shameless rogue! The jewelled forefinger shook itself at him reprovingly, but he could hear the old lady's chuckle. Nay, what is it? he said, dropping into his most caressed and confidential tone the one he well knew that few could resist. Is is there any need of a son in thy family? Speak freely, for we priests. That last was a direct plagiarism from a faker by the Taxali gate. We priests, thou art not yet old enough to... She checked the joke with another laugh. Believe me, now and again, we women, O priests, think of other matters than sons. Moreover, my daughter has borne her mind child. Two arrows in the quiver are better than one, and three are better still. <coughs> Kim quoted the proverb with a meditative cough, looking discreetly earthward. Uh, true, oh, true, uh, but perhaps that will come. Uh, certainly, these down country Brahmins are utterly useless. I sent gifts and monies and gifts again to them, and they prophesied. Ah, drawled Kim with infinite contempt, they prophesied. A professional could have done no better. And it was not till I remembered my own gods that my prayers were heard. I chose an auspicious hour, and perhaps thy holy one has heard of the abbot of the Lung Cho Lamassery. It was to him I put the matter, and behold, in the due time all came about as I desired. The Brahmin in the house of the father of my daughter's son has since said that it was through his prayers, which is a little error that I will explain to him when we reach our journey's end. And so afterward I go to Budgaya to make Shraddha for the father of my children. Thither go we. Doubly auspicious, chirruped the old lady. A second son, at least. Oh, friend of all the world. The lama had waked, and simply as a child bewildered in a strange bed, called for Kim. I come, I come, holy one. He dashed to the fire, where he found the lama already surrounded by dishes of food. 
the hillmen visibly adoring him and the southerners looking sourly. Uh, "'Go back. Withdraw!' Kim cried. "'Do we eat publicly like dogs?' They finished the meal in silence, each turned a little from the other, and Kim topped it with a native-made cigarette. "'Have I not said a hundred times that the South is a good land? Here is a virtuous and high-born widow of a hill Raja on pilgrimage, as she says to Buddha Gay. She it is, sends us these dishes, and when thou art well tested, she would speak to thee. "'Is this also thy work?' the lama dipped deep into his snuff-gourd. "'Who else watched over thee since our wonderful journey began?' Kim's eyes danced in his head as he blew the rank smoke through his nostrils and stretched him on the dusty ground. "'Have I failed to oversee thy comforts, holy one?' "'A blessing on thee,' the lama inclined his solemn head. "'I have known many men in my so long life, and disciples not a few. But to none among men, if so be thou art woman-born, has my heart gone out as it has to thee, thoughtful, wise, and courteous.' "'But something of a small imp.' "'And I have never seen such a priest as thou,' Kim considered the benevolent yellow face wrinkle by wrinkle. "'It is less than three days since we took the road together, and it is as though it were a hundred years. "'Perhaps in a former life it was permitted that I should have rendered thee some service, maybe,' he smiled. "'I freed thee from a trap, or having caught thee on a hook in the days when I was not enlightened, cast thee back into the river. Maybe, said Kim quietly. He had heard this sort of speculation again and again from the mouths of many whom the English would not consider imaginative. Now, as regards that woman in the bullock cart, I think she needs a second son for her daughter. That is no part of the way, sighed the lama. But at least she is from the hills. Ah, the hills, and the snow of the hills. He rose and stalked to the cart. Kim would have given his ears to come too, but the lama did not invite him, and the few words he caught were in an unknown tongue, for they spoke some common speech of the mountains. The woman seemed to ask questions which the lama turned over in his mind before answering. Now and again he heard the sing-song cadence of a Chinese quotation. It was a strange picture that Kim watched between drooped eyelids. The lama, very straight and erect, the deep folds of his yellow clothing slashed with black in the light of the Pareo fires, precisely as a knotted tree trunk is slashed with the shadows of the low sun, addressed a tinsel and lacquered roof which burned like a many-coloured jewel in the same uncertain light. The patterns on the gold-worked curtains ran up and down, melting and reforming as the folds shook and quivered to the night wind, and when the talk grew more earnest, the jewelled forefinger snapped out little sparks of light between the embroideries. Behind the cart was a wall of uncertain darkness, speckled with little flames and alive with half-caught forms and faces and shadows. The voices of early evening had settled down to one soothing hum, whose deepest note was the steady chumping of the bullocks above their chopped straw, and whose highest was the tinkle of a Bengali dancing girl's sitar. Most men had eaten, and pulled deep at their gurgling, grunting hookahs, which in full blast sound like bullfrogs. At last the lama returned. A hillman walked behind him with a wadded cotton quilt, and spread it carefully by the fire. She deserves ten thousand grandchildren, thought Kim. None the less, but for me, these gifts would not have come. A virtuous woman, and a wise one, the lama slackened off, joint by joint, like a slow camel. The world is full of charity to those who follow the way. He flung a fair half of the quilt over Kim. And what said she? Kim rolled up in his share of it. She asked me many questions, and propounded many problems, the most of which were idle tales which she had heard from devil-serving priests who pretend to follow the way. Some I answered, and some I said were foolish. Many wear the robe, but few keep the way. True, that is true. Kim used the thoughtful, conciliatory tone of those who wish to draw confidences. But by her lights, she is most right-minded. She desires greatly that we should go with her to Bodgaya. 
her road being ours, as I understand, for many days' journey to the southward. And, patience a little, uh, to this I said, that my search came before all things. She had heard many foolish legends, but this great truth of my river she had never heard. Such are the priests of the lower hills. She knew the abbot of Langchow, but she did not know of my river, nor the tale of the arrow. And... I spoke, therefore, of the search, and the way, and of matters that were profitable, she desiring only that I should accompany her and make prayer for a second son. Aha! We women do not think of anything, save children, said Kim sleepily. Now, since our roads run together for a while, I do not see that we in any way depart from our search, so if be, we accompany her. "'at least as far as I have forgotten the name of the city.' "'Oh,' said Kim, turning and speaking in a sharp whisper "'to one of the Uriahs a few yards away. Uh, "'Where is your master's house?' "'A little behind Sahuranpur, among the fruit gardens,' he named the village. "'That was the place,' said the Lama. "'So far, at least, we can go with her.' "'Flies go to Carrion,' said the Uriah in an abstracted voice. For the sick cow, a crow. For the sick man, a Brahmin. Kim breathed the proverb impersonally to the shadow tops of the trees overhead. The Uriah grunted and held his peace. So then, we go with her holy one? Is there any reason against? I can still step aside and try all the rivers that the road overpasses. She desires that I should come. She very greatly desires it. Kim stifled a laugh in the quilt. When once that imperious old lady had recovered from her natural awe of a llama, he thought it probable that she would be worth listening to. He was nearly asleep when the llama suddenly quoted a proverb. The husbands of the talkative have a great reward hereafter. Then Kim heard him snuff thrice and doze off, still laughing. The diamond-bright dawn woke men and crows and bullocks together. Kim sat up and yawned, shook himself and thrilled with delight. This was seeing the world in real truth. This was life as he would have it, bustling and shouting, the buckling of belts and beating of bullocks and creaking of wheels, lighting of fires and cooking of food and new sights at every turn of the approving eye. The morning mist swept off in a whirl of silver. The parrots shot away to some distant river in shrieking green hosts. All the well-wheels within earshot went to work. India was awake, and Kim was in the middle of it, more awake and more excited than anyone, chewing on a twig that he would presently use as a toothbrush, for he borrowed right and left-handedly from all the customs of the country he knew and loved. There was no need to worry about food, no need to spend a cowrie at the crowded stalls. He was the disciple of a holy man, annexed by a strong-willed old lady. All things would be prepared for them, and when they were respectfully invited so to do, they would sit and eat. For the rest, Kim giggled here as he cleaned his teeth. His hostess would rather heighten the enjoyment of the road. He inspected her bullocks critically, as they came up grunting and blowing under the yokes. If they went too fast, it was not likely, there would be a pleasant seat for himself along the pole. The llama would sit beside the driver. The escort, of course, would walk. The old lady, equally, of course, would talk a great deal, and by what he had heard that conversation would not lack salt. She was already ordering, haranguing, rebuking, and, it must be said, cursing her servants for delays. "'Get her her pipe, in the name of the gods, get her her pipe, and stop her ill-omened mouth!' cried Anuria, tying up his shapeless bundles of bedding. "'She and the parrots are alike, they screech in the dawn. The leap bullocks, hi, look to the leap bullocks!' They were backing and wheeling as a grain cart's axle caught them by the horns. Son of an owl, where dost thou go? This to the grinning carter. Ay, 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 that within there is the Queen of Delhi going to pray for a son, the man called back over his high load. Room for the Queen of Delhi and her Prime Minister, the grey monkey climbing up his own sword. 
Another cart loaded with bark for a down-country tannery followed close behind, and its driver added a few compliments as the Ruth Bullocks backed and backed again. From behind the shaking curtains came one volley of invective. It did not last long, but in kind and quality, in blistering, biting appropriateness, it was beyond anything that even Kim had heard. He could see the carter's bare chest collapse with amazement as the man salaamed reverently to the voice, leapt from the pole and helped the escort haul their volcano onto the main road. Here the voice told him truthfully what sort of wife he had wedded and what she was doing in his absence. "'Oh, so bash, murmured Kim, unable to contain himself as the man slunk away. "'Well done, indeed. It is a shame and a scandal that a poor woman may not go to make prayer to her gods, except she be jostled and insulted by all the refuse of Hindustan, that she must eat gali as men eat ghee. But I have yet a wag left in my tongue, a word or two well spoken that serves the occasion, and still I am without my tobacco. Who is the one-eyed and luckless son of shame that has not yet prepared my pipe?' It was hastily thrust in by a hillman, and a trickle of thick smoke from each corner of the curtains showed that peace was restored. If Kim had walked proudly the day before, disciple of a holy man, and today he paced with tenfold pride in the train of a semi-royal procession, with a recognised place under the patronage of an old lady of charming manners and infinite resource. The escort, their heads tied up native fashion, fell in on either side of the cart, shuffling enormous clouds of dust. The Lama and Kim walked a little to one side, Kim chewing his stick of sugar cane and making way for no one under the status of a priest. They could hear the old lady's tongue clack as steadily as a rice husker. She bade the escort tell her what was going on on the road and so soon as they were clear of the pareo she flung back the curtains and peered out her veil a third across her face her men did not eye her directly when she addressed them and thus the proprieties were more or less observed a dark sallowish district superintendent of police faultlessly uniformed an englishman trotted by on a tired horse and seeing from her retinue what manner of persons she was chafed her "'Oh, mother!' he cried. "'Do they do this in the Zinanas? "'Suppose an Englishman came by and saw that thou hast no nose.' "'What?' she shrilled back. "'Thine own mother has no nose? "'Why say so, then, on the open road?' "'It was a fair counter. "'The Englishman threw up his hand with the gesture of a man hit at swordplay. "'She laughed and nodded. "'Is this a face to tempt virtue aside?' "'She withdrew all her veil and stared at him.' It was by no means lovely, but as the man gathered up his reins, he called it a moon of paradise, a disturber of integrity, and a few other fantastic epithets which doubled her up with mirth. "'That is a nutcut, you rogue,' she said. "'All police constables are nutcuts, but the police wallers are the worst. Hi, my son, thou hast never learned all that since thou camest from Belait in Europe. Who suckled thee?' A parine, a hillwoman of Dalhousie, my mother. Keep thy beauty under a shade, O dispenser of delights. And he was gone. These be the sort... She took a fine judicial tone and stuffed her mouth with pan. These be the sort to oversee justice. They know the land and the customs of the land. The others, all new from Europe, suckled by white women, and learning our tongues from books, are worse than the pestilence. They do harm to kings. Then she told a long, long tale to the world at large of an ignorant young policeman who had disturbed some small hill Raja, a ninth cousin of her own, in the manner of a trivial land case, winding up with a quotation from a work by no means devotional. Then her mood changed, and she bade one of the escort ask whether the Lama would walk alongside and discuss matters of religion. So Kim dropped back into the dust and returned to his sugar cane. For an hour or more, the Lama's Tamashanta showed like a moon through the haze, and from all he heard, Kim gathered that the old woman wept. One of the Uriahs half apologised for his rudeness overnight, saying that he had never known his mistress of so bland a temper, and he ascribed it to the presence of the strange priest. 
Personally, he believed in Brahmins, though, like all natives, he was acutely aware of their cunning and their greed. Still, when Brahmins but irritated with begging demands, the mother of his master's wife, and when she sent them away so angry that they cursed the whole retinue, which was the real reason of the second offside bullock going lame and of the pole breaking the night before, he was prepared to accept any priest of any other denomination in or out of India. To this came assented with wise nods, and bade the Urea observe that the Lama took no money, and that the cost of his and Kim's food would be repaid a hundred times in the good luck that would attend the caravan henceforward. He also told stories of Lahore City, and sang a song or two, which made the escort laugh. As a town mouse well acquainted with the latest songs by the most fashionable composers, they are women for the most part. Kim had a distinct advantage over men from a little fruit village behind Saharanpur, but he let that advantage be inferred. At noon they turned aside to eat, and the meal was good, plentiful, and well served on plates of clean leaves. In decency, out of drift of the dust, they gave the scraps to certain beggars, that all requirements might be fulfilled, and sat down to a long, luxurious smoke. The old lady had retreated behind her curtains, but mixed most freely in the talk. Her servants arguing with and contradicting her as servants do throughout the East. She compared the cool and the pines of the Kangra and Kulu hills with the dust and the mangoes of the south. She told a tale of some old local gods at the edge of her husband's territory. She roundly abused the tobacco, which she was then smoking, reviled all Brahmins, and speculated without reserve on the coming of many grandsons. Chapter 5 here come I to my own again, fed, forgiven, and known again, claimed by bone of my bone again, and sib to flesh of my flesh. The fatted calf is dressed for me, but the husks have greater zest for me. I think my pigs will be best for me, so I'm off to the styes afresh. The Prodigal Son. Once more the lazy, string-tied, shuffling procession got under way, and she slept till they reached the next halting stage. It was a very short march, and time lacked an hour to sundown, so Kim cast about for means of amusement. But why not sit and rest? said one of the escort. Only the devils and the English walk to and fro without reason. "'Never make friends with a devil, a monkey or a boy, and no man knows what they will do next,' said his fellow. Kim turned a scornful back. He did not want to hear the old story how the devil played with the boys and repented of it and walked idly across country. The llama strode after him. All that day, whenever they passed a stream, he had turned aside to look at it, but in no case had he received any warning that he had found his river.' Insensibly, too, the comfort of speaking to someone in a reasonable tongue, and of being properly considered and respected as her spiritual adviser by a well-born woman, had weaned his thoughts a little from the search, and further he was prepared to spend serene years in his quest, having nothing of the white man's impatience, but a great faith. "'Where goest thou?' he called after Kim. "'No whither. It was a small march, and all this, Kim waved his hands abroad, is new to me. She is beyond question a wise and a discerning woman, but it is hard to meditate when all women are thus, Kim spoke, as might have Solomon. Before the lamasery was a broad platform, the lama muttered, looping up the well-worn rosary, of stone. On that I have left the marks of my feet, pacing to and fro with these. He clicked the beats and began the Om Mane Padme Hums of his devotion, grateful for the cool, the quiet, and the absence of dust. One thing after another drew Kim's idle eye across the plain. 
There was no purpose in his wanderings, except that the build of the huts nearby seemed new, and he wished to investigate. They came out on a broad tract of grazing ground, brown and purple in the afternoon light, with a heavy clump of mangoes in the centre. It struck Kim as curious that no shrine stood in so eligible a spot. The boy was observing as any priest for these things. Far across the plain walked side by side four men, made small by the distance. He looked intently under his curved palms and caught the sheen of brass. Soldiers, white soldiers, said he. Let us see. It is always soldiers when thou and I go out alone together, but I have never seen the white soldiers. They do no harm, except when they're drunk. Keep behind this tree. They stepped behind the thick trunks in the cool dark of the mango tope. Two little figures halted. The other two came forward uncertainly. They were the advance party of a regiment on the march, sent out, as usual, to mark the camp. They bore five-foot sticks with fluttering flags and called to each other as they spread over the flat earth. At last they entered the mango grove, walking heavily. "'It's here, or hereabouts. Officer tents under the trees, I take it, and the rest of us can stay outside. Uh, have they marked out for the baggage wagons behind?' They cried again to their comrades in the distance, and the rough answer came back faint and mellowed. "'Shuff the flag in here, then,' said one. "'What do they prepare?' said the lama, wonderstruck. "'This is a great and terrible world. "'What is the device on the flag?' "'A soldier thrust a stave within a few feet of them, "'grunted discontentedly, pulled it up again, "'conferred with his companion who looked up and down "'the shaded cave of greenery, and returned it. "'Kim stared with all his eyes, "'his breath coming short and sharp between his teeth. "'The soldiers stamped off into the sunshine.' "'Oh, holy one!' he gasped. "'My horoscope! "'The drawing in the dust by the priest of Ambala. "'Remember what he said? First, come to Farash's to make all things ready, "'in a dark place, as it is always at the beginning of a vision. "'But this is not a vision,' said the lama. "'It is the world's illusion, and no more. "'And after them comes the bull, the red bull on the green field. "'Look, it is he!' He pointed to the flag that was snap, snapping in the evening breeze not ten feet away. It was no more than an ordinary camp marking flag, but the regiment, always punctilious in matters of millinery, had charged it with the regimental device, the Red Bull, which is the crest of the Mavericks, the great Red Bull on a background of Irish green. "'I see, and now I remember,' said the Lama. "'Certainly it is thy bull. Certainly also the two men.' came to make already they are soldiers white soldiers what said the priest the sign over against the bull is the sign of war and armed men a holy one this thing touches my search true it is true the lama stared fixedly at the device that flamed like a ruby in the dusk thy priest and ambala said that thine was the sign of war what is to do now wait let us wait "'Even now the darkness clears,' said Kim. "'It was only natural that the descending sun "'should at last strike through the tree trunks across the grove, "'filling it with mealy gold light for a few minutes. "'But to Kim it was the crown of the Umbala Brahmin's prophecy. "'Hark!' said the Lama. "'One beats a drum. Far off.' "'At first the sound, carrying diluted through the still air, "'resembled the beating of an artery in the head. "'Soon a sharpness was added.' "'Ah, the music,' Kim explained. "'He knew the sound of a regimental band, but it amazed the lama. "'At the far end of the plain a heavy, dusty column crawled in sight. "'Then the wind brought the tune. "'We crave your condescension to tell you what we know "'of marching in the mulligan guards to Sligo Port below.' "'Here broke in the shrill-tongued fifes. We shouldered arms, we marched, we marched away. From Phoenix Park we marched to Dublin Bay. The drums and the fifes, oh sweetly they did play, as we marched, marched, marched with the Mulligan Guards. It was the band of the Mavericks playing the regiment to camp, for the men were route marching with their baggage. The rippling column swung into the level, 
carts behind it, divided, left and right, ran about like an anthill. And, but this is sorcery, said the llama. The plain dotted itself with tents that seemed to rise, all spread from the carts. Another rush of men invaded the grove, pitched a huge tent in silence, ran up yet eight or nine more by the side of it unearthed cooking pots, pans and bundles, which were taken possession of by a crowd of native servants. And behold, the mango tope turned into an orderly town as they watched. Let us go, said the lama, sinking back afraid, as the fires twinkled and white officers with jingling swords stalked into the mess tent. Stand back in the shadow. No one can see beyond the light of a fire, said Kim, his eyes still on the flag. He had never before watched the routine of a seasoned regiment pitching camp in thirty minutes. Look, 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 clucked the llama. Yonder comes a priest. It was Bennett, the Church of England chaplain of the regiment, limping in dusty black. One of his flock had made some rude remarks about the chaplain's mettle, and to abash him Bennett had marched step by step with the men that day. The black dress, gold cross on the watch-chain, the hairless face and the soft black wide-awake hat would have marked him as a holy man anywhere in all India. He dropped into a camp chair by the door of the mess tent and slid off his boots. Three or four officers gathered round him, laughing and joking over his exploit. The talk of white men is wholly lacking in dignity, said the lama, who judged only by tone. But I considered the countenance of that priest, and I think he is learned. Is it likely he will understand our talk? I would talk to him of my search. Never speak to a white man till he is fed, said Kim, quoting a well-known proverb. They will eat now, and uh, and I do not think they are good to beg from. Uh, let us go back to the resting place. After we have eaten, we will come again. It certainly was a red bull. It's my red bull. They were both noticeably absent-minded when the old lady's retinue set their meal before them. So none broke their reserve, for it is not lucky to annoy guests. Now, said Kim, picking his teeth, we will return to that place, but thou, O holy one, must wait a little way off, because thy feet are heavier than mine, and I am anxious to see more of that red bull. But how canst thou understand the talk? Walk slowly. The road is dark, the lama replied uneasily. Kim put the question aside. I marked a place near the trees, said he, where thou canst sit till I call. Nay, as the lama made some sort of protest, remember, this is my search, the search for my red bull. The sign in the stars was not for thee. I know a little of the customs of white soldiers, and I always desire to see some new things. "'What dost thou not know of this world?' "'The lama squatted obediently in a little hollow of the ground, "'not a hundred yards from the hump of the mango trees, "'dark against the star-powdered sky. "'Stay till I call,' Kim flitted into the dusk. "'He knew that in all probability there would be sentries round the camp, "'and smiled to himself as he heard the thick boots of one. "'A boy who can dodge over the roofs of Lahore City on a moonlit night,' using every little patch and corner of darkness to discomfit his pursuer, is not likely to be checked by a line of well-trained soldiers. He paid them the compliment of crawling between a couple, and running and halting, crouching and dropping flat, worked his way toward the lighted mess tent, where, close pressed behind the mango tree, he waited until some chance word should give him a returnable lead. The one thing now in his mind was further information as to the Red Bull, for aught he knew, and Kim's limitations were as curious and sudden as his expansions, the men, the nine hundred thorough devils of his father's prophecy, might pray to the beast after dark, as Hindus pray to the holy cow. That, at least, would be entirely right and logical, and the padre with the gold cross would be there for the man to consult on this matter. On the other hand, remembering sober-faced padres whom he had avoided in Lahore City, the priest might be an inquisitive nuisance who would bid him learn. But had it not been proven at Umbala that his sign in the high heavens portended war and armed men, was he not the friend of the stars as well of all the world, crammed to his teeth with dreadful secrets? Lastly, 
and firstly, as the undercurrent of all his quick thoughts, this adventure, though he did not know the English word, was a stupendous lock, a delightful continuation of his old flights across housetops, as well as the fulfilment of sublime prophecy. He lay belly flat and wriggled towards the mess tent door, a hand on the amulet round his neck. It was, as he suspected, the sahibs prayed to their god, for, in the centre of the mess table, its sole ornament when they were on the line of march, stood a golden bull fashioned from old-time loot of the summer palace at Pekin, a red gold bull with lowered head, ramping upon a field of Irish green. To him the sahibs held out their glasses and cried aloud confusedly. Now, the Reverend Arthur Bennett always left Mass after that toast, and being rather tired by his march, his movements were more abrupt than usual. Kim, with slightly raised head, was still staring at his totem on the table when the chaplain stepped on his right shoulder blade. Kim flinched under the leather and, rolling sideways, brought down the chaplain, who, ever a man of action, caught him by the throat and nearly choked the life out of him. Kim then kicked him desperately in the stomach. Mr. Bennett gasped and doubled up, but without relaxing his grip, rolled over again and silently hauled Kim to his own tent. The Mavericks were incurable practical jokers, and it occurred to the Englishman that silence was best till he had made complete inquiry. "'Why, it's a boy!' he said, as he drew his prize under the light of the tent-pole lantern, and then shaking him severely, cried, "'What were you doing? You're a thief. Chaw, a malum?' His Hindustani was very limited, and the ruffled and disgusted Kim intended to keep to the character laid down for him. As he recovered his breath, he was inventing a beautifully plausible tale of his relations to some scullion, and at the same time keeping a keen eye on, and a little under the chaplain's left armpit. The chance came. He ducked for the doorway, but a long arm shot out and clutched at his neck, snapping the amulet string and closing on the amulet. "'Give it to me! Oh, give it to me! Is it lost? Give me the papers!' The words were in English, the tinny, saw-cut English of the native bread, and the chaplain jumped. "'A scapula,' said he, opening his hand. "'No, some sort of heathen charm. Why, why do you speak English? Little boys who steal are beaten. You know that.' "'I do not. I did not steal.' Kim danced in agony, like a terrier, at a lifted stick. "'Oh, give it to me! It is my charm! Do not thieve it from me!' The chaplain took no heed, but going to the tent door, called aloud. A fattish, clean-shaven man appeared. "'I want your advice, Father Victor,' said Bennett. "'I found this boy in the dark outside the mess-tent. Ordinarily I should have chastised him and let him go, because I believe him to be a thief. But it seems he talks English, and he attaches some sort of value to a charm round his neck.' "'I thought perhaps you might help me.' Between himself and the Roman Catholic chaplain of the Irish contingent lay, as Bennett believed, an unabridgeable gulf. But it was noticeable that whenever the Church of England dealt with a human problem, she was very likely to call in the Church of Rome. Bennett's official abhorrence of the scarlet woman and all her ways was only equalled by his private respect for Father Victor. "'A thief? Talking English, is it? Let's look at his charm.' Uh, "'No, it's not a scapular, Bennett,' he held out his hand. "'But have we any right to open it? A sound whipping. "'I did not, thieve,' protested Kim. "'You have hit me the kicks all over my body. "'Now give me my charm and I will go away.' "'Not quite so fast. We'll look first, said Father Victor, "'leisurely rolling out poor Kimball O'Hara's nay veritio parchment, "'his clearance certificate and Kim's baptismal certificate.' On this last, O'Hara, with some confused idea that he was doing wonders for his son, had scrawled scores of times. Look after the boy. Please look after the boy. Signing his name and regimental number in full. Powers of darkness below, said Father Victor, passing all over to Mr. Bennett. Do you know what these things are? Yes, said Kim. They are mine, and I want to go away. I don't quite understand, said Mr. Bennett. "'He probably brought them on purpose. "'It may be a begging trick of some kind. "'I never saw a beggar less anxious to stay with his company than. "'There's the makings of a gay mystery here. "'You believe in Providence, Bennet? "'I hope so. "'Well, I believe in miracles. "'So it comes to the same thing. "'Powers of darkness, Kimball O'Hara and his son. Uh, "'But then he's a native, "'and I saw Kimball married myself to Annie Shot. Uh, "'How long have you had these things, boy? "'Ever since I was a little baby.' 
Father Victor stepped forward quickly and opened the front of Kim's upper garment. Uh, you see, Bennett, he's not very black. What's your name? Uh, Kim. Or Kimball? Uh, perhaps. Will you let me go away? Uh, what else? Uh, they call me Kim Rishti K. Uh, that is Kim of the Rishti. What is that, Rishti? Irishty. That was the regiment, my father's... Irish. Oh, I see. Yes, that was how my father told me. My father, he has lived. He lived where? Has lived. Of course, he is dead. Gone out. Oh, that's your abrupt way of putting it, is it? Bennett interrupted. It is possible I've done the boy an injustice. He is certainly white, though evidently neglected. I'm sure I must have bruised him. I do not think the spirits... Get him a glass of sherry, then, and let him squat on the cot. And now, Kim, continued Father Victor, no one's going to hurt you. Uh, drink that dine, and tell us about yourself. Uh, the truth, if you've no objection. Kim coughed a little as he put down the empty glass, and considered. This seemed a time for caution and fancy. Small boys who prowl about camps are generally turned out after a whipping. But he had received no stripes. The amulet was evidently working in his favour, and it looked as though the Umbala's horoscope, and the few words that he could remember of his father's maunderings, fitted in most miraculously. Else, why did the fat padre seem so impressed, and why the glass of hot yellow drink from the lean one? "'My father, he is dead in Lahore City since I was very little. The woman she kept Kabari's shop near where the high carriages are,' Kim began with a plunge, not quite sure how far the truth would serve him. "'Your mother?' Uh, "'No,' with a gesture of disgust. "'She went out uh, when I was born. "'My father, he got those papers from the Jadu Gur. Uh, "'What do you call that?' Uh, "'Bennett nodded. Uh, "'Because he was in good standing. Uh, "'What do you call that?' "'Again, Bennett nodded. Uh, "'My father told me that he said to, "'and also the Brahmin, "'who made the drawing in the dust at Ambala two days ago, "'he said that I shall find a red bull on a green field, "'and the bull shall help me.' "'A phenomenal little liar,' muttered Bennett. "'Powers of darkness below, what a country!' murmured Father Victor. Uh, "'Go on, Kim.' "'I did not thieve. Besides, I am just now disciple of a very holy man. He is sitting outside. We saw two men come with flags making the place ready. That is always so in a dream, or on account of a prophecy. So I knew it was come true. I saw the red bull on the green field, and my father, he said, nine hundred bucker devils and the colonel riding on a horse.' will look after you when you find the red bull. I did not know what to do when I saw the bull when I went away, and I came again when it was dark. I wanted to see the bull again, and I saw the bull again with the sahibs praying to it. I think the bull shall help me. The holy man said so too. He is sitting outside. Will you hurt him if I call him a shout now? He is very holy. He can witness to all the things I say, and he knows I am not a thief. "'Sahibs praying to a bull. "'What in the world do you make of that?' said Bennett. Uh, "'Disciple of a holy man? Is the boy mad? "'That's O'Hara's boy, sure enough. "'O'Hara's boy leagued with all the powers of darkness. "'That's very much what his father would have done if he was drunk. Uh, "'We'd better invite the holy man. He may know something.' "'He doesn't know anything,' said Kim. "'I will show you him if you come. He is my master. Uh, "'Then afterwards we can go.' "'Powers of darkness,' was all that Father Victor could say as Bennett marched off with a firm hand on Kim's shoulder. They found the llama where he had dropped. "'The search is at an end for me,' shouted Kim in the vernacular. "'I have found the bull, but God knows what comes next. They will not hurt you. Come to the fat priest's tent with this thin man and see the end. It is all new, and they cannot talk Hindi. They are only uncurried donkeys.' "'Then it is not well to make jest of their ignorance,' the lama returned. "'I am glad, if thou art rejoiced, Chella. Dignified and unsuspicious, he strode into the little tent, saluted the churches as a churchman, and sat down by the open charcoal brazier. The yellow lining of the tent, reflected in the lamplight, made his face red gold. Bennett looked at him with the triple-ringed uninterest of the creed that lumps nine-tenths of the world under the title of heathen. "'And what was the end of the search? What gift has the Red Bull brought?' The Lama addressed himself to Kim. "'He says, uh, what are you going to do?' Bennett was staring uneasily at Father Victor, and Kim, for his own ends, took upon himself the office of interpreter. 
I do not see what concern this faker has with the boy, who is probably his dupe or his confederate, Bennett began. We cannot allow an English boy, assuming that he is the son of a mason, the sooner he goes to the Masonic orphanage, the better. Ah, that's your opinion as secretary to the regimental lodge, said Father Victor. But we might as well tell the old man what we're going to do. He doesn't look like a villain. My experience is that one can never fathom the Oriental mind. Now, Kimball, I wish you to tell this man what I say word for word. Kim gathered the import of the next few sentences and began thus. A holy one, the thin fool who looks like a camel, says that I am the son of a sahib. But how? Oh, it's true. I knew it since my birth, but he could only find out by rending the amulet from my neck and reading all the papers. He thinks that once a sahib is always a sahib, and between the two of them they purpose to keep me in this regiment, or to send me to a madrasa school. It has happened before. I have always avoided it. The fat fool is of one mind and the camel like one of another, but that is no odds. I may spend one night here and perhaps the next. It has happened before. Then I will run away and return to thee. But tell him that thou art my cheller. Tell him how thou didst come to me when I was faint and bewildered. Tell them of our search, and they will surely let thee go now. I have already told them. They laugh, and they talk of the police. What are you saying? asked Mr. Bennet. Oh, he only says that if you do not let me go, it will stop him in his business, his urgent private affairs. The last was a reminiscence of some talk with a Eurasian clock in the canal department, but it only drew a smile which nettled him. And if you did know what his business was, you would not be in such a beastly hurry to interfere. Oh, what is it, then? said Father Victor, not without feeling, as he watched the llama's face. There is a river in this country which he wishes to find so very much. It was put out by an arrow which... Kim tapped his foot impatiently as he translated in his own mind, from the vernacular to his clumsy English. Oh, it was made by our Lord God Buddha, you know, and if you wash there, you are washed away from all your sins and made as white as cotton wool. Kim had heard mission talk in his time. I am his disciple, and we must find the river. It is so very valuable to us. Say that again, said Bennett. Kim obeyed, with amplifications. But this is gross blasphemy, cried the Church of England. Ah, oh, cha said Father Victor sympathetically. I'd give a good deal to be able to talk the vernacular. A river that washes away sin. And how long have you two been looking for it? Oh, many days. Now we wish to go away and look for it again. It is not here, you see. I see, said Father Victor gravely. But he can't go on in that old man's company. It would be very different, Kim, if you are not a soldier's son. Tell him that the regiment will take care of you and make you as good a man as your... Uh, as good a man as can be. Uh, tell him that if he believes in miracles, he must believe that. There's no need to play on his credulity, Bennett interrupted. I'm doing no such thing. He must believe that the boy is coming here to his own regiment, and search of his red bull is in the nature of a miracle. Uh, consider the chances against it, Bennett. This one boy in all India, and our regiment of all others, on the line of march for him to meet with. It's predestined on the face of it. Uh, yes, tell him it's kismet. Uh, kismet malam. Do you understand? He turned towards the Lama, to whom he might as well have talked of Mesopotamia. They say, the old man's eyes lighted at Kim's speech, they say that the meaning of my horoscope is now accomplished, and that being led back, though, as thou knowest, I went out of curiosity to these people and their Red Bull, I must needs go to the Madrissa and be turned into a sahib. Now I make pretense of agreement, for at the worst it will be but a few meals eaten away from thee. Then I will slip away and follow down the road to Saharanpur. Uh, therefore, holy one, keep with that cooler woman. On no account stray far from her cart till I come again. A uh, past question, my sign is of war and of armed men. Uh, see how they have given me wine to drink and set me upon a bed of honour. Uh, my father must have been some great person. So, if they raise me to honour among them, good. If not, good again. However it goes. I will run back to thee when I am tired. But stay with the Rajputni, or I shall miss thy feet. Oh, yes, said the boy. I have told him everything you tell me to say. And I cannot see any need why he should wait, said Bennett, feeling in his trouser pocket. We can investigate the details later, and I will give him a ro Give him time. Maybe he's fond of the lad, 
said Father Victor, half arresting the clergyman's motion. The lama dragged forth his rosary and pulled his huge hat brim over his eyes. Oh, what can he want now? He says, uh, Kim put up one hand, he says, uh, be quiet. He wants to speak to me by himself. You see, you do not know one little word of what he says, and I think if you talk, he will perhaps give you very bad curses. When he talks those beads like that, you see, he always wants to be quiet. The two Englishmen sat, overwhelmed, but there was a look in Bennett's eye that promised ill for Kim when he should be relaxed to the religious arm. A sahib and the son of a sahib, the lama's voice was harsh with pain. But no white man knows the land and the customs of the land as thou knowest. How comes it, it this is true? What matter, holy one? But remember, it is only for a night or two. Remember, I can change swiftly. It will all be as it was when I first spoke to the under Zamzama, the great gun. As a boy in the dress of white men, when I first went to the wonder house, and a second time thou wast a Hindu, what shall the third incarnation be? He chuckled drearily. Ah, oh, Chela, thou hast done a wrong to an old man because my heart went out to thee, and mine to thee. But how could I know that the Red Bull would bring me to this business? The Lama covered his face afresh and nervously rattled the rosary. Kim squatted beside him and laid hold upon a fold of his clothing. And now it is understood that the boy is a sahib, he went on in a muffled tone. Such a sahib as was he who kept the images in the wonder house. The lama's experience of white men was limited. He seemed to be repeating a lesson. So then, it is not so seemly that he should do other than as the sahibs do. He must go back to his own people. For a day, and a night, and a day, Kim pleaded. No, you don't. Father Victor saw Kim edging towards the door and interposed a strong leg. I do not understand the customs of white men. The priest of the images in the wonder house in Lahore was more courteous than the thin one here. This boy will be taken from me. They will make a sahib of my disciple. Oh, woe to me! How shall I find my river? Have they no disciples? Ask. He says he is very sorry that he cannot find the river now any more. He says, why have you no disciples? and stop bothering him. He wants to be washed of his sins. Neither Bennett nor Father Victor found any answer ready. Said Kim, in English, distressed for the Lama's agony. I think if you will let me go now, we will walk away quietly and not steal. We will look for that river like before I was caught. I wish I did not come here to find the Red Bull and all that sort of thing. I do not want it. It's the very best day's work you ever did for yourself, young man, said Bennett. "'Good heavens! I don't know how to console him,' said Father Victor, watching the lama intently. "'He can't take the boy away with him, and yet he's a good man. I'm sure he's a good man. Uh, Bennett, if you give him that rupee, he'll curse your root and branch.' They listened to each other's breathing. Three, five full minutes. Then the lama raised his head and looked forth across them into space and emptiness. "'And I am a follower of the way.' he said bitterly. The sin is mine, and the punishment is mine. I made believe to myself, for now I see it was but make believe, that thou wast sent to me to aid in the search. So my heart went out to thee for thy charity, and thy courtesy, and the wisdom of thy little years. But those who follow the way must permit not the fire of any desire or attachment, for that is all illusion." As says, he quoted an old, old Chinese text, backed it with another, and reinforced these with a third. I stepped aside from the way, my cella. It was no fault of thine. I delighted in the sight of life, the new people upon the roads, and in thy joy at seeing these things. I was pleased with thee, who should have considered my search, and my search alone. Now I am sorrowful because thou art taken away, and my river is far from me. It is the law which I have broken. Powers of darkness below, said Father Victor, who wise in the confessional heard the pain in every sentence. I see now 
that the sign of the red bull was a sign for me as well as for thee. All desire is red and evil. I will do penance and find my river alone. At least go back to the cooler woman, said Kim, otherwise thou wilt be lost upon the roads. She will feed thee till I run back to thee. The lama waved a hand to show that the matter was finally settled in his mind. Now, his tone altered as he turned to Kim, what will they do with thee? At least I may, acquiring merit, wipe out past ill. Make me a sahib, so they think. The day after tomorrow I return. Do not grieve. Of what sort? Such an one as this, or that man? He pointed to Father Victor. Such an one of those I saw this evening, men wearing swords and stamping heavily. Uh, maybe. That is not well. These men follow desire and come to emptiness. Thou must not be of their sort. The Ambala priest said that my star was war, Kim interjected. I will ask these fools, but there is truly no need. I will run away this night, for all I wanted to see the new things. Kim put two or three questions in English to Father Victor, translating the replies to the Lama. Then, he says, you take him from me, and you cannot say what you will make him. He says, tell me before I go, for it is not a small thing to make a child. You will be sent to a school. Later on we shall see. Kimball, I suppose you'd like to be a soldier. Gorolo, no, no. Kim shook his head violently. There was nothing in his composition to which drill and routine appealed. I will not be a soldier. You will be what you're told to be, said Bennett, and you should be grateful that we're going to help you. Kim smiled compassionately. If these men lay under the delusion that he would do anything that he did not fancy, so much the better. Another long silence followed. Bennett fidgeted with impatience and suggested calling a sentry to evict the faker. Do they give or sell learning among the sahibs? Ask them, said the lama, and Kim interpreted. They say that money is paid to the teacher, but that money the regiment will give. What need? It is only for a night. And the more money is paid, the better learning is given. The lama disregarded Kim's plans for an early flight. It is no wrong to pay for learning. To help the ignorant to wisdom is always a merit. The rosary clicked furiously as an abacus. Then he faced his oppressors. Ask them for how much money do they give a wise and suitable teaching, and in what city is that teaching given? Well, said Father Victor in English, when Kim had translated, that depends. The regiment would pay for you all the time you're at the military orphanage, or you might go on the Punjab Masonic Orphanage's list. Not that he or you'd understand what that means. But the best school in a boy can get in India is, of course, at St. Saviour's in Portibus, at Lucknow. This took some time to interpret, for Bennett wished to cut it short. He wants to know how much, said Kim placidly. Uh, two or three hundred rupees a year, Father Victor was long past any sense of amazement. Bennett, impatient, did not understand. He says... Uh, write that name and the money upon a paper and give it to him. And he says, you must write your name below, because he's going to write a letter in some days to you. He says you are a good man. He says the other man is a fool. He is going away. The lama rose suddenly. I follow my search, he cried, and was gone. He'll run slap into the sentries, cried Father Victor, jumping up as the lama stalked out. But I can't leave the boy. Kim made a swift motion to follow, but he checked himself. There was no sound of challenge outside. The lama had disappeared. Kim settled himself composedly on the chaplain's cot. At least the lama had promised that he would stay with the ripened woman from Kulu, and the rest was of the smallest importance. It pleased him that the two padres were so evidently excited. They talked long in undertones, Father Victor urging some scheme on Mr. Bennett, who seemed incredulous. All this was very new and fascinating, but Kim felt sleepy. They called men into the tent. One of them certainly was the colonel, as his father had prophesied, and they asked him an infinity of questions, chiefly about the woman who looked after him, all of which Kim answered truthfully. 
they did not seem to think the woman was a good guardian. After all, this was the newest of his experiences. Sooner or later, if he chose, he could escape into great, grey, formless India, beyond tents and padres and colonels. Meantime, if the sahibs were to be impressed, he would do his best to impress them. He too was a white man. After much talk that he could not comprehend, they handed him over to a sergeant, who had strict instructions not to let him escape. The regiment would go on to Umbala, and Kim would be sent up, partly at the expense of the lodge, and in part by subscription, to a place called Sanawa. "'It's miraculous, Pastor Whooping, Colonel,' said the Father Victor, when he had talked without a break for ten minutes. "'His Buddhist friend has levanted after taking my name and address. I can't make out whether he'll pay for the boy's education or whether he's preparing some sort of witchcraft on his own account.' Then to Kim, "'You'll live to be grateful to your friend the Red Bull yet. We'll make a man of you at the Sanawa, even at the price of making you a Protestant.' "'Certainly, most certainly,' said Bennett. "'But you will not go to Sanawa, said Kim. Uh, "'But we will go to Sanawa, little man. "'That's the order of the commander-in-chief, "'who's a trifle more important than O'Hara's son. "'You will not go to Sanawa. "'You will go to the war.' "'There was a shout of laughter from the full tent. "'When you know your regiment a trifle better, "'you won't confuse the line of march with the line of battle, Kim. "'We hope to go to the war.' some time. Oh, I know all that. Kim drew his bow again at a venture. If they were not going to the war, at least they did not know that he knew of the talk in the veranda at Umbala. I know you are not at the war now, but I tell you that as soon as you go to Umbala, you will be sent to the war, the new war. It is a war of eight thousand men besides the guns. That's explicit. Do you add prophecy to your other gifts? "'Take him along, Sergeant. Take up a suit for him from the drums, and take care he doesn't slip through your fingers. Who says the age of miracles is gone by? I think I'll go to bed. I may poor mind's weakening.' At the end of the camp, silent as a wild animal, an hour later sat Kim, newly washed all over, in a horrible stiff suit that rasped his arms and legs. "'A most amazing young bird,' said the sergeant. "'He turns up in charge of a yellow-headed buck Brahmin priest "'with his father's lodge certificates round his neck, "'talking, God knows, what all of a red bull. "'The buck Brahmin evaporates without explanations, "'and the boy sets cross-legged on the chaplain's bed, "'prophesying bloody war to the men at large. "'Hinges a wild land for a God-fearing man. "'I'll just tie his leg to the tent pole, "'in case he goes through the roof. <laughs> "'What do you say about the war?' Eight thousand men, beside guns,' said Kim. "'Very soon you will see. "'You're a consoling little imp. Uh, "'Lie down between the drums and go to bye-bye. Uh, "'Those two boys will watch your slumbers.' Chapter 6 "'Now I remember, comrades, "'old playmates on new seas, "'when as we traded opiment among the savages.' Ten thousand leagues to southward, and thirty years removed. They knew not noble Valdez, but me they knew and loved. Song of Diego Valdez Very early in the morning the white tents came down, and disappeared as the mavericks took a side road to Umbala. It did not skirt the resting place, and Kim, trudging beside a baggage cart under fire of comments from soldiers' wives, was not so confident as overnight. He discovered that he was closely watched, Father Victor on the one side and Mr. Bennett on the other. In the forenoon the column checked. A camel orderly handed the colonel a letter. He read it and spoke to a major. Half a mile in the rear, Kim heard a hoarse and joyful clamour rolling down on him through the thick dust. Then someone beat him on the back, crying, "'Tell us how you knew, you little limb of Satan. Father dear, see if you can make him tell.' A pony ranged alongside, and he was hauled on to the priest's saddlebow. "'Now, my son, your prophecy of last night has come true. Our orders are to entrain at Humbola for the front tomorrow.' "'What is that?' said Kim, for front and entrain were newish words to him. "'We're going to the war, as you called it.' "'Of course you're going to the war,' I said last night. 
"'You did, but powers of darkness, how did you know?' Kim's eyes sparkled. He shut his lips, nodded his head, and looked unspeakable things. The chaplain moved on through the dust, and privates, sergeants, and subalterns called one another's attention to the boy. The colonel, at the head of the column, stared at him curiously. "'It was probably some bizarre rumour," he said. Uh, "'But even then—' He referred to the paper in his hand. "'Hang it all! The thing was only decided within the last forty-eight hours.' "'Are uh, there many more like you in India?' said Father Victor. "'Or are you by way of being a, a luscious naturally?' Uh, "'Now, I've told you,' said the boy. "'Will you let me go back to my old man? "'If he's not stayed with that woman from Kulu, I'm afraid he'll die.' "'But what I saw of him, he's as well able to take care of himself as you. "'No, you've brought us luck, and we're going to make a man of ye. "'I'll take you back to your baggage cart, and you'll come to me this evening.' "'For the rest of the day, Kim found himself an object of distinguished consideration "'among a few hundred white men. "'The story of his appearance in camp, the discovery of his parentage, "'and his prophecy had lost nothing in the telling. "'A big, shapeless white woman on a pile of bedding asked him mysteriously whether he thought her husband would come back from the war. Kim reflected gravely and said that he would, and the woman gave him food. In many respects, this big procession that played music at intervals, this crowd that talked and laughed so easily, resembled a festival in Lahore City. And so far, there was no sign of hard work, and he resolved to lend the spectacle his patronage. At evening there came out to meet them bands of music, and played the mavericks into camp near Umbala railway station. That was an interesting night. Many of other regiments came to visit the mavericks. The mavericks went visiting on their own account. Their pickets hurried forth to bring them back, met pickets of strange regiments on the same duty, and, after a while, the bugles blew madly for more pickets, with officers to control the tumult. The mavericks had a reputation for liveliness to live up to, but they fell in on the platform next morning in perfect shape and condition, and Kim, left behind with the sick women and boys, found himself shouting farewells excitedly as the trains drew away. Life as a sahib was amusing so far, but he touched it with a cautious hand. Then they marched him back in charge of a drummer boy to empty, lime-washed barracks, whose floors were covered with rubbish and string and paper, and whose ceilings gave back his lonely footfall. Native fashion, he curled himself up on a stripped cot and went to sleep. An angry man stumped down the veranda, woke him up, and said he was a schoolmaster. This was enough for Kim, and he retired into his shell. He could just puzzle out the various English police notices in Lahore City, because they affected his comfort, and among the many guests of the woman who looked after him had been a queer German who painted scenery for the Parsi travelling theatre. He told Kim that he'd been on the barricades in 48, and therefore, at least, that was how it struck Kim. He would teach the boy to write in return for food. Kim had been kicked as far as single letters, but did not think well of them. "'I do not know anything. Go away,' said Kim, scenting evil. Hereupon the man caught him by the ear, dragged him to a room in a far-off wing where a dozen drummer boys were sitting on forms, and told him to be still if he could do nothing else. This he managed very successfully. The man explained something or other with white lines on a black board for at least half an hour and Kim continued his interrupted nap. He much disapproved of the present aspect of affairs, for this was the very school and discipline he had spent two-thirds of his young life in avoiding. Suddenly a beautiful idea occurred to him, and he wondered that he had not thought of it before. The man dismissed them, and first to spring through the veranda into the open sunshine was Kim. "'Ere you! Alt! Stop!' said a voice at his heels. "'I've got to look after you. "'My orders are not to let you out of my sight. "'Where are you going?' "'It was the drummer boy who'd been hanging around him all afternoon, "'a fat and freckled person of about fourteen, "'and Kim loathed him from the soles of his boots to his cap ribbons. "'To the bazaar, to get sweets, for you,' said Kim, after thought. "'Well, the bazaar's out of bounds. "'If we go there, we'll get a dressing down. "'You come back.' 
how near can we go? Kim did not know what bounds meant, but he wished to be polite uh, for the present. How near? How far, you mean? We can go as far as that tree down the road. Uh, then I will go there. All right, I ain't going, it's too hot. I can watch you from here. It's no good you're running away. If you did, they'll spot you by your clothes. That's regimental stuff you're wearing. There ain't a picket in Imbala. I wouldn't lead you back quicker and you started out. This did not impress Kim, as much as the knowledge that his raiment would tire him out if he tried to run. He slouched to the tree at the corner of a bare road leading towards the bazaar, and eyed the natives passing. Most of them were barrack servants of the lowest caste. Kim hailed a sweeper, who promptly retorted with a piece of unnecessary insolence, in the natural belief that the European boy could not follow it. The low, quick answer undeceived him. Kim put his fettered soul into it, thankful for the late chance to abuse somebody in the tongue he knew best. And now, go to the nearest letter writer in the bazaar and tell him to come here. I would write a letter. But, but what manner of a white man's son art thou to need a bazaar letter writer? Is there not a schoolmaster in the barracks? Aye, and hell is full of the same sort. Uh, do my order, you odd. Thy mother was married under a basket, a servant of Laubeck. Kim knew the god of the sweepers. Run on my business, or we will talk again. The sweeper shuffled off in a haste. There is a white boy by the barracks waiting under a tree who is not a white boy, he stammered to the first bizarre letter writer he came across. He needs thee. Or will he pay? said the spruce scribe, gathering up his desk and pens and sealing wax all in order. I do not know. He is not like other boys. Go and see. It is well worth. Kim danced with impatience when the slim young Kayeth hove into sight. As soon as his voice could carry, he cursed him volubly. First, I will take my pay, the letter writer said. Bad words have made the price higher. Uh, but who art thou, dressed in that fashion to speak in this fashion? Aha, that is in the letter which thou shalt write. Never was such a tale, but I am in no haste. Another writer will serve me. Umbala City is as full of them as is Lahore. Four annas, said the writer, sitting down and spreading his cloth in the shade of a deserted barrack wing. Mechanically, Kim squatted beside him, squatted as only the natives can in spite of the abominable clinging trousers. The writer regarded him sideways. This is the price to ask of sahibs, said Kim. Now fix me a true one. An anna and a half. How do I know, having written the letter, thou wilt not run away? I must not go beyond this tree, and there is also the stamp to be considered. I get no commission on the price of the stamp. Once more, what manner of white boy art thou? That shall be said in the letter, which is to Mahbub Ali, the horse-dealer in the Kashmir Seray at Lahore. He is my friend. A wonder on wonder, murmured the letter-writer, dipping a reed in the inkstand. Uh, to be written in Hindi? Assuredly, to Mahbub Ali, then. Uh, begin. I have come down with the old man as far as Umbala in the train. At Umbala I carried the news of the bay mare's pedigree. After what he had seen in the garden, he was not going to write of white stallions. A slower a little. What has a bay mare to do? Is it Mahub Ali, the great dealer? Or who else? I have been in his service. Take more ink. Again, as the order was, so I did it. We then went on foot towards Benares, but on the third day we found a certain regiment. Is that down? I Pulton, murmured the writer, all ears. I went into their camp and was caught, and by means of the charm about my neck, which thou knowest, it was established that I was the son of some man in the regiment, according to the prophecy of the Red Bull, which thou knowest was common talk of our bazaar. Kim waited for this shaft to sink into the letter writer's heart, cleared his throat, and continued. A priest clothed me and gave me a new name. Oh, one priest, however, was a fool. The clothes are very heavy. But I am a sahib, and my heart is heavy too. They send me to school and beat me. I do not like the air and water here. Come, then, and help me, Mahbub Ali, or send me some money, for I have not sufficient to pay the writer who writes this. Who writes this? It is my own fault that I was tricked. Thou art as clever as Hussein Bucks that forged the treasury stamps at Nuklau. But what a tale, what a tale. Is it true by any chance? It does not profit to tell lies to Mahbub Ali, it is better to help his friends by lending them a stamp. When the money comes, I will repay. The writer grunted doubtfully, but took a stamp out of his desk, sealed the letter, handed it over to Kim, and departed. Mahbub Ali's was a name of power in Umbala. 
That is the way to win a good account with the gods, Kim shouted after him. Pay me twice over when the money comes, the man cried over his shoulder. What was you bucking to that nigger about, said the drummer boy when Kim returned to the veranda. I was watching you. I was only talking to him. You talk the same as a nigger, don't you? No, I only speak a little. Uh, what shall we do now? The bugles will go for dinner in half a minute. Oh, my God, I wish I'd gone up to the front with the regiment. It's awful doing nothing but school down here. Don't you hate it? Oh, yes. I'd run away if I knew where to go, but, as the men say, in this blooming Inji, you're only a prisoner at large. You can't desert without being took back at once. I'm fair sick of it. You've been in, in England? Uh, why, I only come out last trooping season with me mother. I should think I have been in England. What ignorant little beggar you are. You was brought up in the gutter, wasn't you? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, tell me something about England. My father, he came from there. Though he would not say so, Kim, of course, disbelieved every word the drummer spoke about the Liverpool suburb, which was his England. It passed the heavy time till dinner. A most unappetising meal served to the boys and a few invalids in a corner of a barrack room. But that he had written to Mabu Bali, Kim would have been almost depressed. The indifference of native crowds he was used to, but this strong loneliness among white men preyed on him. He was grateful when, in the course of the afternoon, a big soldier took him over to Father Victor, who lived in another wing across another dusty parade ground. The priest was reading an English letter written in purple ink. He looked at Kim more curiously than ever. "'And how do you like it, my son, as, as far as you've gone? Uh, "'Not much, eh? It must be hard. "'Very hard on a wild animal. Uh, "'Listen, I, I've an amazing epistle from your friend. "'Where is he? Is he well?' Oh, if he knows to write me letters, uh, is it all right? You're fond of him, then? Of course I'm fond of him. He was fond of me. It seems so by the look of this. He can't write English, can he? Oh, no, not that I know. But, of course, he found a letter writer who can write English very well, and so he wrote. I do hope you understand. Ah, that accounts for it. Do you know anything about his money affairs? Kim's face showed that he did not. Uh, how can I tell? Uh, that's what I'm asking. Now listen if you can make head or tail of this. We'll skip the first part. It's written from Jagadir Road. Uh, Sitting on wayside in grave meditation, trusting to be favoured with your honour's applause of present step, which recommend your honour to execute for almighty God's sake. Education is greatest blessing if of best sort, otherwise no earthly use. Faith, the old man's hit the bull's eye this time. If your honour condescending giving, my boy, best education, Xavier. I suppose that's in Xavier's in partibus. Uh, in terms of our conversation dated in your tent, 15th instant, a business-like touch there, uh, then almighty God, blessing your honour's succeedings to third and fourth generation, and, and now listen, confide in your honour's humble servant for adequate remuneration per hundi per annum, 300 rupees a year, to one expensive education. St. Xavier, look now, and allow a small time to forward some per hundi, uh, send to any part of India as your honour shall address yourself. Uh, this servant of your honour has presently no place to lay crown of his head. But going to Benares by train, on a kind of persecution of old woman, talking so much, and unanxious residing Saharanpur in any domestic capacity. And I, what in the world does that mean? She has asked him to be her poor uh, her clergyman at Saharanpur, I think. Uh, he would not do that on account of his river. Uh, she did talk. As clear to you, is it? It beats me altogether. Uh, so, going to Benares, where you will find a dress and forward rupees for boy who is apple of eye, and for almighty God's sake execute this education, and your petitioner, as in duty bind, shall ever awfully pray. Written by Sobreo Sate, a failed entrance Allahabad University for Venerable Tashu Lama, the priest of Sukzen, looking for a river. Address care of Tarthankar's temple, Benares, uh, PM. Uh, please note, boy is apple of eye, and rupees shall be sent per hundi, three hundred per annum, for God's almighty's sake. And I, is that raven lunacy or a business proposition, I ask ye, because I'm fairly at me wet's end. He says he will give me three hundred rupees a year, so he will give me them. Oh, that's the way you look at it, is it? Of course, if he says so. The priest whistled, then he addressed Kim as an equal. I don't believe it, but we'll see. You were going off today to the military orphanage at Sanwar, where the regiment would keep you till you're old enough to enlist. 
you be brought up to the Church of England. Uh, Bennett arranged for that. On the other hand, if you go to St. Xavier's, you'll get a better education and, and can have the religion. Do you see my dilemma? Kim saw nothing, save a vision of the llama going south in a train with none to beg for him. Like most people, I'm going to temporise. If your friend sends the money from Benares, powers of darkness below, or as a street beggar to raise 300 rupees, you'll go down to look now, and I'll pay your fare, because I can't touch a subscription money if I intend, as I do, to make you a Catholic. If he doesn't, you'll go to the military orphanage at the regiment's expense. I'll allow him three days' grace, though I don't believe it at all. Even then, if he fails in his payments later on, but it's beyond me. We can only walk one step at a time in this world, praise God. And they sent Bennett to the front and left me behind. Eh, Benny can't expect everything. Oh, oh, yes, said Kim vaguely. The priest leaned forward. I'd give a month's pay to find out what's going inside that little round head of yours. There's nothing, said Kim, and scratched it. He was wondering whether Marble Bally would send him as much as a whole rupee. Then he could pay the letter writer and write letters to the Lama at Benares. Perhaps Marble Bally would visit him next time he came south with horses. Surely he must know that Kim's delivery of the letter to the officer at Umbala had caused the great war which the men and boys had discussed so loudly over the barrack dinner tables. But if Marble Bally did not know this, it would be very unsafe to tell him so. Marble Bally was hard upon boys who knew or thought they knew too much. Well, till I get further news, Father Victor's voice interrupted the reverie. You can run along now and play with the other boys. They'll teach you something, but I don't think you'll like it. The day dragged to its weary end. When he wished to sleep, he was instructed how to fold up his clothes and set out his boots, the other boys deriding. Bugles waked him in the dawn. The schoolmaster caught him after breakfast, thrust a page of meaningless characters under his nose, gave them senseless names, and whacked him, without reason. Kim meditated poisoning him with opium borrowed from a barrack sweeper, but reflected that, as they all ate at one table in public, this was peculiarly revolting to Kim, who preferred to turn his back on the world at meals. The stroke might be dangerous. Then he attempted running off to the village where the priest had tried to drunk the llama, the village where the old soldier lived. But far-seeing sentries at every exit headed back the little scarlet figure. Trousers and jacket crippled body, and mind alike. So he abandoned the project and fell back, oriental fashion, on time and chance. Three days of torment passed in the big, echoing white rooms. He walked out of afternoons under escort of the drummer boy, and all he heard from his companions were the few useless words which seemed to make two-thirds of the white man's abuse. Kim knew and despised them all long ago. The boy resented his silence and lack of interest by beating him, as was only natural. He did not care for any of the bazaars which were in bounds. He styled all natives niggers, yet servants and sweepers called him abominable names to his face, and, misled by their deferential attitude, he never understood. This somewhat consoled Kim for the beatings. On the morning of the fourth day, a judgment overtook that drummer. They had gone out together towards Umbala Racecourse. He returned alone, weeping with news that young O'Hara, to whom he had been doing nothing in particular, had hailed a scarlet-bearded nigger on horseback, that the nigger had then and there laid into him with a peculiarly adhesive quirt, picked up young O'Hara, and borne him off at full gallop. These tidings came to Father Victor, and he drew down his long upper lip. He was already sufficiently startled by a letter from the Temple of Turthankers at Benares, enclosing a native banker's note of hand for three hundred rupees and an amazing prayer to Almighty God. The Lama would have been more annoyed than the priest had he known how the bizarre letter writer had translated his phrase to acquire merit. Powers of darkness below! Father Victor fumbled with a note, and now he's off with another of his peep day friends. I don't know whether it'll be the great relief to me to get him back, or to have him lost. He's beyond my comprehension. How the devil... Yes, he's the man, I mean. Can a street beggar raise money to educate white boys? 
The three miles off, on Ombala Racecourse, Marble Valley, reigning a grey Kabuli stallion with Kim in front of him, was saying, But, little friend of all the world, there is my honour and reputation to be considered. All the officer sahibs in all the regiments and all Ombala know Marble Valley. Men saw me pick thee up and chastise that boy. We are seen now from far across the plain. How can I take thee away on account for thy disappearing if I set thee down and let thee run off into the crops? They would put me in jail. Be patient. Once a sahib, always a sahib. When thou art a man, who knows? Thou wilt be grateful to Marble Valley. Take me beyond their sentries where I can change his red. Give me money and I will go to Benares and be with my lama again. I do not want to be a sahib. And remember, I did deliver that message. The stallion bounded wildly. Mahbub Ali had incautiously driven home the sharp-edged stirrup. He was not the new sort of fluent horse-dealer who wears English boots and spurs. Kim drew his own conclusions from that betrayal. That was a small matter. It lay on the straight road to Benares, I and the sahib have by this time forgotten it. I send so many letters and messages to men who ask questions about horses. I cannot well remember one from the other. Was it some matter of a bay mare that Peter Sahib wished the pedigree of? Kim saw the trap at once. If he had said bay mare, Mahbub would have known by his very readiness to fall in with the amendment that the boy suspected something. Kim replied, therefore, a bay mare. No, I, I do not forget my message thus. It was a white stallion. Ay, so it was, a white Arab stallion. But thou didst write a bay mare to me. "'Who cares to tell truth to a letter-writer?' Kim answered, feeling Marbub's palm on his heart. "'Hey, Marbub, you old villain, pull up!' cried a voice, and an Englishman raced alongside on a little polo pony. "'I've been chasing you half over the country. That Kabuli of yours can go. For sale, I suppose.' "'I have some young stuff coming on made by heaven for the delicate and difficult polo game. He has no equal. He plays polo and waits a table. Yes, we all know that. What the deuce have you got there?' "'Ah, uh, boy,' said Mahbub gravely. Uh, "'He was being beaten by another boy. H "'His father was once a white soldier in the big war. "'The boy was a child in Lahore City. "'He played with my horses when he was a babe. Uh, "'Now I think they will make him a soldier. "'He has been newly caught by his father's regiment "'that went up to the war last week. Uh, "'But I do not think he wants to be a soldier. "'I take him for a ride. Uh, "'Tell me where thy barracks are, and I will set thee there. Uh, "'Let me go. I can find the barracks alone.' And if thou runnest away, who will say it is not my fault? He'll run back to his dinner. Where has he to run to? The Englishman asked. He was born in the land. He has friends. He goes where he chooses. He is a, a chugger sowy sharp chap. Uh, it needs only to change his clothing, and in a twinkling he would be a low-caste Hindu boy. The deuce he would. The Englishman looked critically at the boy as Marbub headed towards the barracks. Kim ground his teeth. Marbub was mocking him, as faithless Afghans will, for he went on. They will send him to school and put heavy boots on his feet, and swaddle him in these clothes. Then he will forget all he knows. Now which of the barracks is thine? Kim pointed, he could not speak, to Father Victor's wing, all staring white nearby. Perhaps he will make a good soldier, said Marbub reflectively. He will make a good orderly at least. I sent him to deliver a message once from Lahore. A message concerning the pedigree of a white stallion. Here was deadly insult on deadlier injury, and the sahib, to whom he had so craftily given that war-waking letter, heard it all. Kim beheld Mahbub Ali frying in flame for his treachery, but for himself he saw one long grey vista of barracks, schools, and barracks again. He gazed imploringly at the clear-cut face in which there was no glimmer of recognition, but even at this extremity it never occurred to him to throw himself on the white man's mercy or to denounce the Afghan. And Mahbub stared deliberately at the Englishman, who stared as deliberately at Kim, quivering and tongue-tied. "'My horse is well trained,' said the dealer. "'Others would have kicked, Sahib.' Ah, said the Englishman at last, rubbing his pony's damp withers with his whip-butt, who makes the boy a soldier? He says the regiment that found him, and especially the padre sahib of that regiment. There is the padre, Kim choked as bareheaded Father Victor sailed down upon them from the veranda. 
Paras of darkness below, O'Hara. How many more mixed friends do you keep in Asia? He cried as Kim slid down and stood helplessly before him. Good morning, Padre, the Englishman said cheerily. I know you by reputation well enough. I meant to have come over and called before this. Uh, I'm Creighton. Of the ethnological survey, said Father Victor. The Englishman nodded. Faith, I'm glad to meet you then, and I owe you some thanks for bringing back the boy. No thanks to me, Padre. Besides, the boy wasn't going away. You don't know old Mabubali? The horse dealer sat, impressive in the sunlight. You will, when you've been in the station a month. He sells us all our crocs. That boy is rather a curiosity. Can you tell me anything about him? Can I tell you? puffed Father Victor. You'll be the one man that could help me in my quandaries. Tell ye, perhaps of darkness I'm person to tell someone who knows something of the native. A groom came round the corner. Colonel Creighton raised his voice, speaking in Urdu. Very good, Mabubali, but what is the use of telling me all those stories about the pony? Not one pice more than three hundred and fifty rupees will I give. The sahib is a little hot and angry after riding. The horse dealer returned with the leer of a privileged jester. Presently he will see my horse's points more clearly. I will wait till he has finished his talk with the padre. I will wait under that tree. Confound you, the colonel laughed. That comes of looking at one of Marboob's horses. He's a regular old leech. Padre, wait then, if thou hast so much time to spare, Marboob. Now I'm at your service, padre. Where is the boy? Oh, he's gone off to Kolog with Marboob. A queer sort of boy. Uh, might I ask you to send my mare round under cover? He dropped into a chair which commanded a clear view of Kim and Marbub Ali in conference beneath the tree. The padre went indoors for cheroots. Creighton heard Kim say bitterly, Trust a Brahmin before a snake, and a snake before an Arlot, and an Arlot before a Pathan, Marbub Ali. That is all one, the great red beard wagged solemnly. Children should not see a carpet on the loom till the pattern is made plain. Believe me, friend of the world, I do thee great service. They will not make a soldier of thee. You crafty old sinner, thought Creighton. But you're not far wrong. That boy mustn't be wasted if he is as advertised. Excuse me half a minute, cried the padre from within, but I'm getting the documents in the case. If through me the favour of this bold and wise Colonel Sahib comes to thee, and thou art raised to honour, what thanks wilt thou give Marbub Ali when thou art a man? Nay, nay, I begged thee to let me take the road again, where I should have been safe, and thou hast sold me back to the English. What will they give thee for blood money? A cheerful young demon, the Colonel bit his cigar, and turned politely to Father Victor. What are the letters that the fat priest is waving before the Colonel? Stand behind the stallion as though looking at my bridle said Marbub Ali. A letter from my lama, which he wrote from Jagadir Road, saying that he will pay three hundred rupees by the year for my schooling. Oh, his old red hat of that sort. At which school? God knows. I think in Naklau. Yes, there is a big school there for the sons of sahibs, and half-sahibs. I have seen it when I sell horses there. So the lama also loved the friend of the world. Aye, and he did not tell lies, or return me to captivity. A small wonder the padre does not know how to unravel the thread. How fast he talks to the Colonel Sahib. Marbub Ali chuggled. Ah, by Allah! The keen eyes swept the veranda for an instant. Thy lama has sent what to me looks like a note of hand. I have had some dealings in hundis. The Colonel Sahib is looking at it. What good is all this to me? said Kim wearily. Thou wilt go away, and they will return me to those empty rooms where there is no good place to sleep, and where the boys beat me. I do not think that. Have patience, child. All Pathans are not faithless, except in horse flesh. Five, ten, fifteen minutes passed. Father Victor talking energetically or asking questions which the Colonel answered. No, I've told you everything that I know about the boy from beginning to end, and it's a blessed relief to me. Did you ever hear the like? At any rate, the old man has sent the money. Gobin Sahai's notes of hand are good from here to China, said the Colonel. The more one knows about natives, the less can one say what they will or won't do. That's consoling from the head of the ethnological survey. It's this mixture of red bulls and rivers of healing, poor heathen. God help him. And notes of hand and Masonic certificates. Are you a mason by any chance? By Jove, I am. Now I come to think of it, that's an additional reason, said the colonel absently. I'm glad you see a reason in it. But as I said, 
and some mixture of things was beyond me, and is prophesying to our colonel, sitting on me bed with his little shimmy torn open, showing his white skin, and the prophecy coming true. They'll cure all that nonsense at St. Xavier's, eh? Sprinkle him with holy water, the colonel laughed. On my word, I fancy I ought to sometimes, but I'm hoping he'll be brought up as a good Catholic. All that troubles me is, uh, what'll happen if the old beggar man... Lama, my dear sir, uh, Lama. Some of them are gentlemen in their own country. The Lama, then, uh, fails to pay next year. He's a fine business head to plan on the spur of the moment, but he's bound to die some day, and taking a heathen's money to give a child a Christian education. But he said explicitly what he wanted. As soon as he knew the boy was white, he seems to have made his arrangements accordingly. I'd give a man's pay to hear how he explained it at the Turthanker's Temple at Benares. Uh, look here, Padre, I don't pretend to know much about natives, but... If he says he'll pay, he'll pay, dead or alive. I mean, his heirs will assume the debt. My advice to you is send the boy down to luck now, if your Anglican chaplain thinks you've stolen a march on him. A bad luck to Bennett. He was sent to the front instead of me. Doughty certified me medically unfit. Or I'll excommunicate Doughty if he comes back alive. Surely Bennett ought to be content with glory. "'Leaving you the religion, quite so. "'As a matter of fact, I don't think Bennett will mind. Uh, "'Put the blame on me. "'I uh, strongly recommend sending the boy to St. Xavier's. "'He can go down on pass as a soldier's orphan, "'so the railway fare will be saved. "'You can buy him an outfit from the regimental subscription. "'The lodge will be saved the expense of his education, "'and that will put the lodge in a good temper. "'It's perfectly easy. "'I've got to go down to look now next week. "'I'll look after the boy on the way.' Uh, give him in charge of my servants, and uh, so on. Uh, you're a good man. Not in the least. Don't make that mistake. The Lama has sent us money for a definite end. We can't uh, very well return it. Uh, we shall have to do as he says. Well, that's settled, isn't it? Uh, shall we say that Tuesday next you'll hand him over to me at the night train south? That's only three days. He can't do much harm in three days. That's a weight off my mind, but uh, this thing here... He waved the note of hand. I don't know Gobin Sahay or his bank, which may be a hole in a wall. Uh, you've never been a subaltern in debt. I'll cash it if you like, and send you the vouchers in proper order. Uh, but with all your own work to do, that's asking. It's not the least trouble indeed. Uh, you see, as an ethnologist, the thing's very interesting to me. I'd like to make a note of it for some government work that I'm doing. Uh, the transformation of a regimental badge like your Red Bull into a sort of fetish that the boy follows is very interesting. Uh, but I can't thank you enough. There's one thing you can do. All we ethnological men are as jealous as jackdaws of one another's discoveries. They're of no interest to anyone but ourselves, of course. But you know what book collectors are like. Well, don't say a word directly or indirectly about the Asiatic side of the boy's character, uh, his adventures and his prophecy and so on. I'll worm them out of the boy later on and, uh, you see, I do. Uh, you'll make a wonderful kind of it. And never a word will I say to anyone till I see it in print. Uh, thank you. Uh, that goes straight to an ethnologist's heart. Well, I must be getting back to my breakfast. Oh, good heavens, old Marbub here still. He raised his voice, and the horse dealer came out from under the shadow of the tree. Well, uh, what is it? As regards that young horse, said Marbub, I say that when a colt is born to a polo pony, closely following the ball without teaching, when such a colt knows the game by divination, then I say it is a great wrong to break that colt to a heavy cart, Sahib. So say I also, Marbub. The colt will be entered for polo only. These fellows think of nothing in the world but horses, Padre. I'll see you tomorrow, Mahbub, if you've anything likely for sale. The dealer saluted, horseman fashion, with a sweep of the off-hand. Be patient, a little friend of all the world, he whispered to the agonised Kim. Thy fortune is made. In a little while thou goest to Naklau, and here is something to pay the letter writer. I shall see thee again, I think, many times. And he cantered off down the road. "'Listen to me,' said the colonel from the veranda, speaking in the vernacular. "'In three days thou wilt go with me to Lucknow, seeing and hearing new things all the while. "'Therefore sit still for three days, and do not run away. "'Thou wilt go to school at Lucknow.' "'Shall I meet my holy one there?' Kim whispered. "'At least Lucknow is nearer to Benares than Umbala. "'It may be thou wilt go under my protection.' 
Marble Valley knows this, and he will be angry if thou returnest to the road now. Remember, much has been told me, which I do not forget. I will wait, said Kim, but the boys will beat me. Then the bugles blew for dinner. Chapter 7 Unto whose use the pregnant suns are poised, with idiot moons and stars retracing stars? Creep thou between thy comings all unnoised. Heaven hath her high, as earth her baser wars. Ere to these tumults, this affright, that fray, by Adam's father's own sin bound all way. Peer up, draw out thy horoscope, and say, which planet mends thy threadbare fate, or Mars? Sir John Christie In the afternoon, the red-faced schoolmaster told Kim that he had been struck off the strength, which conveyed no meaning to him until he was ordered to go away and play. Then he ran to the bazaar and found the young letter-writer to whom he owed a stamp. "'Now I pay,' said Kim royally, "'and now I need another letter to be written.' "'Marble Bally is in Umbala,' said the writer jauntily. He was, by virtue of his office, a Bureau of General Misinformation. "'This is not to Mabub, but to a priest. Take thy pen and write quickly. "'To Teshu Lama, the Holy One from Botiel, seeking for a river, "'who is now in the temple of the Turthankers at Benares. Take more ink. "'In three days I am to go down to Naklau, to the school at Naklau. The name of the school is Xavier. I do not know where the school is, but it is at Naklau. But I know Naklau, the writer interrupted. I know the school. Tell him where it is, and I give half an anna. The reed pen scratched busily. He cannot mistake. The man lifted his head. Who watches us across the street? Kim looked up hurriedly and saw Colonel Creighton in tennis flannels. Oh, that is some sahib who knows the fat priest in the barracks. He is beckoning me. Oh, what dost thou? said the colonel when Kim trotted up. I am not running away. I sent a letter to my holy one at Benares. I had not thought of that. Hast thou said that I take thee to luck now? Nay, I have not. Read the letter if there be a doubt. Then why hast thou left out my name in writing to that holy one? The colonel smiled, a queer smile. Kim took his courage in both hands. It was said once to me that it is inexpedient to write the names of strangers concerned in any matter, because by the naming of names many good plans are brought to confusion. Thou hast been well taught, the colonel replied, and Kim flushed. I have left my cheroot case in the Padre's veranda. Uh, bring it to my house this evening. Where is the house? said Kim. His quick wit told him that he was being tested in some fashion or other, and he stood on guard. "'Ask anyone in the big bazaar,' the colonel walked on. "'He has forgotten his cheroot case,' said Kim, returning. "'I must bring it to him this evening. "'That is all my letter, uh, except thrice over. "'Come to me, come to me, come to me. And "'Now I will pay for a stamp and put it in the post.' "'He rose to go, and as an afterthought asked, uh, "'Who is that angry-faced sahib who lost the cheroot case?' Oh, he is only Creighton Sahib, a very foolish Sahib, who is a Colonel Sahib without a regiment. Oh, what is his business? Oh, God knows, he is always buying horses which he cannot ride, and asking riddles about the works of God, such as plants and stones and the customs of people. The dealers call him the father of fools, because he is so easily cheated about a horse. Mabu Bali says he is madder than most other Sahibs. Oh, said Kim, and departed. His training had given him some small knowledge of character, and he argued that fools are not given information which leads to calling out eight thousand men besides guns. The commander-in-chief of all India does not talk, as Kim had heard him talk, to fools. Nor would Mahbub Ali's tone have changed, as it did every time he mentioned the colonel's name, if the colonel had been a fool. Consequently, and this said Kim to Skipping, there was a mystery somewhere— and Marbub Ali probably spied for the colonel, much as Kim had spied for Marbub. And, like the horse-dealer, the colonel evidently respected people who did not show themselves to be too clever. 
he rejoiced that he had not betrayed his knowledge of the colonel's house, and when, on his return to barracks, he discovered that no Chirut case had been left behind, he beamed with delight. Here was a man after his own heart, a tortuous and indirect person playing a hidden game. Well, if he could be a fool, so could Kim. He showed nothing of his mind when Father Victor, for three long mornings, discoursed to him of an entirely new set of gods and godlings, notably of a goddess called Mary, who, he gathered, was one with Bibi Miriam of Mahbub Ali's theology. He betrayed no emotion when, after the lecture, Father Victor dragged him from shop to shop, buying articles of outfit, nor, when envious drummer boys kicked him because he was going to a superior school, did he complain, but awaited the play of circumstances with an interested soul. Father Victor, good man, took him to the station, put him into an empty second class next to Colonel Creighton's first, and bade him farewell with genuine feeling. They'll make a man of you, O'Hara. They'll make a man of you, O'Hara, at St. Xavier's, a, a white man, and I hope a good man. They'll know all about your coming, and the colonel will see that you're not lost or mislaid anywhere along the road. I've given you a notion of religious matters. At least, I hope so. And you'll remember, when they ask you your religion, that you're a Catholic. Better say Roman Catholic, though. I'm not fond of the word. Kim lit a rank cigarette. He had been careful to buy a stock in the bazaar, and lay down to think. This solitary passage was very different from that joyful down journey in the third class with the Lama. Sahibs get little pleasure of travel, he reflected. Hey, may I go from one place to another as it might be a kickball. It is my kismet, and no man can escape his kismet. But I am to pray to Bibi Miriam, and I am a sahib. He looked at his boots ruefully. No, I am Kim. This is the great world, and I am only Kim. Who is Kim? He considered his own identity a thing he had never done before, until his head swam. He was one insignificant person in all the roaring well of India, going southward, to he knew not what fate. Presently the colonel sent for him, and talked for a long time. So far as Kim could gather, he was to be diligent and enter the survey of India as a chain man. If he were very good, and passed the proper examinations, he would be earning thirty rupees a month at seventeen years old, and Colonel Creighton would see that he found suitable employment. Kim pretended at first to understand perhaps one word in three of this talk. Then the Colonel, seeing his mistake, turned to fluent and picturesque Urdu, and Kim was contented. No man could be a fool who knew the language so intimately who moved so gently and silently, and whose eyes were so different from the dull, fat eyes of other sahibs. Yes, and thou must learn how to make pictures of roads and mountains and rivers, uh, to carry these pictures in thine eye, till a suitable time comes to set them upon paper. Uh, perhaps some day when thou art a chain man, I may see to thee when we are working together. Uh, go across those hills and see what lies beyond, then one will say— there are bad people living in those hills who will slay the chain man if he be seen to look like a sahib. What then? Kim thought. Would it be safe to return the colonel's lead? I would tell what that other man had said. But if I answered, I will give thee a hundred rupees for knowledge of what is behind those hills, for a picture of a river, and a little news of what people say in the villages there. How can I tell? I am only a boy. Wait till I am a man. Then, seeing the colonel's brow clouded, he went on, "'But I think I should in a few days earn the hundred rupees.' "'By what road?' Kim shook his head, resolutely. "'If I said how I would earn them, another man might hear and forestall me. It is not good to sell knowledge for nothing. Tell now.' The colonel held up a rupee. Kim's hand half reached towards it and dropped. "'Nay, sahib, nay. I know the price that will be paid for the answer.' "'But I do not know why the question is asked.' Uh, "'Take it for a gift, then,' said Creighton, tossing it over. Uh, "'There's a good spirit in thee. Uh, "'Do not let it be blunted at St. Xavier's. "'There are many boys there who despise the black men.' "'Their mothers were bizarre women,' said Kim. "'He knew well there is no hatred like that of the half-caste for his brother-in-law. 
True, but thou art a sahib, and the son of a sahib. Therefore, do not at any time be led to condemn the black men. I have known boys, newly entered into the service of the government, who feigned not to understand the talk or the customs of black men. Their pay was cut for ignorance. There is no sin so great as ignorance. Remember this. Several times in the course of the long twenty-four hours run south did the colonel send for him, always developing this latter text. We be all on one lead rope, then, said Kim at last. The colonel, Mahbub Ali, and I, when I become a chain man. He will use me as Mahbub Ali employed me, I think. That is good, if it allows me to return to the road again. This clothing grows no easier by wear. When they came to the crowded Lucknow station, there was no sign of the lama. He swallowed his disappointment while the colonel bundled him into a tikigari with his neat belongings and dispatched him alone to St. Xavier's. I do not say farewell because we shall meet again, he cried, again and many times, if thou art one of good spirit, but thou art not yet tried. Not when I brought thee, Kim actually dared to use the turn of equals, a white stallion's pedigree that night. Much is gained by forgetting, little brother, said the colonel with a look that pierced through Kim's shoulder blades as he scuttled into the carriage. It took him nearly five minutes to recover. Then he sniffed the new air appreciatively. A rich city, he said, richer than Lahore. How good the bazaars must be. A coachman, drive me a little through the bazaars here. My order is to take thee to the school. The driver used thou, which is rudeness when applied to a white man. In the clearest and most fluent vernacular, Kim pointed out his error, climbed on to the box seat, and perfect understanding established, drove for a couple of hours up and down, estimating, comparing, and enjoying. There is no city, except Bombay, the queen of all, more beautiful in her garish style than Lucknow. Whether you see her from the bridge, over the river, or from the top of the Imambara, looking down on the gilt umbrellas of the Chatta Manzil, and the trees in which the town is bedded. Kings have adorned her with fantastic buildings, endowed her with charities, crowned her with pensioners, and drenched her with blood. She is the centre of all idleness, intrigue, and luxury, and shares with Delhi the claim to talk the only pure Urdu. A fair city, a beautiful city. The driver, as a Lucknow man, was pleased with the compliment, and told Kim many astounding things where an English guide would have talked of the mutiny. Now we will go to the school, said Kim at last, the great old school of St. Xavier's in Partibus, block on block of low white buildings, stands in vast grounds over against the Gumty River, at some distance from the city. What like of folk are they within, said Kim? Young sahibs, all devils, but to speak the truth, and I drive many of them to and fro from the railway station, I have never seen one that had in him the making of a more perfect devil than thou, this young sahib whom I am now driving. Naturally, for he was never trained to consider them in any way improper, Kim had passed the time of day with one or two frivolous ladies at upper windows in a certain street, and naturally, in the exchange of compliments, had acquitted himself well. He was about to acknowledge the driver's last insolence, when his eye, it was growing dusk, caught a figure sitting by one of the white plaster gate pillars in the long sweep of wall. Stop, he cried, stay here, I do not go to the school at once. But what is it to pay me for this coming and recoming? said the driver petulantly. Is the boy mad? Last time it was a dancing girl, this time it is a priest. Kim was in the road headlong patting the dusty feet beneath the dirty yellow robe. "'I have waited here a day and a half,' the lama's level voice began. "'Nay, I had a disciple with me. He was my friend at the Temple of Turthankas, gave me a guide for this journey. I came from Benares in the terrain, uh, when thy letter was given me. Yes, I am well fed. I need nothing.' "'But why didst thou not stay with the cooler woman, O Holy One? "'In what way didst thou get to Benares? "'My heart has been heavy since we parted.' "'The woman wearied me by constant flux of talk "'and requiring charms for children. "'I separated myself from that company, "'permitting her to acquire merit by gifts. 
She is at least a woman of open hands, and I made a promise to return to her house if need arose. Then, perceiving myself alone in this great and terrible world, I bethought me of the terrain to Benares, where I knew one abode in the Tertanka's temple, who was a seeker, uh, even as I. Ah, thy river, said Kim. I had forgotten the river. So soon, my Jella, I have never forgotten it. But when I had left thee, it seemed better that I should go to the temple and take counsel, for, look you, India is very large, and it may be that wise men before us, some two or three, have left a record of the place of our river. There is debate in the temple of the Turtankas on this matter, some saying one thing and some another. They are courteous folk. So be it. What dost thou do now? I acquire merit in that I help thee, my Chella, to wisdom. The priest of that body of men who serve the Red Bull wrote me that all should be as I desired for thee. I sent the money to suffice for one year, and then I came, as thou seest me, to watch for thee, going up into the gates of learning. A day and a half I have waited, not because I was led by any affection towards thee. That is no part of the way. But as they said at the Tertanka's temple, because money, having been paid for learning, it was right that I should oversee the end of the matter. They resolved my doubts most clearly. I have a fear that perhaps I came because I wished to see thee. Misguided by the red mist of affection, it is not so. Moreover, I am troubled by a dream. But surely, Holy One, thou hast not forgotten the road and all that befell on it. Surely it was a little to see me that thou didst come. The horses are cold, and it is past their feeding time, whined the driver. Go to Jehanam and abide there with thy reputationless art, Kim snarled over his shoulder. I am all alone in this land. I know not where I go, nor what shall befall me. My heart was in that letter I sent thee, except from Abu Bali, and he is a pathan. I have no friend save thee, Holy One. Do not altogether go away. I have considered that also, the Lama replied in a shaking voice. It is manifest that from time to time I shall acquire merit, if before that I have not found my river, by assuring myself that thy feet are set on wisdom. What they will teach thee? I do not know, but the priest wrote me that no son of a sahib in all India will be better taught than thou. So, from time to time, therefore I will come again. Maybe thou wilt be such a sahib as he who gave me these spectacles. The lama wiped them elaborately. In the wonder house at Lahore, that is my hope, for he was a fountain of wisdom, wiser than many abbots. Again, maybe thou wilt forget me and our meetings. If I eat thy bread, cried Kim passionately, how shall I ever forget thee? No, no, he put the boy aside. I must go back to Benares. From time to time, now that I know the customs of letter writers in this land, I will send thee a letter, and from time to time I will come and see thee. But whither shall I send my letters? wailed Kim, clutching at the robe, all forgetful that he was a sahib. "'To the temple of the Tirthankas at Benares. "'That is the place I have chosen till I find my river. "'Do not weep, for look you, all desire is illusion, "'and a new binding upon the wheel. "'Go up to the gates of learning. "'Let me see thee go. "'Dost thou love me? "'Then go, or my heart cracks. "'I will come again. "'Surely I will come again.' The lama watched the Tikagari rumble into the compound and strode off, snuffing between each long stride. The gates of learning shut with a clang. The country born and bred boy has his own manners and customs, which do not resemble those of any other land, and his teachers approach him by roads which an English master would not understand. Therefore, you would scarcely be interested in Kim's experiences as a St. Saviour's boy among two or three hundred precocious youths, most of whom had never seen the sea. He suffered the usual penalties for breaking out of bounds when there was cholera in the city. This was before he had learned to write fair English, 
and so was obliged to find a bizarre letter writer. He was, of course, indicted for smoking, and for the use of abuse more full-flavoured than even St. Xavier's had ever heard. He learned to wash himself with the Levitical scrupulosity of the native-born, who in his art considers the Englishman rather dirty. He played the usual tricks on the patient coolies pulling the punkers in the sleeping rooms, where the boys threshed through the hot nights, telling tales till the dawn. And quietly he measured himself against his self-reliant mates. They were sons of subordinate officials in the railway, the telegraph and canal services, of warrant officers, sometimes retired and sometimes acting as commanders-in-chief to a feudatory Rajah's army of captains of the Indian Marine government, pensioners, planters, presidency shopkeepers and missionaries. A few were cadets of the old Eurasian houses that have taken strong root in Durham Tola, Pereiras, de Souza's and de Silva's. Their parents could well have educated them in England, but they loved the school that had served their own youth, and generation followed sallow-hued generation at St. Xavier's. Their homes ranged from Howra of the railway people to abandoned cantonments like Mongir and Chunar, lost tea gardens a Shillong Way, villages where their fathers were large landholders in Oud or the Deccan. Mission stations a week from the nearest railway line, seaports a thousand miles south, facing the brazen Indian surf, and Kinchona plantations south of all. The mere story of their adventures, which to them were no adventures, on their road to and from school would have crisped a western boy's hair. They were used to jogging off alone through a hundred miles of jungle, where there was always the delightful chance of being delayed by tigers, but they would no more have bathed in the English Channel in an English August than their brothers across the world would have lain still while a leopard snuffed at their palanquin. There were boys of fifteen who had spent a day and a half on an islet in the middle of a flooded river, taking charge, as by right, of a camp of frantic pilgrims returning from a shrine. There were seniors who had requisitioned a chance met Raja's elephant in the name of St. Francis Xavier when the rains once blotted out the cart track that led to their father's estate, and had all but lost the huge beast in quicksand. There was a boy who, he said, and none doubted, had helped his father to beat off with rifles from the veranda a rush of ackers in the days when those headhunters were bold against lonely plantations. And every tale was told in the even, passionless voice of the native-born mixed with quaint reflections, borrowed unconsciously from native foster mothers, and turns of speech that showed they had been that instant translated from the vernacular. Kim watched, listened, and approved. This was not insipid single-word talk of drummer boys. It dealt with a life he knew, and in part understood. The atmosphere suited him, and he throve by inches— they gave him a white drill suit as the weather warmed, and he rejoiced in the new-found bodily comforts as he rejoiced to use his sharpened mind over the tasks they set him. His quickness would have delighted an English master, but at St. Xavier's they know the first rush of minds developed by sun and surroundings as they know the half-collapse that sets in at twenty-two or twenty-three. Nonetheless, he remembered to hold himself lowly, when tales were told of hot nights, Kim did not sweep the board with his reminiscences, for St. Xavier looks down on boys who go native altogether. One must never forget that one is a sahib, and that some day, when examinations are passed, one will command natives. Kim made a note of this, for he began to understand where examinations led. Then came the holidays, from August to October the long holidays imposed by the heat and the rains. Kim was informed that he would go north to some station in the hills behind Umbala, where Father Victor would arrange for him. A barrack school, said Kim, who had asked many questions and thought more. Yes, I suppose so, said the master. It will not do you any harm to keep you out of mischief. You can go up with the young de Castro as far as Delhi. Kim considered it in every possible light. 
He had been diligent, even as the Colonel advised. The boy's holiday was his own property, of so much the talk of his companions had advised him. And a barrack school would be torment after St. Xavier's. Moreover, this was magic worth anything else. He could write. In three months he had discovered how men can speak to each other without a third party, at the cost of half an anna and a little knowledge. No word had come from the llama, but there remained the road. Kim yearned for the caress of soft mud squishing up between the toes, as his mouth watered for mutton stewed with butter and cabbages, for rice speckled with strong scented cardamoms, for the saffron tinted rice, garlic and onions, and the forbidden greasy sweetmeats of the bazaars. They would feed him raw beef on a platter at the barrack school, and he must smoke by stealth. But again, he was a sahib, and was at St. Xavier's, and that pig, Marbub Ali, no, he would not test Marbub's hospitality. And yet he thought it out alone in the dormitory, and came to the conclusion he had been unjust to Marbub. The school was empty. Nearly all the masters had gone away. Colonel Creighton's railway pass lay in his hand, and Kim puffed himself that he had not spent Colonel Creighton's or Mahbub's money in riotous living. He was still lord of two rupees, seven annas. His new bullock trunk, marked K.O., and bedding roll lay in the empty sleeping room. Sahibs are always tied to their baggage, said Kim, nodding at them. You will stay here. He went out into the warm rain, smiling sinfully, and sought a certain house whose outside he had noted down some time before. Ah, dost thou know what manner of women we be in this quarter? Oh, shame! Was I born yesterday? Kim squatted native fashion on the cushions of that upper room. A little dye stuff and three yards of cloth to help out a jest. Is it much to ask? Who is she? Thou art full young as sahibs go for this devilry. Oh, she? She is the daughter of a certain schoolmaster of a regiment in the cantonments. He has beaten me twice because I went over their wall in these clothes, and now I would go as a gardener's boy. Old men are very jealous. That is true. Hold thy face still while I dab on the juice. Not too black, Nakin. I would not appear to her as a hubshy nigger. Oh, love makes naught of these things. And how old is she? Twelve years, I think, said the shameless Kim. "'Spread it also on the breast. "'It may be her father will tear my clothes off me, "'and if I am piebald, he laughed. "'The girl worked busily, "'dabbing a twist of cloth into a little saucer of brown dye "'that holds longer than any walnut juice. "'Now send out and get me a cloth for the turban. "'Woe is me, my head is all unshaved, "'and he will surely knock off my turban. "'I am not a barber, but I will make shift. "'Thou wast born to be a breaker of hearts.' "'All this disguise for one evening? "'Remember, the stuff does not wash away.' "'She shook with laughter till her bracelets and ankles jingled. "'But who is to pay me for this? "'Hanifa herself could not have given thee better stuff. "'Trust in the gods, my sister,' said Kim gravely, "'screwing his face round as the stain dried. "'Besides, hast thou ever helped to paint a sahib thus before? "'Never indeed. "'But a jest is not money. "'It is worth much more.' "'Child, thou art beyond all dispute the most shameless son of Shaitan "'that I have ever known to take up a poor girl's time with this play, "'and then to say, is not the jest enough? "'Thou wilt go very far in this world.' "'She gave the dancing girl's salutation in mockery. "'All one, make haste and rough-cut my head.' "'Kim shifted from foot to foot, his eyes ablaze with mirth, "'as he thought of the fat days before him. He gave the girl four annas, and ran down the stairs in the likeness of a low-caste Hindu boy, perfect in every detail. A cookshop was his next point of call, where he feasted in extravagance and greasy luxury. On Lucknow station platform he watched young De Castro, all covered with prickly heat, get into a second-class compartment. Kim patronised a third, and was the life and soul of it. He explained to the company that he was assistant to a juggler who had left him behind sick with fever, and that he would pick up his master at Umbala. As the occupants of the carriage changed, he varied his tale, or adorned it with all the shoots of a budding fancy, the more rampant for being held off native speech so long. In all India, 
That night was no human being so joyful as Kim. At Umbala, he got out and headed eastward, plashing over the sodden fields to the village where the old soldier lived. About this time, Colonel Creighton at Simla was advised from Lucknow by wire that young O'Hara had disappeared. Mahbub Ali was in town selling horses, and to him the Colonel confided the affair one morning, cantering round Annandale Racecourse. "'Oh, that is nothing,' said the horse-dealer. "'Men are like horses. At certain times they need salt, and if that salt is not in the mangers they will lick it up from the earth. He has gone back to the road again for a while. The Madrasak wearied him. I knew it would. Another time I will take him upon the road myself. Do not be troubled, Creighton Sahib. It is as though a polo pony breaking loose ran out to learn the game alone.' "'Then he is not dead, think you. A "'Fever might kill him. "'I do not fear for the boy otherwise. "'A monkey does not fall among trees.' "'Next morning, on the same course, "'Mahbub's stallion ranged alongside the colonel. "'It is as I had thought,' said the horse-dealer. "'He has come through Ambala at least, "'and there he has written a letter to me, "'having learned in the bazaar that I was here. "'Read,' said the colonel, with a sigh of relief. "'It was absurd.' that a man of his position should take an interest in a little country-bred vagabond. But the colonel remembered the conversation in the train, and often in the past few months had caught himself thinking of the queer, silent, self-possessed boy. His evasion, of course, was the height of insolence, but it argued some resource and nerve. Mahbub's eyes twinkled as he reined out into the centre of the cramped little plain, where none could come near unseen. "'The friend of the stars, who is the friend of all the world, what is this? A name we give him in Lahore City. The friend of all the world takes leave to go to his own places. He will come back upon the appointed day. Let the box and the bedding roll be sent for, and if there has been a fault, let the hand of friendship turn aside the whip of calamity.' Uh, "'There is yet a little more, uh, but uh, no matter. Read. "'Certain things are not known to those who eat with forks. "'It is better to eat with both hands for a while. Uh, "'Speak soft words to those who do not understand this, "'that the return may be propitious. Uh, "'Now the manner in which that was cast is, of course, the work of the letter-writer. Uh, "'But see how wisely the boy has devised the matter of it, "'so that no hint is given except to those who know.' "'Is this the hand of friendship to avert the whip of calamity?' laughed the colonel. "'See how wise is the boy. He would go back to the road again, as I said, not knowing yet thy trade.' "'I am not at all sure of that,' the colonel muttered. "'He turns to me to make a peace between you. Is he not wise? He says he will return. He is but perfecting his knowledge. Think, Sahib. He has been three months at the school, and he is not mouthed to that bit. For my part, I rejoice.' The pony learns the game. Aye, but another time he must not go alone. Why? He went alone before he came under the Colonel Sahib's protection. When he comes to the great game, he must go alone. Alone and at peril of his head. Then, if he spits or sneezes or sits down other than as the people do whom he watches, he may be slain. Why hinder him now? Remember how the Persians say, The jackal that lives in the wilds of Mazandaran can only be caught by the hounds of Mazandaran. Uh, true, it is true, Mahbub Ali. Uh, and if he comes to no harm, I do not desire anything better. But it is great insolence on his part. He does not tell me even whither he goes, said Mahbub. He is no fool. When his time is accomplished, he will come to me. It is time the healer of pearls took him in hand. He ripens too quickly, as sahibs reckon. This prophecy was fulfilled to the letter a month later. Mahbub had gone down to Umbala to bring up a fresh consignment of horses, and Kim met him on the Kalka road at dusk, riding alone, begged an arms of him, was sworn at, and replied in English. There was nobody within earshot to hear Mahbub's gasp of amazement. Oh, and where hast thou been? Up and down, down and up. Come under a tree out of the wet and tell. I stayed for a while with an old man near Umbala, and on with a household of my acquaintance in Umbala. With one of these I went as far as Delhi to the southward. That is a wondrous city. Then I drove a bullock for a telly oilman coming north, but I heard of a great feast forward in Patiala, 
and thither went I in the company of a firework maker. It was a great feast. Kim rubbed his stomach. I saw rudges and elephants with gold and silver trappings, and they lit all the fireworks at once, whereby eleven men were killed, uh, my firework maker among them, and I was blown across a tent, uh, but took no harm. Then I came back to the rell with a sick horseman, to whom I was groom for my bread, and so here. Shabash, said Mabu Ali, but what does the Colonel Sahib say? I do not wish to be beaten. The hand of friendship has averted the whip of calamity, but another time when thou takest the road, it will be with me. This is too early. Late enough for me. I have learned to read and to write English a little at the Madrasa. I shall soon be altogether a sahib. Hear him, laughed Mahbub, looking at the little drenched figure dancing in the wet. Salam, sahib. And he saluted ironically. Well, art tired of the road, or wilt thou come on to Ambala with me and work back with the horses? I come with thee, Mahbub Ali.